right, looks like we're all here, so why don't we go ahead and get started. So good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our 1.45 p.m. session of the December 8, 2020 meeting of the Santa Cruz City Council. I have a few announcements, and then we'll move on to our regular meeting. Today's meeting is being broadcast live on community television, channel 25, and streaming on the city's website, cityofsantacruz.com. All council members are participating in this meeting remotely, and I want to thank the public for staying home to view today's city council meeting. If you wish to comment on an agenda item today, call in at the beginning of the item you're wanting to comment on using the instructions on your screen. Please mute your television or streaming device once you call in and listen through the phone. Please note there's a delay in streaming, so if you continue to listen on your, on your streaming device or television, you may miss your opportunity to speak. When it is time for public comment, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. When it is your time to speak during public comment, you'll hear an announcement that you've been unmuted. The time will then be set to two minutes, and you may hang up once you've commented on your item of interest. With that, I'd like to ask the clerk to please call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Councilmember Byers? Here. Uh, Matthews? Here. Brown? Here. Golder? Here. Watkins? Here. Um, Vice Mayor Myers? Here. Mayor Cummings? Here. I would like to start by acknowledging that the land on which we gather is the unceded territory of the Owaswa speaking Yupi tribe. The Amamutsan tribal band comprised of the descendants of indigenous people taking the mission Santa Cruz and San Juan Bautista during Spanish colonization of the Central Coast is today working hard to restore traditional land stewardship practices on these lands and heal from historic trauma. Okay, to kick off our meeting today uh, with our first presentation, we have the Jim Howes Community Service Award. Officer Jim Howes, the Officer Jim Howes Community Service Award is an annual award given to community members and city employees for outstanding service to the Santa Cruz community. The award was created in honor of Officer Jim Howes, who retired in 2007 after serving as a Santa Cruz police officer for 26 years. He was known throughout the city for his positive approach and partnership building between the city and Santa Cruz community. The Officer Jim Howes Community Service Award honors his legacy of positive collaboration, positive collaborative problem solving. Recipients of these awards are found to exhibit extraordinary dedication and efforts towards improving the quality of life in Santa Cruz through constructive solution-oriented work, work in collaboration with the city or city departments and other community stakeholders, and embody a spirit of cooperation between the city and community and set a positive tone that inspires and, and motivates others. This year's nominees included many impressive and worthy community members and city employees. Community members who were nominated this year included Jim Carher, Dr. Larry Resnick Sands, and Karen Madura. City employees that were nominated this year included Claire Glogley, Nikki Harmon, the entire IT department, and Rebecca Unit. Your colleagues and supervisors all recognize the amazing contributions you provide our city, and congratulations on being nominated for this award. This year, our selection committee met and chose the following recipients for the 2020 Jim Howes Award. Two recipients come from the community, and one city employee were selected. The, the community rep the recipients of the 2020 Jim Howes Award are Taj Leahy and Joy Flynn Wall. And so I'd like to invite both of them to turn on their meetings and join us. So after the tragic murder of George Floyd and the killing of Breonna Taylor, Joy Flynn uh, organized a peaceful and powerful protest, gathering thousands in Santa Cruz to take a knee and bring attention to systemic racism and injustice in our community. Their partnership continued as they formed a dynamic group of members of the black community to consult with Chief Andy Mills on police changes to improve policing and reduce the probability of conflict in our community. Joy and Tosh facilitated numerous community meetings and had challenging discussions to work towards change. As a result of Joy and Taj's dedication and persistent efforts to pr improve policing, the Santa Cruz Police Department in implemented 24 policy changes that were ratified at the November 24, 2020 meeting of the Santa Cruz City Council. 
I'd also like to point out that Taj has served on our Community Advisory Committee on Homelessness and was a co-chair for that group throughout 2019 and early into 2020. And so with that, I would like to thank both Taj and Joy for all of the things that you've done and all of your efforts this year with all of the turmoil that we've had to try to bring about positive change in our community. And I'd like to open the floor for you all to um, say any remarks that you'd wish to the council. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I'd like to definitely turn it over to Joy if you'd be interested. Joy, would you like to comment? Any remarks? Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, okay, great. Thank you. Sorry. Um, thank you, Mayor Cummings and Council members and those who nominated me. I'm deeply honored by the recognition. It's been and will continue to be my honor and privilege to serve this community. I would be remiss if I did not take a moment to acknowledge the hard work of those done this year by the entire city council. Beyond the 1989 earthquake, I cannot think of another time in recent history where the city has been tasked with such a quandary. COVID-19, the CZU complex fires, and the civil unrest brought on by the blatant revelation of our nation's culture of white supremacy and systemic racism have challenged you incredibly. And you have treated each issue with the greatest priority. I am particularly impressed by how your ability to show our community that you plan to do the work to make sure that Santa Cruz is part of the culture shift and that anti-racism work and the work to dismantle systemic racism from within through policy change is nonpartisan, is a nonpartisan issue. And by leading by that example, you express to the people of this community that it is not black against white, rather it is all of us against racism. And I appreciate the message you've sent by your vote, mostly unanimous vote, that you want to be and you want to, and you want Santa Cruz to be a part of that change, rather than its, per, rather than perpetuate its perpetuation. When we look back several years from now, it's likely that few will really recall the work that we've all done this year. But we will know, and that's what matters: is that we will know, and we will know that people are enjoying the community in a really amazing way and that the work that we've done to experience so that others can experience new levels of safety, safety and equity will have a lasting and impactful change for Santa Cruz. Thank you very much. Yay. Thank you, Joy. Taj, is there anything um, you'd like to share? Yeah, absolutely. Um, first of all, I want to say thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Council. Um, Thank you to God for letting me be here this morning um, or afternoon, I guess. Uh, I want to say a few thank yous because um, I have had some time hanging around with you all and there's a lot of people that I have met that are really making a difference in our community. Um, and I'm honored to be involved and have a seat at the table. I'd like to thank Susie O'Hara, Megan Bunch, Fred Keeley, Candace Owens um, for being such great supports during my time as co-chair with the uh, Community Advisory Committee on Homelessness. I'd like to thank, um, thank and congratulate Son Sonia Brunner uh, for introducing me to my friend Carter, Lieutenant Carter Jones of the Santa Cruz Police Department. Um, and she's coming in to be a city council member, which is very, very exciting. Uh, huge thanks to Chief Mills for everything. There's there's not a lot of words I could say uh, for the uh, partnership that we um, came up with for the past several months. It's been a whirlwind and it's been wonderful and uh, he's a courageous person. I'm really happy that we got to work together. 
uh, Mayor Cummings, really sad to see you go. There's a lot of us that are shedding a tear today and uh, just so honored and so thankful for your leadership at this time. Um, this has been a crazy year and uh, we're really glad that it was you. So uh, stick around. I'm glad you're gonna still be in city council. Um, Martine Watkins, I have to say thank you, especially as well um, for your leadership. Um, you have been a big inspiration to me. I, I hope that you know that. Um, also to a huge bow of respect and praise to the Santa Cruz County Black Coalition for Justice and Racial Equity. Um, Y'all are doing some big things and I'm really honored to be at the table and uh, have your ear uh, and uh, partnership. Um, also to my spiritual mentor, I'd like to say thank you to Reverend Deborah Johnson for keeping me in check and reminding me uh, to be humble. Um, Lastly, I'd, I'd like to just say that it has been a really big learning curve getting involved in city civic politics. Um, I think I came in a little naive and I've luckily had um, some people take me behind in some of the hallways and offices and say, hey, well, you know, this is what's going on. And it's been wonderful. I've, I've been happy to serve this community and I continue, I want to continue to do more. Um, and I look forward to all the incoming um, city council members and the new mayor and uh, continuing to do good in my community. So thank you, this is a big honor. Thank you very much. I second that. I couldn't see myself before, so I, <laughs> I, I, I now get to address all of you city council members and uh, Justin, uh, Mayor Cummings. It's been such an honor and privilege to work with you and um, uh, council, Member Watkins, I mean, just a whole nother level of, of getting to work with you in, in this way. And I look forward to um, getting to know the other council members as we continue this work. Um, and I, I just really applaud all of you and um, Chief Mills as well and everything that um, Taj said. And Taj, I wouldn't have been able to do this without your support too, so I wanna thank you. Likewise, thank, thank you. Thank you everybody, I'm so honored. Again, on behalf of the city council and our community, just want to thank you all for all the hard work you do. I think that, you know, we do the work out of our heart, and then, you know, it's it's good to have opportunities to acknowledge those people who are just doing the work because they want to make their community a better place. So thank you both again, and we look forward to continuing to work with you in the future. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Just the beginning, guys. <laughs> Okay, next up is our City Employee Recipient of the Year of the Jim House Community Award, which is Jesse Bond with our Parks and Rec Department. So if Jesse could join us. Um, thank you and congratulations, Jesse. Jesse is an extremely dedicated city employee and is the personification of what Parks and Rec staff commonly and lovingly called a recce. Not only has Jesse engaged her team in impactful work for the city, while facilities have been closed during COVID-19. She's also eagerly and quickly helped to utilize the Civic as an important center for our community during the CZU, Lightning Complex fires, COVID-19, and many more. From, the opening, from opening the Civic as an emergency shelter during the CZU, Lightning Complex fires, to the installation of the Black Lives Matter mural on Center Street, Jesse has stepped forward in an extraordinary way in 2020. She's enthusiastically supports others and continually looks for ways to improve our city. And so with that, Jesse, I'd like to thank you for all of your hard work and your commitment to the city and congratulate you as the 2020 Jim Howes Community Service Award recipient. So I'd like to uh, give Jesse an opportunity to um, share any remarks with the council and with our community. Uh, thank you, Mayor, Council. Can everyone hear me okay? Um, so uh, this is a great honor. Um, I am deeply uh, grateful. I just wanna take a moment um, to thank um, some individuals who um, were really supportive and certainly could not have done all of those achievements without them. So um, that's Tony Elliott, Rachel Kaufman, um, all of the recreation supervisors, um, one way or another were involved in the shelter. Um, but most importantly, just want to thank the Civic Auditorium staff along with me. You know, they jumped and rose to the occasion, so certainly the shelter would not have been possible with all those people. So thank you. 
And finally, I just want to say I'm really humbled to be honored with uh, Joy and Taj. So thank you very much. Thank you, Jesse. And before we go, uh, it looks like um, there's a short video that we want to play, and it's a message from some of your colleagues. So, Bonnie, I'll turn it over to you. It doesn't look like it's playing. No, we don't see it. But was it my desktop or was it the video? We didn't see anything. It just came up and then and disappeared. Uh, that's. I think it's your desktop. <laughs> <laughs> nice picture. <laughs> you your daughter. <laughs> Is it still my desktop? You can see your desktop. It's not working. It's not working. Okay. Well, Jesse, we'll have to get you that video, but um, your colleagues wanted to say congratulations as well for all the hard work you've done this year. And so, again, we very much appreciate all of your efforts, especially during such a difficult time this year. And um, really want to congratulate you on, on all your hard work. So thank you. Thank and you very much. Yeah. Okay, with that, we'll move on to our next item, which is uh, another presentation. It's the 45th anniversary of the Sister City Friendship with Shingu. And so I'll invite up um, some of our sister city committee members, Michelle Peregrine, Andrea Rosenfeld, Linda Snook, and Linda Holiday. And so today we are pleased to have a presentation to celebrate the 45th anniversary of the sister city relationship with our sister city, Shingu, Japan. Last year, a mayoral delegation from Santa Cruz, um, including um, then Mayor Watkins, uh, was able to uh, visit um, Shingu and to mark the occasion uh, of this anniversary. This year, the mayor of Shingu and his representatives were able to have visited. Uh, we're, we're going. We're planning on visiting Santa Cruz, but unfortunately, due to COVID-19, that visit was postponed. Later in this presentation, we're looking forward to Mayor Tauka and our partners sharing some comments via video. And now I'd like to introduce Michelle Peregrine, Chair of the Sister Cities Committee, to make some remarks and to, provide a, to kick off our presentation. Thank you, Mayor Cummings. We appreciate you and the entire Council taking the time to honor the many years of friendship and cultural exchange between Shingu and Santa Cruz. I'd like to first start by acknowledging the hard work and dedication to this relationship on the part of many previous sister city committees and of the past and current Shingu subcommittee. In particular, I'd like to acknowledge the Parks and Recreation Department Superintendent Rachel Kaufman and Office Supervisor Tremaine Hedden Jones, who, along with subcommittee members, have worked hard on this presentation and the virtual event we will be having with our Shingu partners on December 13th. Thank you to our subcommittee members, Adrian Harrell, Barbara Perman, Chandra Duffy, Gail McCullum, Steve Bauer, and our current co-chairs, Andrea Rosenfeld and Linda Snook. So with that, I will turn it over to Chair Rosenfeld. Please continue. Thank you, Chair Peregrine and Mayor Cummings and Council. Today, we're honoring a sister city relationship that has produced many years of annual student exchanges from both cities, enriching the lives of hundreds of students who have participated. 
dozens of adult cultural and business exchanges involving hundreds of community members and city leaders have taken place, providing numerous opportunities to learn from one another and to build lasting and meaningful friendships. Now I'd like to introduce Linda Snook, my co-chair uh, currently on the Shingu subcommittee. Linda Snook. Thank you, Andrea. Starting in 1974, the nurturing of this relationship has involved many members of our community. And I am very honored to introduce an important one of these many people to discuss the origin of the Shingu story. Welcome to Linda Holliday, founder and sensei of Aikido of Santa Cruz, who will share her memory. Hi, thank you so much. It's an honor to be here and thank you, um, Mayor Cummings and the council members and all the sister city people who are here. Uh, so I'm Linda Holliday. I'm the chief instructor of Aikido of Santa Cruz, uh, which is a nonprofit educational organization here in Santa Cruz since 1982. And uh, it's just a great honor and pleasure to share with you the, the origin story of the Sister City connection with Shingu. It's a story of youthful adventure. Uh, and Shingu has become like a second home to me over all these years. When I first went to Shingu, it was in the spring of 1973. That's the year before the, rela the formal relationship started with the city. I was 20, 20 years old. I was a student here in Santa Cruz, and I went to Shingu to deepen my study of Aikido, uh, which is the Japanese martial art of peace and reconciliation. I had no idea how much this journey would impact the rest of my life or how many hundreds of people would follow me on this journey over all the years afterwards, 45 years, 47 years, I guess, since 1973. I had two companions on this adventure, other, two other young people from Santa Cruz, uh, Richard Ravor and Jack Wada. When we were in Japan, we were taken to Shingu by a, a woman named Mary Heine, who, as you'll see in just a moment, is the person who actually started the relationship with Santa Cruz. She formally introduced us to the Aikido teacher in Shingu, who's uh, Michio Hikitsuchi Sensei, and he was one of the highest level Aikido teachers in the world. And he invited us, surprisingly, to study with him. We became, the three of us became the first Westerners ever to live in Shingu and study Aikido there. So our presence was a shocking and wonderful experience for the people in Shingu and for us. It was a really different era. It was 1973, no internet not much of anything like that. We didn't even call on the phone. It was too expensive, you know. And uh, so we were, it was a very remote area. There was nobody who looked remotely like me anywhere in the area. And I threw myself into studying the cultural study and the study of the Japanese language and culture. And, um, and, and the experience for me of being welcomed by people on the other side of the world from a culture that was so different uh, and being part of the world family with them was just life-changing. So I lived in Shingu for about three years in the 1970s and then moved back here in 1976 and have been teaching Aikido here ever since. So how did this unusual experience lead to the formal sister city relationship? Well, Mary Heine made it happen. She moved to Shingu also in 73, and then when she heard us describing Santa Cruz, the coast, the mountains, the beautiful beaches, the size of the city, and of course the Aikido in both places, she was impressed by the commonality despite the different countries and cultures. And when Mary Heine moved here in 1974 to teach Aikido at UCSC, she then proposed to the city council uh, and facilitated the formalization of the sister city relationship. That, that was 1974. And the, she brought as a first cultural exchange from Shingu in 1974, the Aikido master teacher, Hikitsuchi Michio uh, Sensei, to Santa Cruz. He gave a demonstration on the second floor of the library. He taught seminars at UCSC and uh, it, 
and as they say, you know, it's all history since then. Um, such wonderful exchanges. I've led many Aikido groups to Shingu since then and brought my teacher here many times to Santa Cruz. And uh, what an amazing cultural exchange it has been. And that's how it started, 1973. Um, I return to Shingu every year except this one. Uh, may we all return to our normal lives next year. Thank you very much for allowing me to make these remarks. Thank you so much for everyone for supporting this connection. Linda, thank you so much for sharing your story and for your part in helping foster this relationship. I understand that shortly after this time, Nancy Item and others began exchanges between little league baseball teams. It's been such a rich and varied history. Now I'm gonna do a short slideshow. Can you see that? Yes, I can. Today, as we celebrate 45 years of friendship, we would like to acknowledge some of the many people who have helped nurture and grow our friendship through the years. With the ongoing support and commitment from the city of Santa Cruz, uh-oh, now it's not going. Oh, there we go. And as countless citizens and civic leaders have engaged with our partners, both here and in Shingu, in exchanges of all types. And as scores of young people have traveled to or from Shingu to experience life-changing opportunities. Behind it all are the people who keep these programs going through their tireless efforts. Among the many people to whom we are indebted for keeping these programs vibrant, today we want to acknowledge and thank Roxana Gowen and Taku Iwasawa for their many years of dedication to this program. In Shingu, Mr. Iwasawa and his team worked tirelessly on our behalf. Mr. Iwasawa's calm and friendly presence has served as the essential backdrop for decades of successful exchanges. We are thankful and honored to know you. In Santa Cruz, Roxy led 20 delegations between 2000 and 2014. To Roxy and her husband, Ron, we cannot thank you enough for all that you have done for this program over the years. All of the students and families you helped guide or host owe you a debt of gratitude. Thank you. From those of us now guiding these programs, we thank you for carrying and now passing the torch to us. And we promise to honor the incredible legacy you have left us. Since they could not be present with us today, here is a video presentation from our partners in Shingu. I don't hear sound, Bonnie. I don't either.
I could try it from my desktop if you would like, Rachel. Andrea, I'm going to try again. I can try too, Rachel, if it doesn't work for you. There seems to be a problem with the video.
okay, we'll have to skip then the end of the video and we'll, we'll be sure to give you the links to this. Um, I believe it's um, posted on YouTube, so you'll be able to hear the end of the mayor's speech and some nice comments that follow that. Um, I want to thank our Shingu friends for sending us that and the energy they put into creating it. And now, before Mayor Cummings shares a proclamation on behalf of the Shingu subcommittee, I would like to present a gift that we have commissioned to honor this 45-year milestone. And I need to do something here. Can you see that? Yes, we can. Okay, local artist Ron Salinas has created this art piece as a symbol of our ongoing friendship. And it will be presented as a framed piece to both cities. So with that, I'll stop sharing. Andrea, thank you for that wonderful gift, and thank you all for all the hard work you do in our community to keep this strong relationship going. Uh, we, have, we will appreciate it for years to come, and we hope that we can see it on the walls of City Hall very soon. Thank you, Mero Daoka and Sister Cities Committee of Shingu for your proclamation and acknowledgement of our longstanding friendship and relationship. I will now read our proclamation to Shingu. So whereas in 1956, United States President Dwight D. Eisenhower, with great foresight, created the Organization of Sister Cities International to carry out the mission of achieving peace through mutual respect, understanding, and cooperation between peoples around the world. And whereas the peaceful relationship between the United States of America and Japan is widespread, and there are over 455 sister city, sister state relationships that have been recorded between our two countries. And whereas the establishment of the sister city relationship between Santa Cruz, California, the United States of America, with Shingu City, Wakayama, Japan in 1974 is a historic a historical point to mark the official beginning of our ongoing friendship under the Sister Cities International Program. And whereas we have long enjoyed reciprocal, enriching, and cross-cultural friendships between Santa Cruz and Shingu City during this extended time as visible proof of this long-lasting peaceful relationship, and whereas our continued commitment to this friendship has manifested in hundreds of young students from Santa Cruz and Shingu City experiencing valuable cultural and educational exchanges that have added to the deeper understanding and appreciation of other ways of living. And whereas in addition, our continued commitment to this friendship has manifested in numerous adults from Santa Cruz and Shingu City experiencing valuable cultural, business, and educational exchanges that have added to the deeper understanding and appreciation of other ways of living and helped foster new economic growth and development. Now, therefore, I, Justin Cummings, Mayor of the City of Santa Cruz, do hereby proclaim December 8th, 2020, as Sister City Friendship with Shingu's 45th Anniversary Day in the City of Santa Cruz, and from this day forward, recommit to sustaining the strong friendship and sisterhood between our two countries and cities. years of, of um, cultivating this relationship and friendship with, with Shingu Japan, and I hope that moving forward we'll be back here in another 45 years to celebrate once again. And with that, I'd like to open it up to any council members who'd like to make any comments. Council Member Matthews. I do join everyone in appreciating the, the beauty of this connection over years. Um, I've been fortunate to participate in it here in San Cruz and in Shingu, and it, it is a wonderful grassroots citizen-based program. So thanks to everybody. Um, if one of the committee members could mention, you have, I think, an upcoming uh, event 
celebration as well. Um, maybe if you could mention that for others who'd like to um, log in or however it's being structured. <laughs> yes, thank you. Thank you, Cynthia, and thank you for all of your support and participation over the years. We've really appreciated it. Um, we do have a virtual event we're holding with our partners on uh, December 13th at 4 p.m. It's going to be a Zoom, an interactive Zoom call, and um, all of you will be receiving an invitation to participate if you haven't already. So we'd welcome you. You could either participate or just view it through a live feed that will be on the Parks and Recreation Facebook page. Thank you. It's a small correction that the live stream will come from the Santa Cruz Sister Cities Committee Facebook page, and I hope you will all join us, and the public is welcome. All right, thank you. Look forward to sharing that. Uh, Council Member Watkins. I, um, I won't say a whole lot. I could go on and on about my appreciation for this relationship and how privileged I feel to have had the opportunity to travel to Shingu last year and to really get to understand um, their culture and just our deep love for each other and how much we can learn from one another. And I just want to thank the Sister Cities Committee, Andrea and Linda, it was a pleasure to travel with you, and I appreciate all your work in providing this opportunity for our students, but just maintaining this really precious relationship. And thank you also, Linda, for sharing our history, and it's so important to understand these stories. So thank you for fostering this relationship that we can enjoy and celebrate today. I was looking forward to um, hopefully being able to reciprocate the hospitality they showed us when we were there. And when the time comes, uh, you let us know, and we'd be glad to do the same for how, how loving and and uh, welcoming they are to Santa Cruz delegations as well. So thank you for the presentation. Vice Mayor Myers. Yeah, thank you, Andrea and, and Linda. I just I just want to um, just uh, acknowledge, uh, you know, I just this is just an extraordinary thing that I think our cities do, and um, especially in today's world. Um, so I just want to really acknowledge the work that you guys have done and everyone before you. Um, I had a, a, the privilege to participate in the Hiroshima and Nagasaki Memorial um, when we did that on Zoom this year. And um, it's, uh, the relationships I could see actually between people, even over Zoom, I could tell that these relationships run decades and um, you all care very deeply for each other. So um, thank you for dedicating so much time to um, maintain this wonderful relationship and congratulations on, on 45 years, it's great. All right, there's no further comments from council members. I'd just like to thank you all once again. Um, we're very excited to be here to celebrate today. Thank you for those presentations and we look forward to engaging in future events. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, with that, um, we'll move on to uh, the next portion of our meeting. And so I have a few announcements and then we will uh, move on to our regular meeting. Today's meeting is being broadcast live on community television, channel 25, and streaming on the city's website, cityofsantacruz.com. If members of the public wish to comment on items on today's agenda, instructions are provided on your screen. We will provide these instructions throughout the meeting today whenever we move into an agenda item that will be open for public comment. Please note that public comment is only heard on items Council is taking action on and not regular updates, reports, or presentations. The items that will be open for public comment during today's meeting are numbered items 8 through 24 with the exception of item 23 on our agenda. We are so excited to announce the ribbon cutting for the Rail Trail Segment 7 Phase 1. Please join me and our incoming mayor, Donna Myers, to celebrate virtually with the city and county officials, community partners, neighbors, and friends on this Thursday, December 10th from 1230 to 1 p.m. Simply click the Zoom link at www.cityofsantacruz.com slash rail trail, and I hope to see you all there Thursday at 1230. 
I'd like to ask the council members if there's any statement of disqualification today. Okay, seeing none, I'd like to ask the clerk if there are any additions or deletions to our uh, council agenda for today. There are not. Okay, next item is an announcement regarding oral communications. Oral communications is an opportunity for members of the public to speak to us on items that are not on the agenda. Oral communications will occur immediately after agenda item 24. If you wish to make comments during oral communications, please call in towards the end of item number 24. Okay, next item of business is a report from the city attorney on closed session. And so I'd like to uh, ask the city attorney if you could please give a report on the closed session today. Certainly. Um, yes, this afternoon the council met in closed session at 1 p.m. Uh, via Zoom to uh, consider the following uh, closed session items. The first was a conference with legal counsel uh, concerning liability claims, uh, the claims of nationwide insurance, uh, Gilberto Mora Enriquez, and the claim of Christine Elizabeth Jacobs. Those three items are also listed on your consent calendar this afternoon as item uh, number 13. Uh, council also received a report from and gave direction to legal counsel on two items of existing litigation. Uh, first item, Save Our Big Trees versus the City of Santa Cruz. Second item, Regents of the University of California et al. versus the City of Santa Cruz. Uh, there was no reported action on those items. Thank you very much. Next up, I'd like to call on the city manager to report and provide updates on city events and business items. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, this afternoon, I wanted to do an update on the latest uh, state uh, home order that was issued by the governor. So I'll uh, turn over my screen to a PowerPoint presentation. Governor's Regional, oh, there we go. Now, okay, we're, now we're, we're Okay, perfect. 
All right, so I was on this uh, slide here. So you can see that uh, these are the three, I'm sorry, the five uh, regions that were established uh, under this new uh, order. Uh, the very large regions. regions. Yes, still on the not, not the right slide. Yeah. Huh. And I think you have to say, um, I think you have to click on slideshow. We're seeing all your the notes or the, uh, the yeah. There you go. That's what I'm doing. Vaughn is going to help me here. Sorry about that. If you go to some beginning. That's what I've been doing. There you go. But it still doesn't. That's exactly yeah. what I've been doing. Can Can you see it now? Yes. All right. We We can see the PowerPoint, but we can't see. It. We're still on the first slide. It briefly shows oh, here. Yeah, never mind. I, I saw the little click, the use presenter view. Somehow it was clicked. Okay, this should work now. Okay. Um, I didn't click on that. I don't know why it was clicked. There we go. Can you see it now? All right. Now, yes. Okay. For some reason, it was defaulted on uh, presenter's view. So. Okay, here we go. So um, to start over again, you, I, I noted the uh, reason to stay home order and the rationale behind it uh, and the 50% threshold. Um, these are the five regions, uh, Northern California, Bay Area, Greater Sacramento, San Joaquin Valley, Southern California, the very large regions uh, and include multiple counties within each region. We are in the Bay Area uh, region, which is, includes 11 counties, uh, all the way up from Napa, Marin, down to Monterey, uh, and most of the Bay Area counties as well. Um, and uh, the other the other regions are very large as well. So the Southern California one, for example, includes um, all the way from San Luis Obispo down to LA, and then around towards the east, uh, uh, the eastern uh, borders of California. And uh, these are the latest uh, ICU availability uh, rates uh, in those regions. So the the way the stay at home order works, it's all based on availability of ICU beds within a region, which uh, they can vary by counties. Uh, so uh, in our county, the, the most up-to-date information is that it's at 25.7%. Now the uh, uh, order was issued um, in anticipation of expected rates uh, that would reach below 15% uh, in basically the entire state of California. For our region, that uh, expected rate was uh, expected to be reached uh, in May to late December. Um, however, uh, five counties in, within the Bay Area region elected to go early um, with some variations. So San Francisco, Santa Clara, Contra Costa counties, theirs became effective on December 6th. Alameda County, theirs became effective yesterday, and the Marine counties became effective just a few hours ago. Um, and then uh, others are uh, considering, uh, in our case, Santa Cruz County uh, is expected to make a decision sometime today, perhaps this afternoon is my understanding, as to whether we would uh, go early or uh, wait for the 15% threshold to, to take uh, effect, in which case we would have to then move to the, the latest uh, conditions. So the regional uh, stay-at-home order, its purpose primarily is, uh, is, is basically what it does is instructs Californians to stay home at home as much as possible and to stop mixing between households that can lead to COVID-19 spread. It allows access to critical services and allows outdoor activities to preserve California's physical and mental health. The regional stay-at-home order is intended to help stop the surge and prevent overwhelming regional ICU capacity. So under the order, there are sectors that are allowed to remain open with safety precautions, and those include critical infrastructure, schools, non urgent medical and dental care, and child care and pre-K. And then with respect to uh, other sectors, there are modifications uh, that are required uh, in addition to 100% masking and physical distancing. Uh, the significance is the outdoor recreational facilities. It essentially allows uh, virtually all outdoor activity. People can still go on hikes, uh, can go on walks, can go to the beach, uh, and uh, do uh, exercise activities outdoors. Uh, so those are, are still allowed. Uh, overnights at uh, campgrounds, however, will not be permitted. 
Retail, it allows indoor operation at 20% capacity, so that's reduced from what currently exists uh, with entrance metering and no eating or drinking in the stores. Uh, and uh, in addition, special hours should be instituted for seniors and others with chronic conditions or compromised immune systems. With respect to shopping centers, it allows indoor access to at 20% capacity also, uh, also with entrance metering and accommodations as well. Hotels and lodging, it allows for COVID-19 mitigation and containment measures, uh, treatment measures, provides accommodation for essential workers, or providing housing solutions, including measures to protect homeless populations. Uh, so it's allowed, but it's very restricted. Restaurants will have to, this will have a major impact uh, on our community in our restaurants, particularly uh, throughout the city in our downtown, but it only allows for takeout or delivery. Offices, it allows remote only except for critical infrastructure sectors where remote, where remote working is not possible. With respect to places of worship and political expression, it allows outdoor activities only. And then with respect to entertainment production, um, industries, studios, and other related establishments uh, that provide content for professional broadcasts can operate with it without live audiences. And that doesn't really apply too much to our region. And then in any region that triggers a regional stay home order because it drops below the 15%, the threshold operations in the following sectors must be closed, uh, except for those that fall within the critical uh, infrastructure sector. So this affects us as well. Uh, indoor and outdoor playgrounds, hair salons and barber shops, personal care services, museums, zoos, and aquariums, movie theaters, uh, except for drive-in, wineries, bars, breweries, and distilleries, family entertainment centers, card rooms and satellite wagering, limited services, live audiences, and amusement parks. So this will affect the, uh, the boardwalk uh, specifically here in our community. Uh, other major provisions to highlight, um, and I alluded to this uh, earlier, just with respect to hotel and lodging, uh, it is uh, uh, really limited and reserved to essential travel. Um, and so uh, hotels are not uh, allowed to uh, make reservations for non-essential travel. Uh, so it does limit that. The idea is to uh, really limit the uh, travel and exposure uh, of uh, uh, individuals uh, from one region to the other. And then finally, the, the terms of the order will remain in effect for at least three weeks. Uh, and uh, then it'll be evaluated and the California Department of Public Health will then uh, look at the uh, projections and then decide whether to uh, make a change uh, after that. Uh, with respect to our own operations, um, as I noted, uh, the, the order will have a profound effect on the individuals and businesses in the regions and in our community. Uh, however, it does uh, exempt uh, critical infrastructure sectors, as noted, uh, which includes government operations, uh, and that includes the city. And so the order should not affect public employees that are performing essential governmental functions. We'll continue to, to do that. And, uh, we will continue to ensure that city work sites and facilities are healthy and safe workplaces and that employees who are able to, to telework are, are permitted to do so as operationally allowed. Uh, we do have limitations there in some operations. And then those employees that are, are unable to telework shall be uh, provided with uh, all the necessary um, uh, requirements and, and, and uh, uh, PPE uh, and will apply all the uh, health and safety protocols to ensure that uh, they are not uh, uh, exposed to, to the uh, virus. So that concludes uh, my presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions. We also have other department heads here who can answer additional questions. Great, thank you, Martine, for that presentation. Um, are there any council members who have questions at this point in time? Council member Golder. Hi, thank you, Martine, for that great um, update. And I'm just out of curiosity, do you know how many ICU beds we have so we could, you know, you know, with the percentage, we can calculate how r roughly what that would look like? My understanding, um, and uh, Jason may have some more specific information, is that we have about six uh, beds remaining as of, as of yesterday. We don't have a large number. I think I meant in total, like nor normally, not remaining. In total, we have, uh, what? about 26 or 25 in that in that range 
Um, part of the, 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 the challenge really with ICU beds is the staffing. We have limited staffing, so we actually have additional rooms and equipment, but we don't have the staffing. I think the staffing is in, in the mid-20s range is what we have. Um, and those are between Dominican and Watsonville Community Hospital. Yes, Thank you. that's my understanding. Yeah, 24 beds is what I just got confirmation from. And the staffing is a challenge, yes. Okay, are there any other questions from council members? Council member Watkins. I apologize if I didn't, um, I, I didn't catch this, but do, how often do other counties have, um, other counties take over some of their sick patients if they don't have enough ICU beds available in their own um, region? Like, so for example, if someone's ill from out of Santa Cruz County, do they transfer patients over or how does that work? Or do you know? Yes, my understanding is it's it's done within regions, and if uh, if the capacity is uh, uh, reached in one region, then they'll, they'll transfer patients. Uh, uh, I don't have the specifics of how much that's occurred. Uh, I don't think it's occurred very much yet since we haven't reached 100% capacity, at least uh, within our region. But that's that's the idea to sort of manage beds from a regional basis. So if ours reached capacity, we, we would be able to to do that, and, and vice versa. I think I guess the follow-up question would be then how does that impact the percentage needed to fall into the different categories? So if there is the potential of shifting around the patients, then um, you know what does that mean in terms of the consequence around the closures? Well, the uh, the uh, the regulations are just intended to simply reduce exposure and then reduce uh, uh, people getting ill and then having to go into the hospitals. And really, they're really just intended to try to keep that capacity uh, as, as open and as available as much as possible. Um, and, and so that's why they're, they're put in place. Um, and, and then to manage just as best as possible without really knowing specifically exactly what's gonna happen. Uh, I imagine that if uh, it does get worse, there, there could be additional measures, uh, but the hope is that the, and it's hard to say because the, we're experiencing, uh, I think the surge that's uh, post, uh, uh, so the fall surge, which we still haven't seen, I think the Thanksgiving surge, uh, and there may be an additional surge post uh, uh, the, uh, the Christmas holidays. Um, but uh, so we don't know exactly what's gonna happen, but I think the idea, at least at this point, is to try to uh, get ahead as much as possible and try to keep that capacity available as much as possible. I think if it gets to a higher level, there is a, a you know, inner state or within regional uh, assistance that could be provided, but the hope is that we wouldn't really get to that point that the regions could uh, uh, work with it within the counties can work within the region to accommodate the needs for for beds. Yeah, there's a bit of controversy too because uh, the uh, uh, just a note about this uh, the the red, with, as far as the exposure and 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 the virus spread, a lot of it has been caused by. Uh, uh, congregation of uh, individuals uh, at uh, private uh, or public events that are uh, more like weddings and funerals and that sort of thing, and not so much from uh, exposure at retail establishments. So there is some controversy about how effective that might be, and that's why we see some uh, some counties uh, take a slightly different uh, approach with respect to when they begin their uh, the, the order, the state order that everybody has to comply with, and uh, that's what our own county will have to sort of uh, decide. Although, again, we're expected to to reach that capacity uh, between or mid to, to late December. But for a lot of retail businesses, this is a really critical uh, time for them. So I think uh, many businesses are hoping that uh, it can be extended as long as possible so that they're able to operate, uh, as, and, and also restaurants operate uh, as long as possible during a time where they make a, a student significant amount of the revenues on an annual basis. So that's a, a bit of a, a controversy at this point. But, but we'll hear from uh, what the county decides. And ultimately, it's the health officer who's, who decides. But the, as I understand, the county board of supervisors is discussing and has already discussed. I haven't heard the latest uh, today. And the health officer will make a decision about whether to uh, begin early or not. Thanks, Martine. Uh, Vice Mayor Myers. 
Yeah, Martina, it's, my question or comments are directly related to the, to the governor's order, but I, I thought maybe just for the public watching, my understanding is um, I did see some communication from um, uh, one of the newsletters I received. I think there's legislation, uh, potential to extend renter protections through December 31, 2021 now, and I was wondering if you have been tracking or anyone on staff has been tracking that legislation. And then similarly, I believe um, Bonnie Lipscomb's team has put together some really great um, information about uh, at least the, the, gover uh, the business assistance that recently was announced by the governor, I believe it was, um, where we're extending additional, there's additional uh, resources available for uh, local businesses. I don't know, if Bonnie, if you have a minute to just describe that or where we can point people to, um, but I think having at least that state stimulus available um, and then, Martine, I don't know if, um, if uh, Susie O'Hara or whoever's tracking legislation, if there's any clarity on, on renter protections moving ahead. Yes, uh, we, are, we are tracking that, and uh, I'll, I'll let Bonnie answer your questions about the, and the governor in his uh, announcement also uh, pointed to some additional measures to support businesses uh, as well as uh, uh, protections. But uh, Bonnie, do you want to comment on issues? Um, good afternoon, Mayor and members of the council. I was just pulling up uh, the documents that um, actually Rebecca Yoon and our business liaison prepared in response to the latest. Um, so let's see if I can go ahead and share my screen. And thank you for you guys uh, to your uh, department and Rebecca to you know those I think you produced those within a few hours of, of this of these programs being available. So want to just recognize Rebecca and your and your your group on getting these things out as quick as possible. Yeah, Re Rebecca has been amazing, and um, I just you know I'm always in awe of her uh, technical and digital and graphic design <laughs> skills. So this is Rebecca's uh, one of her work products, and. Um, this obviously, you can see the Bay Area mid to late December, obviously we're already considering an earlier, our county's considering an earlier, similar to some of the other counties in the Bay Area. So we're just, uh, you know, on sort of pens and needles waiting for that and then we'll be poised to update this. And then we are also working with uh, Santa Cruz Community Foundation um, on Spanish versions of this. We just one came out today from the Community Foundation. So we'll be updating this in real time. And then um, Rebecca additionally pulled together in sort of a, a combination of the latest uh, financial resources. And links to all of this is available on our choosesantacruz.com. When you have the button at the top that says you can click on COVID-19 resources, it's all there as well. Um, but um, as you can see, there's a variety of immediate sort of financial re relief resources um, that are available um, from, you know, autom automatic filing extension for taxpayers, um, payment plans, tax credits. Um, I think the, the most interesting thing we're all waiting for to find out is at the bottom, which is a small business relief grant of grants up to 25000 for small businesses and nonprofits. So there, you can see on this form, I'll just circle this, that you, they don't have all of the information about uh, that program yet, but you can sign up to get direct information for when it's available. So um, again, um, this uh, document I'm showing you now is available on our choosesantacruz.com website. If you click on COVID-19 resources. And then additionally, we included some of the resources on rental assistance and additional resources. So that's all on our website. Thank you, Bonnie and Mayor. I just, I just um, would note maybe for council members, um, if you have a personal Facebook page or what have you, it's great. These are PDFs, so they can be, you know, they can be, uh, they can be, um, whatever the term is, shared on your Facebook very easily. So just wanted to just, those are great products and keeping people informed. There still is money available. There's still help out there. So people should should know and be, you know, actively trying to, um, whatever we can do to help people, especially people who are with their businesses right now. So not all bad news. <laughs> Absolutely, and Bonnie, thank you all for putting that information together. Councilmember like Matt, we'll have the Spanish version out soon. Thank you. Great, thank you. 
Uh, Councilmember Matthews. Yes, I was curious. Most of this was focused on state regulations, obviously, and state resources. How much of this comes from the federal sources? Um, can you give us an update on the efforts for CARES, you know, three, I guess it is, and um, specifically um, local Democratic group is having a face-to-face -face meeting with Jimmy um, next week, and to the extent, I know staff, um, you talk with the federal people, but if there are particular things that we want <laughs> to get on his agenda, if you could let us know, um, also just to reinforce that message, because we're trying to work on both planes. Uh, yes, uh, and uh, we have been in constant communication with uh, uh, Congressman Panetta. He's been actually, you know, really great about reaching yeah. out and wanting to hear, and he's very, 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 very aware of our needs um, and yeah. the fact that the the last the CARES uh, the package was really um, insufficient and inadequate, particularly for a city like Santa Cruz right. with the the needs. Um, and uh, so we're keeping a close eye on uh, what may happen. It's, it's hard to say at this point. It's been some movement. Um, but uh, no guarantees at, at this point. We're hopeful yeah. that something will happen that will include uh, local government assistance, but I uh, don't know for sure whether that's going to be the case or not. Okay. Are there any further questions from council members at this time? Okay. Seeing none, um, I'll now call on the clerk to provide any updates on the calendar. There are none. Okay, thank you. Um, the next item, um, this, this, the presiding officer will provide council members with the opportunity to update council on any external committee meetings that occurred since the last uh, time we had an update. And so um, this is an opportunity for council members to report out on actions at external boards, committees, joint power authority meetings, and would like to ask if there's any council members who have any updates at this point in time. Council Member Brown. I thank you. Yeah, just a quick update uh, about on the Regional Transportation Commission. Uh, you saw folks who were watching saw that we have a ribbon cutting um, on Thursday at 12:30, and which we encourage folks to zoom in for. Uh, in addition, uh, many of you have probably heard, but I wanted to formally announce that. Uh, the RTC has received uh, a substantial grant from uh, the California Transportation Commission for our multimodal corridor program. So this is going to provide, you know, over $100 million, $107 million to uh, the for county uh, transportation uh, needs, and that includes everything from, uh, you know, working on the rail corridor to um, street road repairs, uh, pedestrian improvements, um, a lot of alternative transportation, bike and ped infrastructure um, is going to be made possible through this. Uh, and so it's just a really great, um, you know, it's just really great news. We're, we're thrilled to be able to um, really put some money behind our, our programming. And, um, you know, I think it was uh, also, uh, you know, a real um, indication of uh, California CTC, the CTC's, um, uh, you know, being pleased with the, the directions that we're going um, at the RTC. So, um, Thanks to everybody who helped make that happen, and we're looking forward to seeing the projects move forward. And I'll just add, um, because I think this is really important for folks to remember that um, being, you know, having passed Measure D and being now a self-help county for funding transportation um, really makes us much more competitive for grants like these. So I'll leave it there for, for now. Thanks. All right. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Golder, then Vice Mayor Myers. Okay, so I attended an AMBAG meeting, and it was mostly procedural, um, dealing with some transportation um, issues. And then I did the county um, countywide integrated waste management task force, and with that one, we discussed um, the debris flow. Um, planning phase of the hazardous waste removal, and it's um, done, and they're moving on to phase two, and they're getting ready for that and um, diverting that waste outside of our county. Um, there's also this thing that was really shocking to me that a new 
rule starting in January is that no pressure treated or chemically treated wood. So just, you know, the kind that has like that, that green and has like the kind of almost like the staple looking marks in it. They can't go into our landfill. It will be considered hazardous waste. So messaging is being worked on from our city public works and with outreach and things like that so that the community knows both won't be allowed in our landfill after January. And um, another interesting thing was the discussion around um, SB 1383, and there may be a regional approach to keep track of food waste. And I was surprised to learn that there's 97 food rescue resources organizations in the county, and that actually the Second Harvest Food Bank is actually ahead of the state in doing a lot of this work for us in the county. So that was exciting. And then finally, um, council members, um, uh, well, Mayor Cummings and um, Council Member Brown and I met with some students at Santa Cruz High School, and I thought that was a really cool opportunity where they shared some of their um, thoughts and things they love about Santa Cruz and things they felt like we could be working on and working towards doing better. And some of the things that they talked about was the excess litter and the frequency in which waste baskets get emptied along the beach and um, West Cliff, and they talked about cleaning up downtown, and they had ideas for more festivals downtown in more open spaces instead of along the cliffs. And then they were really um, interested in that cahoots type response. <laughs> they also suggested this hot topic of more parking downtown, and then um, they were concerned about uh, um, uh, homeless individuals. And I don't know if I left anything out, Mayor or uh, Councilman Brown, you can add to that. And they sent a really cute thank you video to the to the three of us that I shared with Bonnie. I don't know if she has a second, if she has it and wants to share with everybody. It was really sweet. So that's Bonnie, do you happen to have that video available? Do you mean me or Lipscomb? I mean you. I think I sent it to you and Justin. No, I didn't get it. No, you didn't? Summer. I have it here, if I could share it, but I don't know if that's allowed. Sure, uh, can you check to see if you have the share screen options? I, it says it's there, but I don't know if it's gonna let me. Oh yeah, it is. Okay, I'll try it. Do you, see a, do you guys see a teenage girl? Yep. 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 Line up, I'll push play. Yeah, it's pretty short, it's only like, 45 seconds, I'll show it. Can you guys see it? Yep. Yep. Thank you so much for meeting with us and letting us speak our minds. It means a lot that you guys care about what we have to say. And I think we'll do great things together. Thank you so much, Captain Elvis, for speaking with us. Thank you so much for coming to our class and letting our voices be heard. We really appreciate all you do for us. Hi, thank you so much for coming and speaking to our class. I really appreciate it, and it was really good to be able to talk to you guys and just kind of hear everything that you guys did. Thank you so much for coming to our class. We really appreciate you guys hearing us out and hearing our opinions, and we hope to have you guys in our class again. We appreciate the time that you took out of your day to hear our voices and opinions. Thank you so much. Thank you for everything you do. We appreciate it, and thank you for giving us the opportunity to let our voices be heard. So that was it. It was super cute. I did notice that it seems like the gentlemen were a little camper shy, but that was sweet of the young ladies from <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Renee, thanks again for setting that up. That was, uh, that was a really great experience, and it's been, meeting with kids is something I've very much enjoyed being on council. So. And I still want to put that out to there, too, is that if there's other schools or, or youth organizations or groups that want to have us come and listen, reach out. I'd be happy to help organize it. And I know I sent the text out to you guys, and it was like 30 seconds. There was three or four of you that were like, I'll go. I, you know, so it was great. So thank you, everybody. I really appreciate it, too. Thank you. Uh, Vice Mayor Myers and then Councilmember Matthews. Yeah, um, I'll just report out on um, Santa Cruz Metro. Um, I think the most exciting thing, um, I mean, again, the Metro continues to um, experience um, ridership decline. 
Um, we have been working hard on putting together extensive um, cleaning procedures uh, and um, we're following all the protocols with regards to providing uh, a safe experience for all bus riders. Uh, we are doing um, some analysis on the budget. We did receive a CARES, a, a substantial CARES um, uh, contribution. We've been uh, working from that, which has been very, very helpful in keeping operations going. Um, but we'll be looking at uh, an interesting budget future, um, I think mid-year. And we're hoping that obviously with a change in leadership um, nationally, we might again uh, realize some stimulus coming, coming towards uh, transit. Um, the other thing I'll report is that the, um, the Metro is receiving its first um, all electric buses. Uh, and we have done a complete re retrofit of our um, bus area where, where all the maintenance and storage and facilities for our buses take place. Um, we've installed um, the charging stations and Councilmember Matthews might remember the number off, off, off hand, but I believe we're receiving our first six to eight buses, all electric buses. Um, so that is incredibly exciting. We have more on order. And um, so that's a huge, um, huge achievement for Metro. And aside from that, um, looking at my notes, I think those are the main things I wanted to point out um, for members of the public. And um, uh, yeah, uh, I think I think I'll, oh, and the only only other uh, report I have is the um, I just wanted to recognize that the Cal's Working Group, which um, was the group um, that worked to get Cal's Beach off the beach bummer list this year, was awarded the uh, Sea Star Award from Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary Foundation on Sunday morning. And uh, Nick strong Kavetich was there to accept the award on, on behalf of the um, Cal's Beach, uh, Cal's Working Group and his words uh, regarding city staff's um, contributions to this effort were really appreciated. And um, yeah, just a really good, great example of, of city and nonprofits um, and environmental and scientists working together. So uh, that was a kudos uh, for, for the efforts of the Cal's Working Group. And I think those are my two main updates. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Council Member Matthews. Uh, I wanted to first of all thank Renee for that little video. It is fun to go out and speak to the high school classes, and it just struck me this is this is the 21st century thank you note. <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, okay, um, I think the main things are um, Vision Santa Cruz is in the process now of. Um, um, planning for the renewal of its tourism marketing district assessment district. And this is a pretty arcane thing, but it's very important to the funding of the um, Visit Santa Cruz work and the, um, the PMB assessment goes for a period of years. So they just now put together a, a committee of uh, hoteliers and, and lodging operators to work out the next um, formula going forward. So this will, this will take a bit of time, but um, it's part of their ongoing looking forward to providing a, a stable base for funding of um, tourism and marketing. And as you can imagine, the whole visitor services area is just on a whiplash ride right now. Um, I don't know how many of you get the um, directives from the state tourism board. Um, if you don't, I would suggest you sign up because it does give you a picture of this big, it does give you the big picture of what the industry is going through, which is um, practically day to day trying to figure out what are the restrictions, what can we do, what can we not do, while still trying to be safe. And I have to say our local Santa Cruz County really has set a model of its marketing. You, you've seen the um, um, messages that they put out. Safety is above everything. I have to really give them credit for that. And um, the Dream Inn was another winner of the Sea Star Award from the Sanctuary, too, for, for all the good work they do. Um, um, with the Green Man in supporting um, sanctuary awareness and um, uh, protection. Um, other than that, um, most of the others haven't been um, have major meetings, but I would hope in the coming year, um, you know, we've transferred uh, we, the downtown, um, 
Downtown Association, the has a new executive director, and the Downtown Management Corporation uh, is working with a new uh, national program for its hospitality um, staff. And so I think that might be um, good just to have a presentation from those two just to kind of refresh for council and for the public. Um, the, the, the significant and good changes that are happening with our downtown partners. Thank you for that update. Um, are there any other updates from council members? Okay, seeing none, uh, we're a little bit ahead of schedule and um, I think maybe if we can take a, a brief 10 minute break so people can stretch their legs and maybe grab some water, we'll reconvene at 3.20 and we'll start with our consent agenda. Once everyone's back in front of their screen, if you could turn on your video, we'll go ahead and get started with the remaining items on our agenda. All right, first item up is our consent agenda. These are items number eight through 18 on our agenda. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if you'd like to speak to one of the items on our consent agenda, now is the time to call in. Instructions are on your screen. Please remember to mute your streaming device and press star nine to raise your hand and listen for the cue saying that you've been unmuted. All items will be acted upon in one motion unless an item is pulled by council members for further discussion. Are there any council members who would wish to pull any items? Councilmember Golder. I don't want to pull, but I have a comment on item 12. I don't know, can I make that comment now or? So we'll, we'll go down the line and then we'll come back. Okay. 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 Uh, Councilmember Brown. I have a comment on 14 and a comment on 16. Are there any other council members with questions or comments on items on our uh, consent agenda? Okay, seeing none, I'll circle back to council member Golder for your comment on item number 12. Wait, I, I thought I see hands up out there in the audience. Oh no, we're gonna do comments and questions now, then we'll oh. open it up to public comment oh, and then we'll sorry. come back for action. Yeah. Sorry, sorry, okay. Um, so my comment is just that, um, well, I totally appreciate and um, support the collaboration between the Cap city capital and city of Santa Cruz regarding the training of their um, lifeguards. And I think it's, you know, wonderful um, partnership, but moving forward in um, the summer of 2021, which seems really far ahead <laughs> from now, um, I'd love to see, to the extent possible, us run a junior guard program, even if it's smaller. I know that last summer when Capitola was able to run their program at a reduced capacity, and you know, um, it really it caused a, a strain on our um, city families and children and I just um, know it's such an integral part of the community and I and, and and so I just wanted to address that and I I don't know if Tony wants to say anything or if that's just or if he can't say anything but that's my only comment it's just thank you okay I don't know if uh, Tony Elliott I don't know if you wanted to comment on that 
Hey, good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Uh, yeah, I would totally agree with uh, Council Member Golder. It's obviously a, a crucial part of our community. It's a program we hope uh, to run the summer. We've got really close collaboration with the other cities and agencies in the county and throughout the state. Uh, so we are gonna do everything we possibly can to run the program this summer. Uh, the boosters are heavily involved uh, at this point as well. So we've got good momentum. Um, just another, another plug on, on COVID safety, uh, keep safe and stay healthy. So it gives us the best shot of running a program this summer. But um, uh, hear your message, Councilmember Golder, and uh, appreciate that. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, um, Council Member Brown, and maybe we'll start with item 14 and then item number 16. Yeah, thank you. I actually, um, so I have a comment on 14 and I actually have a question on 16. Sorry, I didn't uh, make that clear. So um, uh, item 14 is uh, an amendment to adjust our salary and compensation schedule for a number of positions at the city that are in the temporary workers bargaining unit, um, some of whom are seasonal, some of whom are um, you know, part-time uh, and then kind of return on a regular basis. So I'm gonna just say perm attempts. Um, and um, I just wanna make a note that we are uh, doing this in order to meet the minimum, the state of California's minimum wage guidelines and um, so when we talk about the cost of living and how difficult it is for people to live here, um, you, know, uh, you know, I just think it's, it's incumbent upon us to, to think about how we as a city, as an employer, um, is addressing <laughs> the, the serious challenges that um, city workers have as well. And, um, you know, this is an issue that I've been working on for, you know, over 20 years now. And, um, you know, I, I just wanted to highlight that because I think it's, you know, it's, it's a statement that um, we, we have to follow the state to raise our minimum wage here uh, in a, you know, extremely high cost uh, part of the, the state. Um, and then I have a question on 16. Uh, if, is there anybody else who is going before on another item? Can yeah. ask the question. So we got, uh, this is a, about, uh, the, this is a um, side, uh, Pacific Avenue, 2nd Street in front, uh, uh, sidewalk and um, uh, sidewalk, uh, repairs um, and uh, I'm totally supportive and much needed. Uh, we did receive and our packet included uh, action minutes from the Transportation and Public Works Commission meeting uh, suggesting that um, they had unanimously approved this. Um, and this is, you know, this is a challenge with our action minutes and it kind of comes up from time to time that they don't really capture the nuances of uh, conversations that are had and we did receive uh, a message from one of the commissioners asking us to consider uh, uh, park, looking at the parking on Second Street and trying to uh, morph that into uh, protected bike lane, um, as we have on Water Street. It's you know super like it's lovely and it's working really well, and I've heard nothing but positive things about it. Um, I understand that there are issues around the number of parking spaces that we need to have in that area, but I'm just wondering, uh, and I think. Chris Schneider's here, perhaps you could just say something about that because I didn't want to um, ignore the communication from our Transportation and Public Works Commission about this. Um, hello, Chris Schneider, Assistant Director of Public Works City Engineer. Um, there was discussion at the Transportation and Public Works Commission about removing more parking uh, to uh, provide for a protected bike lane um, just on that one block um, but the commission unanimously approved the project that was before them. And so they, uh, that recommendation is included in the staff report. We're already moving, removing five parking spaces. Um, if we removed another eight, obviously there's another impact um, to the general fund essentially because the meter revenue and citation revenue goes into the general fund. Um, so there's a fiscal impact. Um, it would pretend, it would delay the project. We've been issued a coastal permit through the zoning administrator. It has not been appealed. If we were to move forward with removing more parking, we'd have to re-notice and uh, do another hearing before the zoning administration. So potentially there's appeal, appeal of the coastal permit, which can go as far as the coastal commission. And it's gonna take more staff time and um, 
you know, potentially a significant amount of time. We're sort of in this opportunity window to get the project out to bid. If it gets delayed, then it gets wrapped into other projects that we're working on that are trying to get out to bid, so more delay. Uh, what we did tell the commission is we'd look at a larger protected bike lane project in the future along this corridor potentially, providing that just on one block doesn't really do a lot. It, it's really a small piece. There's also a bus stop at that location that would not be protected. The bus would have to be able to, you know, get in and out of that location. Um, the collision data that was provided, we evaluated five years of collision history. There were um, three bike pedestrian accidents and two pedestrian collisions, none of which would be correctable by this, by the protected bike lanes. So, you know, they were, uh, you know, as often they are a mix of reasons and places that they happen, but it was based on that corridor from the roundabouts to the roundabouts. Um, that's uh, pretty much it. Um, we do have a budget. We received uh, grants. We're using Measure D. We're using Transportation Development Act monies and some other money. Uh, we have, we believe, enough money with the budget adjustment to complete the project uh, this spring before the summer season. Great. Thank you for sharing that. I, I really just wanted to get some additional information that we didn't have available. And I, like I said, I support uh, moving forward. Uh, and I just want to say, you know, I, I think that our community has um, been pretty outspoken about uh, its desire for, um, you know, protected bike lanes and, you know, additional protections for bike and ped um, infrastructure. And so, you know, I just hope that we, we really are taking that seriously and prioritizing those kinds of projects. I'm thrilled to hear that there may be an opportunity for uh, an actual a major a project for that corridor um, in the future. So thanks for your response. You're welcome. I just had one follow-up question. Um, I was just curious about, you know, this intersection or this stretch when compared to other areas of the city as far as, uh, you know, bike corridors or areas of high concern. And I'm just, so I'm just curious where this one falls because I, I would imagine there's probably other areas in the city where getting protected bike lanes might be more of a priority in this area, but I was wondering if you can maybe speak to that. Um, you know, I don't have um, all the, dat the data in front of me, but generally this is relatively low in relationship to, you know, our larger corridors like Water Street, Ocean, Laurel Street, um, places like that. So it's definitely not one of the higher locations. Thanks. Yeah, and I just appreciate those comments because I think that it's important that, you know, It'd be great to have protected bike lanes on every street, but as we're thinking about where to put these in, and especially this came up with in this slow streets conversation with, you know, what are our priorities when trying to protect bike people who are biking? And I think that we really need to focus on these areas that are, you know, they're statistically shown to be more dangerous than others and really trying to put our efforts towards those rather than just, you know, trying to make improvements every time street repairs comes up. But so I appreciate your feedback. Yeah, that is what we're doing. Councilmember Brown. I just one more thing on that. Yeah, and I I, I absolutely agree. Um, I am I really am bringing this up because I, I just wanted to understand. Um, but I would add that this is a this is not a main thoroughfare, and there are uh, certainly streets that, um, and I can think of many <laughs> that I would love to see more protected bike lane space on. Um, for commuters in particular. But this is a very, very high traffic area. There are people who are riding um, bicycles, renting bicycles, you know, when we kind of are back to, um, you know, open and having, you know, a lot of people are coming through uh, during the tourist seasons and stuff. I mean, it really is an area that, um, that could could use this kind of um, this kind of infrastructure. So while it's not um, certainly not the busiest um, or you know fastest moving of our uh, of our streets, and it's not a corridor, it, it certainly is a high traffic area. And given the the number of um, collisions, it, it just feels like uh, attention to that would be um, would be really wonderful to see in the future. So, but thank you for the the explanation. Are there any further comments from council members on our consent agenda? Okay, seeing 
none, we'll open it up to public comment. So if there are any members of the public who would like to speak to items numbers 8 through 18, uh, now is the time to call in if you haven't done so already. Once you've called in, please press star 9 on your phone to raise your hand. And once you've been unmuted, you'll be given two minutes to speak. Good afternoon. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, um, is this the mayor I'm speaking with? Yes. Good afternoon. Hi, I'm calling because uh, I filed a claim with the city a few weeks ago because I had a really bad altercation with a police officer. It was really unnecessary and it involved threats being made to harm my pet and myself and I was injured by this officer. And uh, I'm really sorry to hear that. I had been really supportive of the police up until that day in question. And um, I would like some justice in about it. I didn't really do anything to him, and he injured me, and he almost caused my dog to get hurt, and he was threatening my pet and myself. And I've never had anything like that happen. Again, I'm very disappointed with the way I was treated. You know, I'm 50 years old, and I don't, I wasn't gonna run away from him. He approached me really unprofessionally, and I was afraid of him, afraid for my safety and my animal. And uh, that's not something that I, you know, feel is appropriate for someone in authority to be using their authority to like kind of abuse people. Because he was threatening me the whole time, and he was saying I didn't obey him. I didn't obey him. And it would have went a lot smoother if he would have informed me his name and his badge, who he was. It was an unmarked car, you know, we were frightened by him, and uh, it was all over something totally ridiculous. And he tried to find all kinds of charges on me. He had handcuffs on me. He threw me around. He, he had my hands so tight I couldn't feel my hands for about 30 minutes. And it just was not professional. I mean, I've done a lot of psychology classes. I do daycare, and he has been trained how to deal with the public, and I'm harmless. He had no reason to be so aggressive and forceful and violent toward me. He was very out of control. I know I'm bigger. I was a little bigger than him. That might have played a factor in it, but there was absolutely no excuse for the threat. He tried to get me in trouble with the DMV, and the DMV called me back and met with me on the phone, and they're not going to put any charges on me. They felt that it was, was really ridiculous also. Okay. And it all started from a Thank woman laying in her horn. I'm gonna have to I'm gonna have to cut Thank you, you off. Thank you for your comments. Uh, yeah, hi, this is Garrett Phillip. As to the item number 10, meeting minutes, a problem exists that has repeated itself many times in the last two years concerning the clerk's mischaracterizations of what I say. It says Garrett Phillip spoke in opposition to flight pathways avoiding the land of the Amamutsan tribal band. First, it hasn't been their land for centuries, but I will admit I have spoken in the past that argues the council should stay out of being a megaphone special interest mouthpiece tool for the Amamutsan, but the actual speech I gave in the 1124 meeting contained only one sentence mentioning that I thought planes flying 10 to 20,000 feet disturbing tribal ceremonies stretched believability. Then I went on to mention a new justification actually in support of the flight avoidance idea based on the monument's proclamation, and then went on for about 80% of what time remained speaking about cultural assimilation. Garrett Phillips spoke about cultural assimilation would have been accurate. This pattern of misrepresentation spanning two years occurred also in the 1027 previous meeting where it was written, Garrett Phillips spoke regarding privilege and in opposition to affirmative action. I only mentioned affirmative action once, uh, and it was in regards to it being a form of privilege only. While it is true I oppose affirmative action, as a majority of Californians also do, uh, as shown by the resounding defeat of Prop 16, unlike out of touch Santa Cruz, that was not stated in any way in that speech, which was mostly all about multiculturalism, how different subcultural beliefs and values have consequences, and also differences relative to the meta culture of e pluribus unum does also, with privilege a tiny part of that. I request for correction, but better yet, don't have the clerk characterize what the public says in oral communications at all, and let the audiovisual record speak for itself unless directed to, much like the council does. I recall Chris Crowe remarked about the need to suspend characterizations of what the council says in deliberations 
motions, uh, stick to verbatim motions and votes, and I don't see why that shouldn't apply to what the public says for similar reasons. Uh, there are many worse uh, personal examples, uh, but even the council is misquoted occasionally, for instance, in the minutes of the Cuban medical cooperation item, which lacked the reordering of paragraphs and specific mention of the County Board of Supervisors, as directed by the in the friendly amendment. Taught me if it went out correctly, but those minutes were also not accurate. Bye. Thank you. Okay, seeing no other members of the public who'd like to speak to us on this item, I'd like to bring back uh, this item for action. Councilmember Matthews. Oh, you're, you're muted, by the way. I have to do that because my phone was ringing. Um, I will go ahead and move the consent agenda. Okay, so we have a motion by Councilmember Matthews, Councilmember, or Vice Mayor Myers. Oh, you're muted. I'll second it. Okay, so we have a motion by Councilmember Matthews, seconded by, Count, for, by Vice Mayor Myers to move uh, all the items on consent. I'll turn it to the clerk for the roll call vote. Thank you, Mayor. Councilmember Byers? Aye. Matthews? Aye. Brown? Aye. Golder? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Vice Mayor Myers? Aye. And Mayor Cummings. Aye. And so that passes unanimously. Next item on our agenda is the consent public hearing. These are items 19 and 20 on our agenda today. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if this is an item you would like to comment on, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. Um, once you've called in, uh, please remember to listen, th listen um, through the device you've called in on and not through your television or streaming device as you might miss your opportunity to speak. Um, once you've entered the meeting, if you before you like to before moving to the comment section, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. And once you've been called on, you'll be given two minutes to speak during public comment. Are there any council members who wish to pull items numbers 19 or 20 on our agenda? Okay, hearing none. Um, if there are any members, oh, um, Vice Mayor Myers. I don't want to, um, I won't pull the item, but I will be registering a no vote on item, uh, item 19. 19. Thank you. Okay. Um, are there any further questions or comments from council members? Okay, hearing none. Are there any members of the public who would like to speak to us on items numbers 19 or 20? Um, I have, please um, call in using the numbers on your screen. Once you've called in, please press start on your phone to raise your hand. I do have a request for extra time uh, from Garrett Phillips and Robert Norris representing Huff, Garrett Phillips representing um, a social media group. Yes, thank you very much for the extra time. This is Garrett Phillip. Uh, the discriminatory reports to law enforcement ordinance uh, to me should read uh, section 98620, discriminatory reports were prohibited, section A. It should be unlawful to uh, knowingly and voluntarily make a report known to the police or their supporting staff causing a peace officer to arrive at a location to contact a person by expressing no other reasonably necessary contact reason or by expressing materially false information with the specific intent to do any of the following listed below, motivated by any of these personal characteristics on the basis of a person's actual perceived race, color, ethnicity, ethnicity et cetera, as written. Uh, further, Section 2, in specific intent, uh, should be changed to, number two, unlawfully discriminate against the person. Uh, these changes are intended to allow free speech where conditions and facts exist and express to reasonably cause the police to contact and then necessarily be justified, uh, and to explicitly state contact must either uh, also be uh, reasonably unnecessary or untruthful to be a violation. Everyone needs to 
have the same rights as others in reporting unlawful behavior or in a valid emergency situation, and the actual violation description needs to assure that, not wrap intentions just around it. The existing violation description language casts too wide a vague net. A reported, remove this man in my back alley at 3 a.m. reads as a violation. So this is not the same as prohibited speech as direct bodily harm threats, inciting a riot, inducing mass panic. Uh, people must not be deterred from necessary contact and using protected free speech merely describing subjects. The word voluntarily attempts to remove a speech violation when specifically prompted by police. The addition of motivation elevates the necessity of showing some motivation exists derived from the protected personal characteristics to suggest police contact and not the mere mention of them. The addition of unlawfully to discriminate recognizes that there are many lawful discriminations such as in shared housing decisions and areas of law in which uh, they vary as to uh, what are protected classes against what kinds of discrimination. Both motivation and unlawfully are language used by the similarly proposed California State AB 1550 law. AB 1550 also states a range of compensation between $250 and $10,000, not $1,000 to unlimited. Uh, the suggested changes are similar to future AB 1550 law and make it less likely frivolous lawsuits will be brought damaging the reputation of the accused. This has theoretical uh, but practically rare benefit and needs to be finely honed and not a blind to consequences copycat ordinance with no real history of similar law to judge its merits. Now, uh, the rest of this is a little, you know, take it for whatever, you know, it's just an interesting opinion on my part. Uh, the house of racism was burnt to the ground in the 60s. Now the BLM sifts the ashes, tosses gas on it, and lights it. The national polls indicate the majority thinks the BLM has worsened race relations in the United States. The idea of billions of dollars in vandalism, arson, looting, provocative assaults, and murders are justified by the unfortunate yearly 14 to 20 unarmed police killings of black people, not all particularly proven to be motivated by race. Uh, when many thousands of black people are murdered and shot every year by mostly all violent black criminals, Mr. 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 Phil, I'm going to pause you for a second because I'm, I don't see a connection between your comments and the ordinance that we're... Well, I think, I think that's what motivates this ordinance. Uh, well, if you I mean, can keep your comments to the ordinance itself and issues okay. that you have with Well, you know what? I, I, I know you're not going to... Uh, you don't want to hear it, so uh, that's fine. I'll, I'm done. Thanks. Bye. Thanks. Are there any other members of the public who would like to speak to items on our consent public hearing agenda? If so, please press star nine on your phone and you'll be given two minutes unless you've called in to, to request extra time. Hi, this is uh, Robert Norris. Um, I'm working with a group called Huff, Homeless United for Friendship and Freedom, and my concern is that this particular ordinance, it's lacking the something, one fundamental category. While the general intention is good regarding racial discrimination and uh, making sure that false complaints are not filed about this and that if they are, there will be a penalty for that, there is no such provision for the really egregious situation for those who are, um, let's say, outside and homeless or poor who receive false complaints in a similar way. So there should be something added to this ordinance that isn't there already having to do with class and having to do with false complaints generally and, in fact, requiring the police department to, in fact, advise people who are making complaints that a false complaint is in fact a misdemeanor and therefore that if someone calls in and says, I don't like this vehicle in front of my house. You know, this, this suspicious looking character who's got a, maybe a dark uh, shade of, of, uh, of face coloring, he's, he's been parked in his vehicle in front of my house for quite a long time. The individuals who are making these complaints and drawing police resources and taxpayer dollars should be, in fact, advised by the police department. We'll be happy to, to research this if, it's, if it, in fact, you have specific uh, ordinance problems, that is to say, violations of the law, which we need to correct, or at least to document. But you cannot make a false complaint without being responsible for it. 
I also would say that there's a consideration here uh, that should be included in this ordinance that has to do with the issue of when a police officer does take a complaint, uh, whether it's for racial discrimination or what I think is also a broad problem of class discrimination, and the person who's being complained against wishes to file a counter complaint, police will frequently not take those complaints. They will in fact give a, advantage to an audience to the person complaining rather than the person complained about. And both individuals should have the opportunity to uh, file a complaint and if necessary to file a charge. They will be responsible if the charge is a false one, but the police need to facilitate an equal balance here. And I hope the community does something about it because I'm pretty sure this council will not. And I'm almost certain the police department will not because they've been advised of this for the last several years and uh, Andy Mills has declined to take any kind of action. So it's up to the community as usual to take action on these issues where legislative bodies will do nothing and we are left with a grim situation here in the midst of the winter no winter shelter and police officers taking, helping to harass people being driven away with no recourse in this new law. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. But any other members of the public who would like to speak to us on items on our consent public hearing? If so, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand and you'll be given two minutes. No other members of the public who would like to speak to us on that item. I'll bring it back to Council for action. Councilmember Matthews. I will go ahead and move the um, consent agenda, consent public hearing. Okay. Motion by Councilmember Matthews. Councilmember Watkins. I'll second that motion. Okay. So we have a motion by Councilmember Matthews, seconded by Councilmember Watkins to move the consent public hearing. Uh, if there's no further comments from council members, I'd like to ask the clerk to please call the roll. Thank you. Council Member Byers? Aye. Uh, can we pause for a second, council Me Vice Mayor Myers? I'm sorry, thank you, Mayor. I, I, I did not raise my hand quick enough. I thought I had turned it on. Uh, I just want to state for the record on this item, on, on my no vote on 19 is I feel that the policy, I'm, I'm not against affordable housing or striving to get to as high a percentage as possible. I um, continue to have concerns that this may be a disincentive um, and may not be accomplishing the goals that we'd like. Um, so I look forward to seeing if this is successful and um, just wanted to state for the record, uh, it is not an intent to deny affordable housing or try to reduce the amount of affordable housing. I have concerns about whether or not the uh, policy will be effective uh, at the 20%. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, so if there's no further comments, I'll go ahead and turn it back to the city clerk. I'll start over. Councilmember Byers. Sorry. Matthews? Aye. Yes, aye. Brown? Aye. Golder? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Vice Mayor Myers? No. Um, no, just on 19, right? Yes, just on 19. Okay. Um, and Mayor Cummings. Aye. So, means item number 19 passed with council members Byers, Watkins, Matthews, Brown, Golder, and Mayor Cummings voting in favor, with Vice Mayor Myers voting opposed, and item number 20 passing unanimously. Okay. Um, with that, that puts us at, our, at item number 21 on our agenda, an uncodified un emergency ordinance of the Santa Cruz City Council authorizing the temporary use of certain adjacent public streets and outdoor areas for all eligible businesses impacted by outdoor business closures related to the COVID-19 pandemic until October 1st, 2021. 
And I'll turn it over to our Director of Economic Development, Bonnie Lipscomb, to provide us with that presentation. Thank you, Mayor um, and members of the Council. I do have a brief PowerPoint presentation, and I also wanted to acknowledge um, the City Attorney um, who prepared the ordinance, um, and also Rebecca Unit, who is the uh, Project Manager, Program Manager um, for the Outdoor Expansion Program and primary author with Amanda Rotella of the program. And Rebecca is available today to answer any specific questions. But I'm giving the brief presentation today. So with that, I'll go ahead and share my screen. of an expanded date um, through an emergency ordinance of the Temporary Outdoor Expansion Program. Um, first, I just wanted to draw your attention. Ooh. Weird things are happening. Uh, first, I wanted to draw your attention to our um, website, and um, you've seen this page before, but just a reminder that choosesantacruz.com forward slash there's a button there, coronavirus, all of our available resources. We put resources from around um, the county um, for, uh, you know, for businesses in response to COVID-19, as well as new updates coming from the state. Um, through with our partner, economic, um, the ERC Economic Recovery Council, we put um, documents there as well as um, information on our partners, SBDC and others, um, as well as our own current City of Santa Cruz program. So it's a really great landing page for you to find additional information. Um, I also just wanted to draw your attention to kind of where we are. Um, you've seen this before. I've presented this um, as far as sort of the three stages of resiliency support that we, uh, you know, at the city and economic development and working with our partners are really um, are, are implementing. And we're really at this point, you know, we're sort of still on the verge, I would say, at times of when things change, of feeling like we're still in the survival rescue mode. But at times we're also in the stabilization. You know, obviously we are waiting, um, you know, right now to hear what's going to happen as far as the regional stay home order and that impacts for businesses, which is immediate. So the planning for that um, takes some time and we're you know trying to be as responsive as we can as we can be. Um, I will say we've made some progress. Um, I've mentioned before that we do have a countywide over 2.5 million that'll be leveraged up to six million plus. Um, countywide SBA um, through the Economic Development Administration a revolving loan fund um, that we are working on now um, with our partner National Development Council and our jurisdiction partners as well. Um, and so we are working on some of the recovery and rebuilding, some of the permanent working capital fixed assets largest needs. Um, and if you have any questions about that, happy to answer that towards the end of the presentation. Um, but right now we are clearly still in trying to provide some resiliency and stabilization for existing businesses in this, in this completely challenging um, environment. Um, what you see on the far left graphic is, you know, what I showed earlier today, which is, you know, a document put out by the ERC and we're working closely with them on making these resources available, which both have the latest information information on from the governor on the regional stay home order which we will update as soon as we get the additional information from our county health officer today and we're also having this uh, translated into Spanish um, we're also participating with the downtown association on a shop local specific downtown program and then we're doing a citywide shop local program you may have heard some of the radio radio ads and then um, we're also really supportive of the countywide effort to shop local this holiday season through the shop Santa Cruz County .org, um, where you can buy gift cards, um, the second sort of ride out um, effort of the ride out the wave, and really just recognizing that uh, shopping local this holiday season is so critical. It's, it's always important, but it's so critical right now with the holiday season being the season for many um, retailers of where they make the majority of their funding. And during this year of COVID, it's just now more important than ever. Um, so today we are talking about the Temporary Outdoor Expansion Program. Um, and just as way of background, obviously the photo on the right is a photo of Hulos and the um, partial street closure that we have on Cathcart down, uh, downtown right now. 
Um, the city manager, um, in his capacity as emergency services director, issued two executive orders, um, the first in June and the second one in July 30th, enabling eligible businesses to apply for a permit to expand the commercial activity into the public right-of-way and other outdoor spaces. So some of these are private spaces, some of these are public right-of-way, including streets, on-street parking spaces, and in some instances are public alleys um, and public parking areas and some even our sidewalks. So it's pretty extensive. Um, our, our department and working in conjunction with other departments, and I really want to say this is an all hands on deck. So from planning, public works, uh, fire department, police department, parks and rec, every department has really been instrumental in making this program successful and making it work and being responsive in looking at the permits and being able to issue in some instances even within the same day. So um, it really is a all team effort and I just wanna make sure I'm fully acknowledging um, the other efforts around the city. Um, since June, just to give you a little bit of background information on this, the city has issued 83 permits um, citywide under this program. Um, you'll see the majority of them have been downtown, which isn't that surprising, but um, we have 40 downtown, 14 on the west side, 12 in the Wharf Beach area, eight on the east side, four on Ocean Street, three on River Street, and two on the harbor. Um, and again, not surprising, uses of outdoor spaces, um, while the majority of these are dining, 76 of those outdoor dining, we also have issued some permits for outdoor fitness, a barbershop, when there was that period where you had to be outside. I think we may be going back to that, so I expect we might get some more um, applications for outdoor uh, services. Um, a drive-in comedy show and retail in Pearl Alley. Um, of our outdoor dining permits, um, just so that you have this background, uh, 30 have been on private property, 21 in on-street parking spaces, 14 on the public sidewalks, seven in street closure areas, two in public parking, and additional retail and dining in Fraser Lewis Lane. Of the 83 permits that we have issued, two businesses have closed. So while that's really distressing, I think it also is reflective of what our lifeline particularly for restaurants, this can be to be able to provide um, this dining outdoor during this period, um, which leads us to where we are today and the recommendation and discussion and consideration for you of um, extending the date and basically decoupling it from the emergency health declaration so that we have more time and so that our restaurants and businesses, participating eligible businesses have more time to operate outdoors and this may extend um, beyond, um, should most likely extend beyond uh, the actual declaration of a local health emergency. Um, we've been in discussion with the Downtown Association, um, most recently um, with the Downtown Commission subcommittee set up for this purpose, um, and uh, with businesses citywide about the need to continue this program beyond the current anticipated declaration of health emergency. And, you know, as I just mentioned, um, you know, we don't know at this time uh, exactly when the local health emergency will be lifted, you know, related to a vaccine, but we do know it's going to take a considerable amount of time for businesses to recover, and we want to be able to give them all the help that we can. Um, related to this, um, businesses, particularly right now, some have already done it at at high risk and are nervous about it, we're trying to take away some of that uncertainty for our businesses. They're investing now in winterization and other outdoor investments to accommodate customers so throughout the winter they can come to their spaces. But some of these investments, and they range depending on the business and the outdoor space um, that's being um, converted for dining and other uses, um, some of these costs are high, are high and it's going to take them some time to just recoup that investment in the outdoor space. Um, so with that in mind and in consultation um, with the other businesses and organizations that I, that I mentioned, we are recommending um, that the city consider adopting an emergency ordinance which authorizes the temporary use of these outdoor, um, both public spaces and the private spaces through our permit program that are impacted by indoor business closures related to the pandemic until October 1st, 2021. Um, and the ordinance includes additional information and um, which also says, or as extended, further extended, maybe further extended by the city council. Um, in consider 
consideration of the date at this point, we feel like that's um, a good first step. We may want to revisit that in a couple of months, but at least gets us through uh, the full winter, um, the summer season, um, and allows us to work on um, some other streamlining and program updates and guidelines um, that we've been working on with these groups and internally at the city. Um, so just briefly recapping sort of where what we see for stage three as we're moving into December, January and going forward on the recovery rebuilding um, is that commitment and um, we'll see what's in the federal stimulus package if there's anything particularly that um, we'll be able to provide um, and to our local businesses. Um, but also looking at what resources we have going forward. Um, we want to work on, um, this is a temporary program before you today, but we do have an existing, we call it the Parklet program, um, but what we would really like to do is work on creating um, a more streamlined version of that program and call it the Permanent Outdoor Expansion Program. Um, so that's something that we're discussing internally and uh, you know, across city departments and in, in consultation with our business partners. Um, we also have been working on uh, partnerships with Foundation Tech and I would say our other business partners um, in the area. The um, Grow Santa Cruz Recovery Loan Expansion Program made possible through the recent EDA award. Um, investment in capital projects, um, some of those are coming forward to you, some uh, have previously been forward and with that as well I would mention some of our uh, major affordable housing projects going forward in the next year, the creation of housing, all these will be really critical um, in some of our commercial areas. And then we have been working on an ED strategic plan and it definitely took a, a step back um, in order to take a step forward to finish a draft that included um, a COVID recovery um, element to that as part of our overall strategic plan. And so we're hoping to be able to bring that to you um, at some point in January. Um, and it uh, dovetailing with the interim recovery plan um, that you were working on as well. So next steps um, related to the temporary outdoor um, expansion program, we are constantly doing program evaluation and improvement. Um, we're, look, we're looking at some of the hours um, for some of the temporary permits um, and trying to, to, to make that work for all businesses, even those adjacent businesses um, regarding some of those unused parking spaces. Um, we've been updating the program's guidelines. I mentioned Rebecca at, um, earlier, our business liaison. She's been working directly with the fire department who's been pretty incredible. Um, and being very responsive and making sure that we updated guidelines to take in consideration outdoor heaters, electric heaters, you know, propane heaters, and tent canopies um, to make sure that these spaces are safe um, for our, our businesses and, um, and those who are visiting um, the, the restaurant pa patrons. Um, and then finally, as I mentioned, Next Steps is also um, spending this next you know, month or two to really work on streamlining our, our development of our parklet program for our outdoor expansion program and potentially with some incentives to make that um, more um, of a program that really can stand the test of time as we go forward in this new environment. So that concludes um, the presentation. I'll leave you with the recommendation um, before you. And as I mentioned, the city attorney um, it, drafted the ordinance before you today, and Rebecca Unit um, is also available to answer any specific questions you have about the existing program. With that, I will stop sharing my screen. Great, thank you, Bonnie, for that presentation. And I'm really happy to see that there's discussions happening around the permanent outdoor expansion program. I know that there's a number of businesses that have been you know, really wanting to see whether they can continue um, the outdoor dining in the future. And so to the extent that we can help businesses with that, I think it'll be um, something that many people will appreciate. I did have one question uh, that's um, somewhat related, because I think oftentimes when we think about the outdoor, um, what's happening outdoors with businesses, a lot of it's around the restaurants. And I was just curious about whether and to, to extent how many um, retail businesses are operating outdoors as well. So not as many. Um, we have, uh, let's see, we have some retail and dining. We have some periodic retail in Fraser Lewis Lane. Um, we do, and we do have some retail in Pearl Alley. Um, let's see, we had four outdoor fitness um, permits, uh, one barbershop that did since close because it went indoor, but we might get that application again. Uh, the one drive-in comedy show um, 
and I don't know, Rebecca, if you have anything that may be in the works that we don't have permits yet, but those are of the existing permits that we've issued. Um, that's what we've done. Of those 83, 76 are for dining purposes, but we do have a few others. Yeah, funny, I would just add to that, uh, Rebecca Unit says this is on. Um, we have had about four retailers to get advantage of the program, um, just with the nature of bringing any products out onto the sidewalk, um, it can be a little bit cumbersome for them and retail has had a little bit more flexibility, easier for them to sort of control the flow of traffic in their stores. Um, but we've seen some awesome activations in Pearl Alley um, with Stripe and uh, Kinship Salon there. They've brought some makers into that space and um, have really used that creatively. And then we've also seen the makers market downtown in the 1100 block closure. Um, they've been able to bring retail out onto the street um, as more of a, I think they do it every month, um, activation. So we're definitely encouraging other retailers or other businesses to take advantage if they can, but the dining has definitely been the most popular to date. Great, thank you very much. Um, Council Member Golder and then Council Member Matthews. I just want to super thank Bonnie and your department for working so hard on this. I know this has been something that I've been wanting um, in some permanence for years, and so I think it's interesting that this pandemic has brought it forward, and I hope it's something positive that comes out in the end, and I was just reflecting, like, that is because I spoke to a bunch of business owners over the past uh, month, and a bunch of them commented that they felt like it had made kind of a festival feel downtown, and it really, like, buoyed people's spirits and encouraged people to come and feel safe and welcome, and, um, and I think I love the outdoor heaters, but we are kind of huge babies, like all over the world, like people are out there and you can just bundle up a little bit and you'll be fine. You won't, you're not going to freeze. You, you'll be fine doing your business in your dining downtown. So I remind people, just get a puffy jacket and, um, and then they won't have to waste all that gas and electricity on warming our, our, uh, our little hineys at the dinner table. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Matthews. And Cynthia, you're muted. A simple question. Um, extensions of the time frame would be simply a resolution. It would be the whole ordinance change. Is that how you're envisioning it? In terms of the time. I think what we would be doing is bringing back an amendment to the ordinance sometime in probably uh, August. Uh -huh. Okay, so simplifying it. And since I'm going to have the role of historian for, for just this day now, <laughs> before the earthquake, it was prohibited in the city ordinances to have outside eating on the sidewalk. And, you know, yeah, eyes are popping. And uh, that was part of the, the big switch with the uh, redesign of downtown. And this is, I think, just another, <laughs> we're on that tra trajectory. So um, it is interesting to see how much we take this for granted now. It's just been great to see how it's played out. Absolutely. Uh, Council Member Watkins and then Vice Mayor Myers. Um, thank you, Bonnie, and thanks to your entire team for all the work you have just been doing tirelessly throughout this whole process. Um, I'm sorry if I missed it and you were just going through it, but in regards to your statement around the capital investments that a lot of these businesses are making to go outside and then sort of the, the um, connection or correlation to sort of our long-term strategy to get them, you know, to be able to use their out, outside space, you know, and then coupled with, I guess, also the uncertainty of the governor's executive orders going in and out around in-person in dining, um, sort of what are your thoughts on how we can support our businesses uh, as we kind of navigate that? that 
is. We'll be looking specifically on how we can particularly provide some support in this area for as long as this period lasts. But I think our, our goal specifically with this is the assumption that, you know, it, until we hear from the county that we're entering into uh, this regional stay home order, we want uh, that certainty for our businesses. And that's why we have that October 1st date. Um, and whether they're investing in, you know, um, you know, a number of propane heaters, some of them are investing into um, more attractive dividers, you know, uh, safety precautions instead of some of our K rails where, where appropriate planting um, canopies, you know, those are some of the major investments that businesses are, are making that decision. Do we do it? Do we not? How long are we going to have? Does it make sense to, 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 to buy these things? You know, they're looking at their bottom line and will this bring people down? Uh, downtown, you know, across the city to our restaurants. So we're, we're, you know, in touch with our businesses regularly and with our associations and just listening. We're doing a lot of listening this year and trying to figure out where we and local government can actually help. So we'll continue to do that. Um, we're also following, uh, obviously, closely the federal legislation for a stimulus bill to see if any of that will trickle down. Um, as part of our ED strategy, we will be coming forward in January with some more recommendations. We are working with National Development Council right now. Um, actually, Rebecca, since she's on, I can, I, can, I can mention her name. She's actually working on an MOU for our jurisdictional partners right now um, for the program. Um, we're providing a pretty big match so that we can leverage that 2.5 into considerably more out in the community as far as major capital uh, loans that could be available. You know, we're really hoping for another round, you know, the PPP loans and what that means, but we want to be available and be nimble enough, you know, to be flexible enough to fill a need that may not be met in the larger committee, uh, community by what's being offered at the federal government so or even at the state level. So that's where we see our role in sort of connecting and making sure that um, our businesses are aware of all the resources in a timely manner because the information, as you all have noticed, changes every day. So um, we're here, um, and you know we're always up for great ideas. So send them our way if you if you have some. Thank you, and I think you know I appreciate just your comments. Listening, being nimble, constantly monitoring and connecting is really I think the motto. So yeah, thank you for that. Okay, thank you, um, Vice Mayor Myers. Bonnie, and it's a really great, um, but heartfelt thank you for, you know, bringing this forward, keeping track, um, always being really kind of ahead of the, ahead of the great ideas, you know, and you guys are already doing them by the time people, you know, are asking for them. So I just want to thank you um, for staying on top of all of the things that your department is doing to try to help our local businesses. So, um, and just, I know during the during the presentation, I just wanted to make sure, Bonnie, um, that it's clear. Some of the images were from downtown, but 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 this but this um, this uh, action applies citywide. So I just think it's important to make sure that people, uh, the public, understands that. I know you guys talk with businesses every day, but um, just to make sure that um, everyone knows that this is a citywide policy. That's right. And just to really hit that home, we have 83 permits currently issued. 40 of those are for the downtown. Yeah. So we have 40 elsewhere around the city. And um, I did show a, a breakdown of that in one of the early slides. Yeah. So we, can, we can post that if anyone's interested in, in seeing that. That's great. Thank you so much. All right. There are no further comments or questions from council members. We'll go ahead and open up public comment. So if there's any members of the public who would like to speak to us on this item, uh, which is item number 21 on our agenda, now is the time to call in using the numbers on your screen if you haven't done so already. Once you've joined the meeting, please press star 9 on your phone to raise your hand. You will be unmuted and you'll be given two minutes to comment on this item. and deliberation. Councilmember Watkins. 
I'll just go ahead and move the staff recommendations. Okay, we have a motion by Councilmember Watkins, Councilmember Matthews. Second. Okay, so we have a motion by Councilmember Watkins, seconded by Councilmember Matthews to move the staff recommendation. Is there any further questions or comments from council members? Okay, seeing none, I'd like to ask the clerk if we could call the roll call vote. Thank you, Mayor. Councilmember Byers? Aye. Matthews? Aye. Brown? Aye. Golder? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Vice Mayor Myers? Aye. And Mayor Cummings? Aye. So that passes unanimously. Okay, so we're a little bit behind, and so hopefully we can move through the next items and everyone can have a break before our evening items. Um, next item on our agenda is item number 22, the 2020-2021 HUD AP substantial amendment for CDBG CB3 funding allocation. And so if members of the public would like to comment on this item, now's the time to call in. Once you've called in, please listen through your phone. And when we move on to public comment, you'll want to press star nine to raise your hand, at which point you'll be given two minutes. And so with that, I'll turn it over to Tiffany Lake, Principal Management Analyst, and Jessica DeWitt, Housing and Community Development Manager. Thank you. Um, so today we are doing, as Justin Cummings, our mayor said, the public hearing for the HUD 2020-2021 substantial amendment for CDBG CV3 allocation. So CDBG CV3 is special coronavirus funding related um, from the CARES Act that is also CDBG eligible. So this is an addition to our regular um, entitlement funds that we receive every year as a city. So our goals today are that we're seeking council approval of funding for the 2020-2021 substantial amendment and also the corresponding budget adjustment that goes with that funding. Earlier in the year, we brought our regular year CDBG and home funding to council for approval and we received our first round of CARES Act CDBG funding. Um, so in, back in May, we um, had final approval to award all of that funding. And after we submitted that to HUD, we received additional CDBG CV funding. So it's referred to as CDBG CV3, but it's actually the city's second round because CDBG CV2 went only to the state of California. And we received about 561,000 of funding. And that brings us to today where we're discussing the substantial amendment to award that funding. So of those that we awarded funding in the first round, only three of those programs, which are all food programs, have spent all of their money to date. Um, these three programs are the Community Bridges Meals on Wheels program, which in the time period that they were using our funds, um, was able to deliver over 25,000 meals. The Santa Cruz Community Farmers Market, which had 30,000 in funding, was able to fund 450 new families uh, in addition to those that they were already serving with their existing market match program. And then the Second Harvest Food Bank has been serving about 3,000 households weekly within just the city of Santa Cruz. And it makes sense that they've expended all of their funds because of the increased food insecurity that people are, are experiencing everywhere. So we have some statistics for the county that we've seen Food bank visits have gone up from 50,000 monthly visits to 88,000 monthly visits since the pandemic began. And Second Harvest, one of the, the recipients of our first round of funding, um, is, uh, is serving now about 40% of Santa Cruz County residents, so about 100,000 people. So it's a, it's a really large segment of the population that are needing these services now. So of the 560,000 in funding we have, 20% is set by HUD formula for program administration. So we have about 449,000 available for allocation. And staff is recommending that we fund um, homeless pandemic response activities with about 375,000. So since the pandemic began, the city has worked with the county in a supporting role to provide additional shelter in place resources. These have included additional shelter beds, hotel rooms, non-congregate shelters, increased outreach services, mental health response, and case coordination. 
but there's still a lot of need and there's some critical homeless pandemic related activities that are city specific that would be CDBG CV3 eligible. And these include establishment of additional hygiene infrastructure, encampment sanitation, and safe parking programs. And then we're also recommending that we allocate an additional 75,000 of CDBG CV funding to those food programs from the first round that have used all of their funding. So again, our goal today is that we're seeking council approval of the budget for the action plan amendment. And based on whatever budget is approved today, we'll submit that substantial amendment to HUD. And we should know and get approval and the funding should be available starting in January. And that's it, thank you for your time. All right, thank you very much for that presentation. Um, are there any questions or, or comments from council members? Councilmember Brown. Hi, thank you so much for the report. I am um, thrilled that we're actually getting some additional funding to meet some of these really, really pressing needs for our community. I am wondering, and I appreciate the list of uh, what the money might be used for uh, homeless services, homelessness response. Uh, and these are all areas in which I've been advocating um, heavily, so I'm, I'm really glad to see this happening. I'm just wondering if there is, um, if it's possible for us to get additional information, like, I mean, I, I just, it's a, it's a pretty big chunk of money and there are multiple ways that that can and will be spent. And I would love to just, for the council to be able to know what you know what the decisions were that were made and you know how how the money was distributed so if perhaps you have more on that right now but if not could it would just be great to get a report on um, where that money went related to um homelessness and the pan during the pandemic um and that that's really you know it's just it's just Again, um, hygiene, infrastructure, all of those things are so important and I think make a huge difference um, in people, the quality of life people's experience in our community, both housed and unhoused community members. So, um, you know, just kind of having a little more information about uh, you know, how we're putting that money to work would be great. Yeah, thank you. And, and we haven't um, used the funds yet, so we're seeking approval of the budget. And right. Susie O'Hara is on the line. The city manager's office has been coordinating most of the homeless response, so I think she can give more details better than me. Thank you, Tiffany. Good afternoon, Council Member Brown and Council Members. Susie O'Hara, I'm assistant to the city manager. Um, appreciate the question. And as Tiffany mentioned, we have not gone through the list of priorities at this point and um, identified specific projects that we would be supporting. But as Tiffany mentioned, um, there are very city-centric city needs. Um, for instance, as the county shelter and care DOC um, continues to manage the surge, the current surge, um, and are providing hotel rooms and shelter and other programs for folks that are unsheltered in the community. It, the numbers are spiking pretty significantly, not necessarily in the homeless population as of yet, but we have to kind of plan for that. And their focus is really on those that are most medically vulnerable, that have either an exposure or um, an assumed exposure. And so for us as a city, you know, we have a very diverse population of unsheltered individuals. And um, for us to meet the needs, especially folks that um, are chronically homeless in um, some of our open spaces, in areas that potentially are subject to flooding, um, we have debris flow considerations this year. We really need to be able to diversify who we focus on for those resources and have um, city-centric response. So as Tiffany mentioned, we um, are focusing on um, a diversion program that allows for Santa Cruz PD to, um, as they engage hopefully with some outreach workers as well that either provided by the county or through this, this round of funding, to ensure that folks that would be potentially subject to camping violations or other uh, municipal code violations um, would have an opportunity to have on-demand shelter. That's different than what the county is providing, for instance. Um, we are in, the, in talks with AFC about expanding our safe parking program, um, partially in response to the significant increase in RVs that we're seeing on the far west side. 
Um, in addition to that, just a huge amount of hygiene and sanitation resources that are required, um, particularly in our open spaces for folks that are sheltering in place. So that kind of gives you a flavor, Council Member Brown, of what we are proposing. But as of yet, um, there's so many needs, it's really hard to identify what will rise to the top. But uh, make no mistake, this, these funds will be utilized um, very well and they are very much needed. Um, in addition to that, um, work on Coral Street to improve um, social distancing um, for uh, housing matters and HPHP. We're really working with the county and, and Nielsen Studios on that, on that as well. So hopefully that gives you a flavor of what we're talking about. Absolutely, thank you. I'm, I'm really glad to hear all of those things and um, you may remember that I tried to get some funding uh, directed that way towards the Coral Street um, uh, area uh, recently and was not successful, but I'm so glad to see that we have some additional resources now. So thanks a lot and thanks for all your work to make it happen. Okay, Vice Mayor Myers. I'm sorry, I uh, jumped the gun. Um, I know you need to go out for public comment, so I'll, uh, I'll wait till after. Okay. Okay, so if there are no further questions or comments from city council members, we'll go ahead and open up public comment. So if there are any members of the public who would like to speak to us on this item, uh, now is the time, if you haven't called in already, um, to call in. And once you've called in, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. Uh, you will hear a cue that you've been unmuted, and you'll be given two minutes. Hi, good afternoon, Mayor and City Council members. It's Lisa Berkowitz, Community Bridges Program Director for Meals on Wheels. Um, am I coming through? Are you able to hear me? Yes. Yes, we can hear you. That's great. Thank you. Um, I want to thank you for your recommendation to provide Meals on Wheels with additional CDBG funding to uh, help support the food needs of seniors in our community. Uh, beginning on March the 16th, uh, the 58 unhoused seniors who were regularly attending the dining site at Loudon Nelson um, found themselves suddenly without a significant source of support. They counted on us for a daily hot meal, for shelf-stable meals for the weekend, and a safe space to meet with their peers, and all of this was suddenly gone. Um, in these extraordinary times, um, Meals on the Wheels felt it was really essential to try to continue to provide support to those unhoused seniors. Um, the seniors being advised to stay at home to protect their health and life, we knew it would be, we would be able to help provide support to, uh, and a, a lifeline to the seniors who have a home that we could deliver meals to. And um, additionally, in May, we began to hear from many of those seniors that the need was even for more food than we were providing, so we've uh, address that by providing a second meal, a breakfast pack to all of the seniors who we are able to deliver to their homes. So we're, we responded to the request for meals by providing over at this point 27,000 meals to seniors just since the 1st of July. But um, how to successfully provide for the needs of the unhoused seniors presented a much more difficult challenge. And the first few months were really tough and frequently our staff were meeting up with each week. I mean, my time's up, does it? <laughs> yes, unfortunately, but thank you for your comments. Thank you. Hello, Council. Um, this is Nicole Baum calling from the Santa Cruz Community Farmers Markets. Can you all hear me okay? Yes, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, again, my name is Nicole, and thank you for providing the space to speak. Um, we appreciate your recommendations that you just spoke to to provide additional funding to continue the market match double-up program at the downtown farmers market. Um, 
for those who aren't unfamiliar, this program matches a customer's first 10 EBT dollars that they swipe at market with an additional $20 of um, market match, at no additional cost to them. Um, so $10 of EBT becomes $30 at the downtown market. And I'm sorry, that's a combination of the existing match program we have and your matching dollars. Um, and so this match is used for fruits and vegetables only, uh, encouraging uh, nutritious food buying at the market. So we received a $30,000 grant for, from you all, and I think it was Tiffany who said, stated some of the impacts of that. Um, it represented 2,900 EBT and market match transactions over a four and a half month period, um, over 450 uh, of those were new uh, participants in the program. And uh, we've seen a tremendous increase in EBT use at the market since the inception of the program. It's been really amazing to watch. Uh, between June and August when the program was running, we had about 129 participants on, at an average market. That was an increase from um, prior to the, the program starting 30 individuals per market. Um, again, between the 1st of October and mid-November, the average became 168, so it jumped from 30 to 129 to 168 at an individual market. So we've seen like more than a quadruple in participation. Um, and this experience can be life-changing for residents. It's not just currently. It addresses accessibility issues for healthy food and then establishes new habits that can be long-lasting. So. Thank you for the recommendation to continue the funding. Um, we hope to, we hope that we it will continue. And um, I was going to state some testimonials. I heard that timer went off, so maybe there is a way that I can share some of those uh, with the council. Yeah, if you can uh, email us, other if you can email us those testimonials, that would be great, and we can um, get those on the record. Okay, I'll follow up with that. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Hi, this is Homeless United for Friendship and Freedom uh, organizer Robert Norris calling back again. Uh, it's winter and temperatures are nearing freezing. We're at, uh, in a situation where I'm told the, uh, I don't know how many, what, dozens of people in the Felker Street area are going to be forcibly forced to move tomorrow morning. And I'm wondering about the CDBG funding. Is there anything in these funding that will allow for the what has been a traditional opening of the winter shelter, which apparently is now being left out to dry, or I should say the homeless are being left out to freeze. Uh, also, of course, needed is our resources for the San Lorenzo camp area, which is now expanded to about 100 tents according to a report I saw recently on Facebook from Brent Adams. You need a working bathroom that is actually open. You need potable water. You need shelter for these folks, uh, at least the guarantee they're not gonna be moved to, to nowhere. And that's what apparently Felker Street people are not being given any real destination. So while Brent Adams and Keith McHenry try to struggle to address these shelter and food issues, you are not providing any kind of assistance in these areas that I'm aware of for the great majority of homeless people outside. Instead, you have these special sort of favored programs that are getting bits of cash from you. While, well, of course, the police department gets a huge amount of money to go after homeless people instead, to harass them and to go after their homes, as I mentioned earlier this evening, or I should say this afternoon. I mean, what kind of COVID outbreaks among the homeless are you going to have to wait for as it spreads to the house population? We've seen that growing in this community, 44 deaths up to now at least. I don't know what the current total is now. For you to take action to end, for example, the group shelters and instead open up individual uh, activity more than you've done now. I, the community has to act on this since you won't. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, last call. If there's any member of the public who would like to speak to us on this item, please press star 9 on your phone if you've called in to raise your hand, and you will be given two minutes. Okay, 
seeing no members of the public who would like to address council on this item, I'll bring it back to council for action and deliberation. At this point, I'm looking for a motion. Um, council member, Vice Mayor Myers. Thank you, Mayor. I will go ahead and move this item um, according to staff's recommendation to provide the funding from the CDBG um, extra funding to uh, a resolution. Let me just read it. Um, to move the recommendation for the 2020-2021 HUD AP substantial amendment for CDBG CV3 funding allocation. Um, this is a resolution amending the 2021-2021 action plan and directing staff to submit the substantial amendment documents to HUD, authorizing the city manager to sign an application for federal funding assistance for the program year for CDBG. CB3 and authorizing the city manager to execute program project grants, loan agreements, contract amendments, and related loan documents with community development block grant sub recipients as identified in the staff, staff presentation and contractors in connection with the consolidated plan activities proposed in the 2020 2021 action plan substantial amendment. There is also a second resolution appropriating funds for the fiscal year 2021 budget and approving the 2020 2021 action annual action plan budget adjustments. Okay. Um, so we have a motion by Vice Mayor Myers, uh, Council Member Watkins. I'll go ahead and second that. Okay. So we have a motion by Vice Mayor Myers, seconded by Council Member Watkins. Is there any further discussion on this item? Okay, seeing none, I'll turn it over to the clerk for a roll call vote. Councilmember Byers? Aye. Matthews? Aye. Brown? Aye. Golder? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Vice Mayor Myers? Aye. And Mayor Cummings? Aye. So that item passes unanimously. Uh, so moving along, uh, we'll move on to item number 23. Uh, item number 23 is a public hearing for 418, 428, 440, 504, and 508 Front Street. This item has been continued to the January 12th, 2021 meeting and will not be discussed today. Um, it looks like we have a little bit of time, so um, Maybe we can take just a quick five minute break and come back um, shortly after 4.45. We can start uh, the next item, which is item number 24, removal of mission bells. All right, so uh, the next item on our agenda, item number 24, removal of mission bells. Uh, for members of the public who are watching, if this is an item you'd like to comment on, now is the time to call in using the numbers that are on your screen. Um, once you've called in, when we open up for public comment, you'll want to press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. The order will be a presentation of the item by staff, followed by questions from council, and then public comment. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Tony Elliott, Director of Parks and Recreation. All right, good afternoon. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, City Council members. Uh, let me share my screen here. All right, are you able to see that? Yes. All right. Hang on one second. All right. So yeah, uh, for the record, uh, my name is Tony Elliott, Director of Parks and Recreation. Um, and today I'll give a brief presentation uh, regarding the city's Mission Plaza Park and the Mission Bells in Santa Cruz. Uh, Mayor Justin Cummings, uh, Amamutsun Tribal Band Chairman Val Lopez, and California State Parks Historian uh, for the Santa Cruz District, Martin Rizzo, will also join me uh, in the presentation. 
All right, uh, just a little bit of some of the background here. In the summer of 2020, uh, the Mission Bell marker uh, was removed from the city's Mission Plaza Park, uh, located near Holy Cross. Uh, it's kind of a before and after photo here. Uh, at that time, the State Park's Mission, uh, Santa Cruz, and the City Park were also vandalized. Um, it was kind of during the summer of, uh, of protests and social unrest this past summer. Uh, the actions, including the removal of the bell, catalyzed a conversation uh, in Santa Cruz about what to do next in light of the missing bell, and it created an opportunity for the Parks and Recreation Department uh, to engage key stakeholders uh, in the community, including our tribal leaders, Holy Cross, State Parks, uh, the Museum of Art and History, uh, and a number of others. Uh, the stakeholder group's objective was to begin developing ideas around how to convey a more complete and accurate history of the Mission Hill historic area, uh, including Mission Plaza Park, uh, and to make sure to include the indigenous voice and the experience in a way that hadn't necessarily been done uh, before. The conversation around Mission Bells and the history of Santa Cruz indigenous people is not a new one. Uh, state Parks, um, the Santa Cruz Mission State Historic Park uh, offers education and immersive programming and exhibits related to Mission Santa Cruz and the indigenous experience. The Santa Cruz Museum of Art and History and Museum of Natural History each have important roles in conveying and educating on the history of Santa Cruz. In 2019, Mayor Cummings and Ama Mutsun Tribal Band Chairman Val Lopez uh, and UCSC worked together to remove the mission bell on campus. Uh, additionally, at the October 13th, 2020 City Council meeting, the City Council unanimously endorsed uh, the community effort to update the narrative of Mission Plaza Park in the Mission Hill Area Historic District so that a more accurate depiction of the history of the indigenous people of the area is included. Uh, and then most recently, the city's Historic Preservation Commission unanimously supported uh, removal of the mission bell, the remaining mission bell, and advised that the bell be used for interpretation and education. So the proposal today before the city council would continue to take steps forward in collaboration with the community. Uh, so before the council, is the, the written request, I'll just read through this here. Um, the, the matter before the council is a proposed resolution authorizing the removal of the remaining mission bell from the city of Santa Cruz and directing staff to work with the Mission Plaza community, uh, community stakeholder group rather, to incorporate multiple historical perspectives and details in the historical interpretation. Uh, and I'll just say from the perspective of Parks and Recreation and on behalf of the co uh, community stakeholder committee, the goal really remains the same as to what was proposed to the city council back in October. Uh, and that's not to replace one aspect of our history with another, rather it's to work with the community to acknowledge and include the indigenous voice and convey the history of Santa Cruz in a holistic, respectful, and immersive manner. Uh, with that, um, I'd like to send it back to Mayor Justin Cummings. I believe we also have Chairman Val Lopez on the call and uh, with State Parks, uh, Martin Rizzo as well. But Mayor, I'll send it back to you first. Looks like I was muted. Thank you, Tony. Um, I just want to clarify that I wasn't involved with the removal process at UCSC, but I was um, informed by Val about that event that was going to take place and attended that along with a number of other council members who were there. And it was at that time that um, I actually had a conversation with Councilmember Matthews and shortly after with Councilmember Brown about working on this item. Um, this uh, was something that you know I thought was something we could prioritize this year, um, but given that the, the impacts that we faced from COVID-19, that obviously put things uh, on hold as it did with a lot of other items. Um, but as the, our Parks and Rec director mentioned earlier, when the bell was removed during the summer, um, it really did prompt an opportunity for us to have really um, um, serious conversations around 
should we replace this bell or would we remove the bell? And so um, I also want to thank Councilmember Matthews for putting us in contact with members at Holy Cross. Uh, we were able to have some very productive conversations. Um, and today, uh, what we brought, what we're bringing before uh, the council is this recommendation for the the city to um, support the removal of the bells in the city of Santa Cruz. Um, with that, um, I, don't, I don't really have many other comments. Uh, we, we, knowing that some of these bells had gone before the Historic Preservation Commission, we did want to provide that additional opportunity for community to weigh in. Uh, the, the Historic Preservation Commission unanimously approved uh, the recommendation. Um, in addition to that, trying to preserve also the other aspects of history so that we're not replacing one aspect of history with another. And so um, with that, the item is before you today. Um, but before I, um, before we, we close, we wrap things up, I wanted to give uh, our historian uh, Martin Rizzo from California State Parks and Val Lopez an opportunity to speak to this item. And so um, I'll turn it over to Martin Rizzo um, to share as well. All right, thank you, Mayor Cummings, and thank you, Tony, uh, for presenting this, and thank you, Santa Cruz City Council, for having us here. Uh, my name is Martin Rizzo. I work with State Parks. Uh, I'm the historian for Santa Cruz District. I received my PhD up at uh, UC Santa Cruz some years back. Uh, my specialty was the history of Santa Cruz, uh, but specifically the history of indigenous tribes and individuals and families from the Santa Cruz region. Uh, I have a book that's coming out uh, in 2021 about this history that traces uh, this very important history. And I, I just want to say a couple things uh, briefly here. Uh, first of all, I want to say as a historian, uh, this issue of historical erasure, which often comes up in conversations, uh, is an important one. And I recognize uh, that you cannot erase history, and it is really important to recognize uh, actual history. Um, but in the situation that we are looking at here, as with throughout California, uh, the real erasure of history took place over 100 years ago when Franciscan scholars uh, put forth a romanticized and idyllic uh, history of California that focused only on the missionaries and the missions as the true history of California. And this erased, uh, ostensibly erased, the uh, magnificent, long, complex histories of indigenous peoples, uh, not only in Santa Cruz, but throughout the whole state of California. Uh, and what was left in its place was a story that really focused on Spanish colonialism, on the missionaries, uh, that marginalized and left out uh, the story of Native people. Uh, and these mission bells, uh, they stand as a testament to this very erasure. Uh, and so the removal of these bells uh, is an important first step uh, towards a process of healing where we could actually recognize uh, the history of Native peoples here. Uh, I also want to, um, that's the main point I want to make, but the secondary point I want to uh, tell the council is that uh, we at State Parks are currently working on a, a virtual Mission Bell exhibit. Uh, we recognize that the history of the Mission Bells is very complicated, and the bells themselves have meant different things to different peoples over time. Uh, and so we are working on a online exhibit, which uh, we hope to unveil and release on the, uh, the Mission Santa Cruz State Historic Park website uh, in early in 2021. Uh, and this exhibit will explore this history, look at the controversy, it'll uh, show what the mission bells have meant for the Franciscans, what it meant for Native people at the missions, what it meant for people 120 years ago when uh, women's groups and the AAA decided to uh, put the mission bells up and down the state of California, what it meant more recently to groups like the Alan Woodson. Uh, and so anyway, I just want to let people know that uh, our intention is to show this history, but to show the very different angles and uh, things that these bells have meant to people. Um, so I want to assure people that there is a plan to uh, to do something with this and to show this complicated history. Okay, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Um, next, I'd like to invite Val Lopez, Chairman of the Amamutsun Tribal Band, to also um, comment on this item. Took me a minute to find the unmute button, sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor Cummings, Park Director Tony Elliott, and the full council of the Santa Cruz County, Santa Cruz City Council, I apologize. My name is Valentin Lopez, and I'm the chairman of the Amamutsu Tribal Band. Our tribe is comprised of the descendants of those that were taken to missions, Samuel Batista, in Santa Cruz. 
Personally, I have two direct descendants that were taken to Mission Santa Cruz, which was recognized as the most brutal of all California missions. The removal of the bell is an item that has been a goal of our tribe for a very long time. And we first talked to the city of Santa Cruz in August of 2018 about removing the bell, and so we're very grateful and very thankful that the day has arrived where this hearing can be held. And hopefully we can make a, the, uh, the, the, um, the decision would be made to, to have the, the, flat, the last bell removed. Um, the true history of California Indians has never been told. And uh, this is especially true of the California missions. Um, the last Padre Presidente of the California mission system, his name was Mariano Palleres. And um, when it was de determined that the missions would be closing, he wrote to the superiors in California and told them, we need to find a way that, to explain what has happened here in, Cal on, on, in California along the coast. All we have done is baptize the Indians, administer some sacraments, and bury them. There are no Indians left along the coast. And that, is especially, that is entirely true. In Santa Cruz, um, over 98, 99% of the, of the indigenous people died as a result of the mission up to that time, of those that were taken to the missions. That is a death rate of that mission. And, um, and, and, the, and the priest, uh, Father Quintana, and the other priests, they were most brutal as well. The story of the missions, to start, the truth of the story of the missions has started to come out. The book called The Cross of Thorns was published in 2015 published by Elias Castillo, and he started telling the true uh, history of the California missions. And that was followed by a book that was uh, an article that was published by Benjamin Madley, who wrote on the American Genocide, the Catastrophe of the California Indians. And he titled his article, California's First Mass Incarceration System. And he talks about the brutality of the missions. And also, uh, Martin mentioned his book. That's a very important piece of, of, of literature, of, of work, of the, 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 of, of the history of the California people. And we're very grateful to Martin for that. I th we definitely believe that the bow should be removed because the bow just glorifies a false history, a history that glorifies the mission period, it glorifies the Spanish period. Um, the, the bell represents um, El Camino Real, which is the highway of the gods, or the highway of the king, rather. And, and all, those, or all of those highways, the, 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 the trails that they followed in, the El Camino Real, the Portola expedition, they followed trails, the Portola expedition, they followed trails. And those were all indigenous trade routes that had been established for thousands of years. And all they did was come and use our trails and put their name on it. And then they get, and then they glorify them for that period of time, and 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 the communities now they use the missions, they use the symbols of the mission, they use Father Sierra, uh, Father Inepio Sarah, they use um, and, and the bells to to just glorify that period, and they, and and to bring in tourists, uh, you know, to, to to attract tourism to the cities and to the missions, and to make them money makers to glorify a, 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 a false history and the destruction of indigenous peoples, of cultures, spiritualities, environments, uh, and, and their humanity. And, 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 and it's time to, to, to stop that. And, and Santa Cruz is showing, is showing tremendous leadership in leading the way in doing that. And we're very thankful when that bell was mi uh, removed from mission, excuse me, from UC Santa Cruz, that was picked up by newspapers in, in Australia, Canada, throughout Europe, and many other countries. It's picked up by the New York Times and the Washington Post. It's time for that history to change. We're thankful that Santa Cruz recognizes that. And we hope that all of California recognizes that and removes those bells. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, I guess I'll turn it back to our Parks and Rec Director, um, just if there's any final comments that you have before we open it up for, public, for questions from council members. Okay, seeing that there's no further comments, uh, I'll go ahead and open it up 
to um, questions and council uh, questions and comments from council members. Uh, council member Matthews. Um, I would like to go ahead and make a motion if that's appropriate at this time. We still have to open, open it up for right. public comment. Right. Okay, I'll, I'll just put that on the record. I don't have further questions. Okay. Uh, Council Member Golder. I just want to say thank you to everybody for your work on this, and thank you to Val and, um, and to uh, uh, was it Martin um, for for your um, comments because I think we've received a couple of emails about erasing history and that and that to that vein I just want to say we're not erasing history we're making history we're making new history here and I just think that I was told my students that like history is just old news so here's the news like this is part of the story is the reason that we're moving these bells and I, I appreciate um, Martin's um, working that with that virtual exhibit and I'm just wondering, and I heard Tony mention something about where will, when it's removed, where will it be removed? Because I picture, you know, fast forward 20 years from now, people going, gosh, they used, they were here, they're gone, why did we remove them? How do people's thinking change and that kind of thing? So is there a place, where are they, they're not going to be destroyed, they're, I am assuming they'll be put somewhere, but as like a reminder, right? Can somebody speak to that, where, where they will physically... Where, where Tony, do, you want to go ahead, do you want to take that? Yeah, yeah, Council Member Goldberg, uh, yeah, I think it's a really good question. Part of the reason on the stakeholder committee that we have included uh, other interpreters, uh, but um, such as the Museum of Art and History uh, and others, we wanted to we wanted to make sure that we have a landing place for the bell and that we have an opportunity to tell that story and, and provide that education. I think we've had a lot of conversations about where the bells can go or what should be done with them. I think this is very much in, um, in the spotlight of the Community Stakeholder Committee about how to use these. Is it a rotating uh, item that goes to different museums? But, but I think collectively, um, whether it's at the State Historic Mission, um, incorporated as part of the virtual exhibit um, in some way, or rotates between the Santa Cruz Museum of Natural History or the MA, we want to use those venues um, and the, the experts that we have in the community to help interpret and convey that story. So we don't know exactly yet, but this is part of the work that the stakeholder committee uh, is really charged uh, with doing moving forward. But I just, yeah, thank you. So because it, it's basically like at this point in history, we're acknowledging that that genocide and enslavement happened, and it wasn't okay, and we're not going to forget about it by removing the bells. In fact, we're kind of helping change like the mindset, and I think it's really, this moment is very important also to acknowledge. So thank you, everybody. Thank you. Uh, Vice Mayor Myers. Yeah, I do. I just wanted to uh, express my thanks, Mayor, for your leadership on this, and um, uh, uh, Director Elliott. Um, I had a similar question to uh, to Councilmember Golder, so I won't repeat it. That was sort of part of my. I guess one question I have, um, because um, to the comment that that Chairman Lopez mentioned. Um, there are a number of people who travel the route of of the um, of the Camino, you know, the Real that, that kind of came up through California. I know a number of, of geologists and actually people who study rivers who actually use that trail to actually really understand California's watersheds and geology and many of us who work in water. Um, are exploring that as a place where we can look at potentially examples of historic habitat areas and various other things. So I guess my question is, my understanding in look, doing some research is that the Bells were part, it was part of a project born out of Los Angeles and met of several women's clubs with the idea that this would be, you know, the Bells basically are a one-day walk between each other um, and that that route um, was symbolized and sort of marked um, throughout California. So I, I guess I'm just curious, so I really like the idea that people are actually walking this, not potentially, some people I'm sure do walk it for the meaning of whatever it is that they're doing. It could be the, the you know, the mission, many people do do that as well. 
But I'm just curious, how are we going to, um, but, but I'm very fascinated about this idea of, you know, people walking California to really understand the environment, the habitats, the animals, um, really looking at the changes that have occurred. How do we, it says we will put up a plaque, but I'm just kind of curious, what, is that plaque going to be on the ground? Is it going to be in a, I'm just curious about not losing this geographic marker that extends, the, you know, across the way, you know, most of California, all the way to Sonoma at least, not, not north of that. But I'm just curious if you have any remarks about that and what, the, what these things, how do they be marked in our community? Sorry. Martin, it looks like you might have some comments, so I'll turn it over to you for now. Okay, thank you, Mayor. Um, yeah, I think those are good questions. I, I, first of all, I guess I wanted to respond. Just to give a little historical context, I think Councilmember Myers is, is correct in that history, right? It was the idea for the El Camino Real was born out of the early 1900s, a bunch of women's clubs and automobile club. Um, but I think the one part I wanted to kind of add a little more context is, it was a it was a myth from the inception of it. Um, this idea that the that they were one day walking distance. Well, that's if anyone's actually traveled to them, it's far from one day between them. But but this is the idea uh, that was put out in that early period. Uh, in fact, there was not an El Camino Rail, but there was many different routes between them. The missions kind of sprang up um, basically around the idea of kind of where could they get the Indians uh, as a labor force for Spanish settlement. So it had less to do with uh, this kind of romanticist idea that's come out around El Camino Rail. I also want to point out that while there are many people who do walk uh, El Camino Real today for many different reasons, and I wanted to say that there is, uh, for example, in 2015, there was a native family Tatavium, uh, from the Tatavium tribe of LA who are mutual friends of Valamine uh, who actually walked uh, from mission to mission uh, to what they call the Walk for the Ancestors um, to kind of honor the ancestors, native ancestors who had walked there. And they met with tribes all along the way uh, through this process. So there are many different people. They were also walking in protest of the canonization of Sarah uh, as that was a very hurtful moment for native Californians. So, uh, so I just want to point out that there are many different people who walk these for many different reasons uh, as well. So um, just to give a little context to that. Uh, and as far as putting things up to commemorate, I know Val and I have begun to meet uh, to discuss this. And at this point, there's a little early, so I, I know there aren't really any decisions and ideas that have really been put, uh, kind of solidified, but I know that, uh, you know, there are lots of conversations, discussions about, you know, how can we tell these histories uh, in a more uh, holistic way, in a, in a way that actually honors um, the, the, you know, the tough histories of what Native people endured um, through this. Thank you very much, I appreciate that. Um, that's great to get that clarification and um, yeah, just very helpful. I guess um, my, my only other comment would be, um, uh, I think that the um, Santa Cruz Museum of Natural History be, would, be a, would be an excellent partner. I know Director Elliott, you've mentioned that a few times. They have had one of the longest running exhibits in, in Santa Cruz County uh, regarding uh, the first peoples of, of Santa Cruz. Um, they also have a number of artifacts, uh, and Chairman Lopez has consulted with them as well as, as others in the Native community. So, um, and what's nice about their site too is that there is a Native garden and some other things going on. The interpreter, interpretation um, possibilities there, I think, are, are great, and many of the of the. Uh, great, you know, third, I think it's second or third grade um, classes come to the museum as part of their, um, as part of their regular curriculum. So I'm just going to put a little plug there that they might be a nice partner to um, provide um, an outdoor site that actually includes um, a number of the other cultural aspects of uh, Native, of our first peoples. And uh, so just wanted to put that out there. Thank you and thank you for everyone's efforts. Thank you. Okay, are there any further comments or questions from council members? Okay, seeing none, uh, Martin and Val, thank you both for joining us today. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and open it up to public comment. So if there are members of the public who would like to speak to us on this item, now is the time to call in if you haven't done so already. Once you've called in, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand and you will be given two minutes to speak to us on this item. Yeah, I 
Hi, this is Gary Phillip again. Hey, the two most important 100% true things to keep in mind are that removal of historical artifacts does not in any way change the past. Centuries old past is the past. It does not change the actual true significance of past events, no matter what variations of interpretations might suggest. Those are called historical opinions. Is calling the Elkdale Real a mythical trek because it isn't exactly on the very real Elkdale Real route and important historical historical interpretation requiring bell removal? Was Mission Santa Cruz also an off-the-path myth? Are the historical interpretations of the Mission Bells as colonial settler racist symbols that glorify killing, demonization, and so forth, uh, going to include which planet that idea is from? I totally reject the idea of bells or glorification symbols of that, except to people who wish to invent and promote that idea. It sure didn't come from those who put up the bells or the state who maintains a hundred of them. I'm not talking for great history, but any idea adults do not commonly know colonization brought war, disease, treasure hunting, forced labor, religious conversion, and that a mass ignorance of that exists is a total fabricated falsehood. Any idea the Amalutsen's pension for taking offense will be satisfied by removal, never to be offended by the next next and next thing, seems unlikely. It is also unlikely they bring any new historical revelation that isn't already part of the cited scholarly historical account. You present none, but if so, Graham Stanton destruction of an artifact isn't that. Is renaming Mission Street or tearing down the Holy Cross Church as a glorification symbol coming next? Will the historical narrative include the admission that judging long ago past people who existed in different times with different morals and laws than today is actually quite wrong? Uh, this reminds me of the current awful leftist, anarchist, race-based preoccupation of tearing down monuments and the 1691 Project's truly offensive attempt to rewrite the history of the United States from an ancient time before forward to the present in only the most singularly racist possible terms, including inherent white racism. Those historical perspectives don't deserve a rational American audience, more like jail. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, are there any other members of the public who would like to speak to us on this item? If so, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand and you will be given two minutes. Additional members of the public who would like to comment on this item, I'm going to bring it back to Council uh, Councilmember Matthews. I know you spoken up yes. previously. Yes, thank you. Um, I do want to thank the mayor and all those who've been involved in this process for approaching it with, I think, uh, a good deal of respectfulness and inclusiveness and nuance. And um, really, this is the point in in time when all over the country people are are thinking again about the meaning of, of monuments and symbols and so forth. So it's really timely here. Um, also, uh, it's clear that um, understanding history is continuous and, and evolving. <laughs> we see that. Um, and I'm really pleased that it has come to us in this way as an issue. It certainly, as has been mentioned in the questions of others, many details remain to be um, worked out. But I think we have really good people involved in the process, and they, they are uh, committed to um, um, gnawing on this phone and coming up with a good solution. So um, given all that, I would like to go ahead and move the uh, recommendation before us regarding the removal of mission bills. And it's particular thanks to all the partners that have been involved in this discussion and who will be involved in the future in uh, developing the interpretive program. All right, so we have a motion by Councilmember Matthews. Councilmember Brown. I second that motion, um, and I, if I could, just make a couple of comments now. I, um, you know, I'm really, really pleased to see this coming before us. I'm, um, you know, I'm just, you know, really, really pleased about the the community, co the collaborative effort that's been made to, um, you know, to move in this direction. I, um, you know, I think that 
you know, there's much I could say, but you know, have, it's not a reinterpretation or uh, you know, erasure of history, that, as um, Councilmember Golder suggested. This is really about um, recognizing um, you know, these cultural artifacts, these symbols of you know, a genocidal um, settler colonialism of Spanish Empire in the Americas. That is just what, that, is, that happened, that is just factually like, true. And so um, when it comes to uh, you know, telling the story, and it's actually fourth grade uh, that yeah. California, <laughs> California history, um, um, that you know, I really hope that um, efforts like these begin to um, you know, really, really push uh, a, a evaluation of the, the curriculum in the schools. I mean, we, you know, students in my classes, we, I, I teach about uh, you know, uh, Native American genocide in one of my courses, and students come in and they have, it's just shocking to them. I mean, they're, you know, college, they have to go to college to, to learn about this. And so I'm, I'm just really thrilled that we're um, taking the step today. I look forward to seeing what um, the community comes up with uh, to, um, to really help uh, flesh out this story um, and, and tell it in a way that's, that's authentic to the experience of the people who lived here for tens of thousands of years uh, before uh, Spanish uh, settlement. And um, I also just want to ask if, um, if the, uh, in terms of the intention, I actually, this is a question, I'm just gonna try to <laughs> figure this out. Um, the, uh, in terms of the intention to continue with the group that has been working on this, um, are you intending to keep that group together and perhaps invite others in? I just wanna make sure, you know, I know Mayor Cummings, this has been um, really um, important for you and I wanna make sure that you, um, kind of continue, you're able to continue to participate in an official capacity with, for the city um, if you're interested in doing that. Uh, and so I just wanted to see if there's something to be said about that in, an, in a motion or if that's just happening. Um, well, I would, like, I would love to continue working on this. I mean, we've been making a lot of um, progress working with the community and so I'd I don't know if um, maybe I'll ask the Parks and Rec director or other members of council if that would require um, formal direction. Um, oh. Councilor Matthews. Yeah, um, you had a very functional working group, and I would say just keep it together and keep on going uh, under the direction of Parks and Rec. And you know, if this um, museum has not been involved and wants to be, that's an effort. Of the um, of the story. 
by visiting different places. Anyway, thank you. Absolutely. Okay, there's no further comments or questions from council members. Why don't we go ahead and take the vote on this item. So I'll turn it over to the clerk to call the roll call vote. Thank you, Mayor. Council Member Fire? Aye. Matthews? Aye. Brown? Aye. Golder? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Vice Mayor Meyer? Aye. And Mayor Cummings? Aye. So that passes unanimously. And I want to thank everyone uh, who's worked on this for all their hard work from our community, from um, Chairman Lopez, and I uh, look forward to continuing working on this moving forward to um, have some kind of ceremony to, you know, when, when it's appropriate, um, and then also as we continue to work on the interpretation of our history, how we can make sure that we are um, including that indigenous voice and doing a representation that covers um, all perspectives of our history here in Santa Cruz. Okay, so with that, um, why don't we go, oh, sorry. Um, Just saying thanks, appreciate it. Thank you. Um, with that, why don't we go ahead and move on to oral communications. Um, so oral communications is an opportunity for members of the public to address us on items that are not on the city council agenda. Um, for members of the public who would like to comment, now is the time. Once you've called in, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand, and you will be given two minutes to speak to us this evening. Yeah, I'd, I'd request to be identified in the minutes as the unidentified man. Uh, I'd like to repeat some sound core political structural ideas that no longer exist today. The value of conservative function in Santa Cruz isn't appreciated, and the lack of pol political diversity here is a huge negative. In an ideal political environment where the common goal is mutually agreed upon incremental positive progress, liberals offer ideas for change, and conservatives put those ideas in the extreme test against the status quo, and thus only positive compromise can be achieved. The two extremes where conservatives resist all change or liberals rubber stamp every idea for change are both awful. Liberals have 100 ideas for change, but maybe 99 are garbage considering bettering the status quo, which is the result of centuries of accumulated considered thought and experience, is difficult to improve on, easy to destroy. No change means, however, no adaptability, no progress, no hope of a better world. Um, so uh, it, it would be better if there were a few conservatives on the council to shred the really awful ideas, but that doesn't seem likely in the cards in Santa Cruz where they rarely or hopelessly run for office. It's my belief many of Santa Cruz's problems can be traced to that. It is my hope for the new council that they won't duck act of asking the hard, critical questions and make the advocates prove their case. It is my hope for the new council that they will follow their own vision only if it is also the pervasive will of the people. I don't think for a moment that the progressives drowning and dogmatic agenda consider what any different opinions offer. Meaningful reason, critical arguments, if any, carry no weight and no longer ever seem to occur. Uh, this has negative consequences, and I hope to see real debate return sometime in the coming years. The ability, actually a personality trait, to dispassionately but politely offer critical considerations is a valuable asset to, for instance, lawyers and legislators also. Maybe uh, that pay the council full-time uh, starting next election has some merit along the lines of you get what you pay for. Bye. Thank you. Um, are there any other members of the public who would like to speak to us? Um, if so, now is the time. Please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand, and you will be given up to two minutes. I understand I have four minutes for this. That, if this is Robert Norris with Huff, yes, that's correct. Thank you. Uh, not on the agenda tonight, again, is the winter shelter or the transitional campgrounds, which serve the overwhelming majority of homeless people outside. Now, when Assistant City Manager Susie O'Hara, the go-to PR person on massaging the grim homeless narrative, so it sounds less outrageous, was asked last year, where will homeless people go when another of her expensive projects is closed down? A ringing response was made, which I'm now going to play, since it speaks more eloquently than I could. 
This is former council member Drew Glover, blocked, slandered, and finally removed from the council when he kept publicly embarrassing the Watkins Cummings majority of that year. The Santa Cruz City Council. And this part of And I'm trying to find it, but I may have a little problem here. It was a very eloquent statement, and it's a little hard to catch from the archives, but we're going to try anyway. Um, while I'm looking for it, I'll point out again that up in San Francisco, Mayor Breed, just like the current mayor here in Santa Cruz, as far as I know, has taken no particular effort to meet the demands of the San Francisco Board of Supervisors, which has demanded 8,000 rooms for homeless people outside. What I'm again referring to here is the fact that COVID-19 is spiking and the main shelter for homeless people in this city are group shelters. Admittedly, some with tents, some with spacing inside the group shelters, but nonetheless, group shelters. This is, this is not the safe way to go. This is not what CDC has recommended. And so it is something that the community needs to act on since the city council, in spite of re repeated requests, has made it clear it's just not interested in acting on this. It won't provide the funding. It won't provide the action. It won't... Uh, I don't know, provide the joint action with the county. We have one very expensive county campground, which is simply uh, not adequate to cover the situation. And that, of course, is a concern I continually bring up because it's real. And this council is about to go on vacation and take off while the rest of the homeless population sits outside. And here's what I was going to play. We voted against the closure of the camp specifically because of what we're dealing with right now, because of the reports that we hear in Harvey West and the businesses, because of the issues that we see downtown on Front Street, because of now the encampment on Main Beach, which has been exacerbated by the coverage in the press, which I think was rather irresponsible. But what are we going to do to alleviate having to have this conversation again in two months? Because I love seeing all of you, but I think we'd be talking about much more productive things, and we could be using money in a much more productive way to offer much more productive services. So uh, yeah, I'm really torn on this decision, because if I vote no, then people are going to say that I am for trashing beaches and that I don't care about kids' safety. If I vote yes, then I'm going to displace or be a, a company to displacing people without any guarantee of shelter or without any knowledgeable place of where they're going to go, because as the staff member just said, everything is completely hypothetical at the moment. So I'm at a moral crossroads, as we all are on this dais, and I'm really concerned about the direction that this is going, because the people that I would have assumed would put up at least more of a conversation around what we're going to do, uh, made one comment and then opened up into emotion. So that's really disconcerting um, as far as the way that we move forward. It's the fault of our city. I totally agree with you, Councilmember Brown. Um, I, uh, to another uh, member said that they were on the beach when they were in high school. Uh, I also had that same experience, except when I was in high school, I thought it was because they Come to the Homeless Memorial on December 21st, and you can see the results of these policies. Laurel and Front Streets. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to um, ask um, the city clerk if the um, screen with the codes and phone numbers is being protected because I just received um, an email that um, some members of the public are trying to call in and they're having difficulty. Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. So I'll, uh, if there's any member of the public who would like to call in, now is the time to call in using the numbers on your screen. Um, I'll give it, folks a minute to try to call in, but after you've called in, please enter the code that is on the screen. The meeting ID number is 972-1923-5348. And then when prompted for a participant ID, you'll need to press pound. And once you've entered the meeting, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand, and you'll be given two minutes to speak. And for members of the public who have called in, if you'd like to comment during oral communications, please press star nine on your phone, and you'll be given two minutes. 
I just tested it, um, and it did work. So if somebody just wants to keep trying, it'll work. Okay.
for individuals. And um, the keys, historically, the keys to the city are meant to confer trust and honor as the key symbolizes the freedom of the recipients to enter and leave the city at will as trusted friends of the city's residents. Here in Santa Cruz, uh, the key to the city is presented to esteemed visitors, residents, or others the mayor chooses to honor. And so prior to passing the torch to the next mayor, I wanted to take this opportunity to present the key to the city to a few people whose leadership and achievements have impacted our community or inspired our community in very positive ways. Uh, the first key to the city is gonna be presented to Raven Tershi, and here uh, to accept the key on Raven's behalf is Bernie Tershi. So if Bernie, you could turn your video on. So I uh, just wanna provide a little bit of background. Raven Tershi was born and raised in Santa Cruz, and is currently a professional skater, ranked 113th in the world. Raven has won numerous uh, skate competitions throughout the world, including a gold medal at the 2011 X Games, second place in the Tampa Pro Concrete Jam in 2019, and took third in 2018 at the Copenhagen Open. Skating is a sport that uh, I hold true and dear to my heart, and is also one that can be difficult to make a career out of. And as a local skater, Raven's achievements have helped to inspire young people and adds to the rich history of skating in the city of Santa Cruz. I'd like to congratulate Raven on all of his achievements and ask that the community join me in congratulating Raven Tershi on receiving this honor and the key to the city. Um, unfortunately, Raven was not able to join us, but uh, on his behalf is his father, uh, Bernie Tershi. And so, Bernie, uh, I'd like to open up the floor to see if you have any comments on remark or remarks. Thank, thank you, Mayor Justin. Raven, so sorry he's holed up out of cell range and can't be here uh, virtually tonight. Um, but he conveyed to me that this is a, a great honor for Raven and one that he and, and his entire family, all of us, will treasure um, across the generations. And um, he also conveyed that he wants to accept the key um, on behalf of the entire skateboarding, Santa Cruz skateboarding community, especially um, all those who inspired and helped him throughout his skateboarding journey. Um, and he hopes that he can do the same um, for the next generation of, of skaters here in Santa Cruz. Um, Santa Cruz, as Justin said, has a really rich skateboarding history and uh, Raven's honored to, to be a part of it. So thank you very much. Thank you, Bernie, and congratulations again to Raven. Thank you. Okay, the next recipient of the Key to the City for 2020 is Ashton Davis. And so Ashton, if you could turn your video on. So I just wanna uh, make a few remarks uh, on Ashton's achievements. Uh, but Ashton grew up in Santa Cruz and attended Santa Cruz High. He played wide receiver at Santa Cruz and joined the school's track team at the recommendation of his quarterback in order to become a faster football player. He actually walked on to play college football at UC Berkeley where he earned a starting role. And in addition to football, he was also a hurdler and was drafted by the Jets in the third round of the 2020 NFL Draft. Ashton holds the record at Cal for the 60-meter indoor high hurdles. He is third on Cal's all-time list of 110 hurdles and is currently a starting safety for the New York Jets. Through all of Ashton's hard work and dedication, his efforts have earned him a starting position in the NFL. These achievements help to inspire young athletes in our community and are an example of what's possible through hard work and dedication. On behalf of the city of Santa Cruz, I would like to congratulate you on all your achievements and present you with the key to the city. As a community, we are very proud of your achievements and will be cheering for you as you continue your career in the NFL. Ashton is able to join us today and I wanted to provide him with an opportunity to address the council and to address the community as well. Thank you very much. Um, thank you everyone in this call. Uh, I'm accepting this on behalf of uh, my parents and anyone that I inspired as well. I hope just like Raven to inspire the next generation and um, as many people as I can. And I'm super thankful and humbled and honored to, uh, to be here on this call today. And yes, thank you guys very much. Thank you and we will keep cheering you on along the way. Appreciate that. 
The next recipient uh, is someone who I think we've all seen, we all know and love, uh, Curtis Relaford. So Curtis, if you could turn your camera on. So Curtis came to Santa Cruz and prioritized learning and being taught about empathy, love, and compassion. And for the past 15 years, he's been inspired to promote those um, sentiments and feelings of peace, love, and compassion, and empathy for all throughout the community. He's been delivering food, clothing, building materials, and toys throughout Santa Cruz County, and has helped provide assistance in low-income communities of color and on Indian reservations, playing music and bringing joy wherever he goes. Caring and sharing since 2005, he's found peace and content in doing this work, bringing joy to many in the community. People constantly come up to him and tell him that they were depressed and they were going through changes, but once he came driving through with his music, and smile, it turned their whole world around and their whole persona around. He feels honored, humbled, and grateful to all the people in Santa Cruz County who supported him over the years. Curtis, since the first time I saw your love caravan in Santa Cruz, it's always brought a smile to my face and to the faces of many people who live in our community. Your message of peace and love remind us to care for one another. And today, as mayor of Santa Cruz, I'd like to honor your commitment to being a humanitarian in our community that continues to remind us to love one another and to give to those who are less fortunate. And I'd like to present you with a key to the city of Santa Cruz and would like our community to join us as we thank you and honor you for your work. Uh, thank you. I'm happy. I'm happy. I wish you a Merry Christmas. I wish you a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. I am honored and stoked to just all your supporters who supported me up to this moment. And I'm really feeling in a day to keep on promoting peace, love, compassion, having empathy for all people. Not just, uh, I'm sure not, but my biggest thing I wanted to say is just that I'm so grateful honored to be in Santa Cruz. It was a whole life turning transformation situation to be here in Santa Cruz. There are resources for every emotion you go through. So if anybody out there are going through things with everything that's going on in this world, let's just be in the moment. Live here now, be present, and enjoy life. Thank you so much. Thank you, Curtis. Okay, our next reward recipient, I think, is someone, um, you know, throughout the country this year, we've heard a lot about voting and the importance of protection of our voting process. And so I wanted to invite Gail Pellerin um, to honor her for all the work that she's done over the years and wanted to read a little statement um, before presenting her with the key to the city. Gail has been the Chief Elections Officer in Santa Cruz County since 1993. She was appointed by the, to the county clerk in 2004 and ran unopposed four times in 2006, 2010, 2014, and 2018. She's a former president of the California Association of Clerks and Elections Officials and served on the state and local voting assembly advisory committees and implemented policies to establish Santa Cruz County as a leader on ensuring accessible voting for everyone. Gail implemented many new programs and services during her tenure, including guidebooks on the election procedures, weekend voting, user-friendly websites, Passport Saturdays, clerk services in Watsonville one day a month, wedding program that includes daily weddings as well as Valentine's Day weddings, weddings in the park, webcam for live streaming weddings, early voting locations, and the latest Santa Cruz County Clerk's Vote Mobile. She's maintained an open, transparent, and accessible office, making sure she was always available to our constituents. Gail has been pivotal in ensuring that elections in Santa Cruz County were fair, accurate, and secure with an emphasis on ensuring a positive voter experience. Gail, uh, we know you're retiring, but we are so fortunate to have had you as our county clerk for all these years. And to honor your legacy and dedication to ensuring we have a fair, open, honest, and transparent election, 
I, Justin Cummings, Mayor of the City of Santa Cruz, would like to present you with the key to the city and ask the Santa Cruz community to join us as we thank you for all of your efforts. And at this time, I would like to invite you to share any words with our council and with our community. Well, thank you so much. This is quite an honor. I'm also very excited that I'm now a, a, a resident of the city of Santa Cruz. So uh, it has been a phenomenal journey working for the county of Santa Cruz for 27 and a half years. Certainly this election that we had in November 2020 was historic. It was my dream election. Voters were excited and engaged and everybody was talking about voting. Voting was cool and all the innovative programs we did to ensure great voter turnout were exceptional. So I want to thank you, the mayor, thank the council members, all the voters of the city of Santa Cruz, and I'm happy to become a, a vocal and active citizen of our community. So thank you so much. Thank you, Gail. Thank you for all of your work. And I just want to, I know that uh, since you're going to be retiring, I wanted to see if there's any uh, council members who might want to make any remarks as well. Council Member Watkins. Well, since you offer the opportunity, I too just want to extend my congratulations, appreciation, and whole gratitude for all your years of service. And also just really want to highlight how you've been so committed to education, to youth, and to really just exciting the next generation to also uphold their civic duty. I wish you the absolute best, Gail, and I look forward to connecting with you as now a citizen. So congratulations. Thank you. Thank you so much. Council Member Brown. Thank you. Yeah, I just also wanted to say thank you, uh, Gail. You are unparalleled in your commitment to, uh, you know, making sure that our our um, voting system is open and transparent, that um, that folks know and feel very confident in um, the, you know, our voting system. And it's it's I mean it's just amazing. I you know I've been there. I've been down to um, watch the votes being counted on different elections, and you know, and it's just and you know since we weren't able, back in the day when we weren't able to um, you know get returns online and we just show up at the county building and you know you were there and like cheerful and and it's we take it for granted I think or at least I have that um, you know because we have such an amazing uh, team there and you're in the elections at the clerk's office and um, we will miss you and uh, also know that you have uh, you're leaving behind a, a, an amazing uh, group of people there to Take, take over and um, look forward to working with you on community endeavors. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hey, Vice Mayor Myers. Gail, yeah, I just wanted to also just thank you. Um, yeah, you just inspire. You just inspire people's confidence and their. I mean, voting is a proud badge that people wear in Santa Cruz because of your enthusiasm and the. Uh, the energy you bring to democracy. So I wanted to recognize you for that and thank you for all your work over the years. Um, and also just, I think the vote mobile was, uh, is brilliant. So um, just the fact that, you know, you're bringing the, the opportunity to vote to people is um, so important. And so thank you so much for everything you did for this election and for all elections. And uh, yeah, enjoy your at least probably brief time to uh, <laughs> to relax. I have a feeling you'll dive into something very fast. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> Thank you. And Councilmember Matthews. Oh, Cynthia, you're muted. Can you send a message? You know, we, we thank you for the, the, the positive energy that you bring uh, and just set an awfully high bar, uh, not only in the confidence of our system here, but, but your real advocacy for participation. And I think of what you've done to support the Civic Summit, reaching out to high school students. And, and going above and beyond your position and being a very vocal advocate for civil liberties, civil rights, justice, and so forth. So you really have uh, have given it the full picture. Thank you. We're going to miss you, but you leave a great Thank message. you. Thank you again, Gail, and thank you for everything that you've done for our community over these years. Thank you so much. Have a great evening. Happy thank holidays. You. Happy holidays. <laughs> Bye. Okay, the next recipient of the Key to the City 
is uh, the Santa Cruz Warriors, and here on behalf of the Santa Cruz Warriors is President Chris Murphy. Um, the Santa Cruz Warriors moved here in 2012, and in partnership with the Seaside Company, we're able to build the Kaiser Permanente Arena. The Santa Cruz Warriors were the 2014-2015 NBA G League champions and the 2017-2018 NBA G League franchise of the year. Throughout their organization, over 1,800 local elementary school students have been impacted by Read to Achieve, one of the many education-based programs uh, they organize with Kaiser Permanente. Kaiser Permanente Arena has been used as a community facility to sold out concerts, UCSC games, recovery resource center, a polling location as a basketball arena. And just this year, the Community Foundation of Santa Cruz County and the Santa Cruz Warriors raised over 5,000 for the COVID-19 local response fund. The Santa Cruz Warriors have created a space where our community can come together, where they can put aside their differences and support their team, the Santa Cruz Warriors. Our community has embraced the Warriors and wanted to present your organization with the key to the city as an expression of our gratitude for the Warriors having chose Santa Cruz as their home and for the positive relationship we have been able to cultivate over time. As we stated earlier this year, we hope that we can create a permanent home for the Warriors here in Santa Cruz. And at this time, I would like to invite Santa Cruz Warriors President Chris Murphy to accept this award on behalf of the Warriors and to uh, share any comments with our council and with our community. First and foremost, Justin, obviously, thank you so much to not only you, but to all the council members and everyone involved to presenting us with this awesome honor. We're super excited to, to be awarded in this way. Um, you know, I think we've accomplished a lot of things on the court. You mentioned the 2015 title, three consecutive finals, playoffs more often than not, 95 consecutive sellouts at Kaiser Permanente Arena dating back to 2016. Um, but I think we're even more proud of what we've accomplished off the court. You mentioned the, you know, obviously a lot of what we've done with the kids and with Kaiser Permanente's help in the schools, but over 1,500 community events since we came here, all the youth that we've positively impacted, and I, I know we've probably made a bigger impact on kids in their endeavors off the court with reading and math and learning and what it means to be a positive community member than we have how many people will eventually grow up to slam dunk. Um, but I, I think I want to also thank a few other folks. Um, first, I think this is not a Santa Cruz Warriors honor. While we're super excited to receive the key and place it somewhere, um, this is an honor for the Santa Cruz community the way we see it. Like, for eight years, you guys have supported us um, good, bad, and different, but ultimately, you guys have supported us so much welcomed us with open arms when we came to the community eight years ago. Not a lot of people thought this could be a professional sports town. And wow, did, did all of you and, and us at the Warriors prove them wrong. Um, this is a place we're really excited to be. You know, we want to thank all of our, our sponsors that have been with us um, that, that help us out. All of our season ticket holders that many of them have had tickets since day one. Several of them on this meeting right now that I can see on screen as well. Um, you know, obviously we want to thank the Gold State Warriors for the not only bringing the team to Santa Cruz in the first place, but the never-ending support. We want to thank CW Nation, who all our fan base that continues to support us, and um, we definitely want to thank the city of Santa Cruz. I mean, all of you guys, everything that you're doing, long before COVID and fires and everything that 2020 has thrown at us, you guys have all been phenomenal allies and partners to the Warriors in, since 2012, and we're really honored to be in this, um, in this with you as we, we hope to figure out a way to, to be in Santa Cruz for a really long time to come. So thank you so much, Justin, and all the members of council and everybody that had a role in making this honor uh, happen. We're excited to proudly display the keys when we physically get them and can gather together again in kind of permanent day arena. Thank you, Chris. And it looks like council member Byers has a remark she would like to make as well. Um, I, I guess it was 18, I mean, 2008, 19, 11, 12. I can say that my arms weren't wide open because you left Bismarck, North Dakota, where 20 of my family had season tickets, and they are still suffering from depression because you left. But I talked to them tonight, and, and they, watch the, they keep track of the Warriors, and they're very proud, and I'm proud definitely to have you here. And I, I'll put up with my grumpy relatives. <laughs> 
Captain, that's, that's good. I'm happy to hear there's so many supporters in the Byers family. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Councilmember Golder. I just want to briefly say yes, it's true. Uh, on and off the court, the Warriors have made a huge impact from the youth in our community. And I've said before, basketball isn't my sport. I'm not even five feet tall. But um, but the kids are super inspired by the athletes coming to school and all the outreach you guys do. Your Maverick mascot, and we really appreciate the times you've given out tickets to the games as incentives, and the merchandise you've given out as prizes, and it's just created this like something for everybody to rally around in the uh, youth community and um, with the parents as well. So thank you. Thank you, Renee. All right, well, let's all give a round of applause to Chris Murphy and the Warriors. Thank you for everything you've done, and we look forward to continuing to work with you moving forward. Thanks, Justin. Appreciate it. Okay, so the last uh, round of Keys to the City, um, it's something I feel very proud and fortunate and, and um, uh, to, to, to issue these keys today. And I'm gonna, I'd like to call on the names of the PIs from UCSC who worked to set up the COVID-19 Molecular Diagnostic Testing Lab. So when I call your name, if you can please turn your camera on. Uh, Dr. Jeremy Sanford, Dr. Michael Stone, Isabella Bjork, John McMillan, uh, Elena, Dr. Elena Vasquez, Dr. Marm Kilpatrick, and Jobin Bivert. And I'm not sure if Jobin was able to uh, join us today, but um, on behalf of this group, um, you know, I, one of the biggest challenges that uh, we have faced nationally is that the COVID-19 fight has been limited by the capacity for diagnostic testing, and so testing for the presence or absence of COVID-19. UCSC scientists and staff saw an opportunity to help fill this gap. They have an expertise in RNA, molecular biology, and the modeling of infectious disease. This expertise was coupled with the lab space and the desire to help the community. Within six weeks of the lockdown, the team stood up the Molecular Di Diagnostic Testing Laboratory and began performing tests for the community. The lab has taken advantage of a custom design automated platform to expand testing capacity to more than 1,000 samples per day. The team focused on building relationships with safety net providers to provide access to testing for the most vulnerable populations in our community. To date, the laboratory has run more than 30,000 tests for our campus health center and for area nonprofit health care providers, and the care providers and the county jail, and is providing COVID-19 results within about 24 hours. They've also built relationships between UCSC and the community that will extend beyond the current pandemic. These remarkable efforts have had tremendous impacts on our community's ability to test in our county, and words can't express how grateful our community is to have such talented scientists who were able to create testing for our community. In honor of these achievements, I would like to present keys to the city to Dr. Jeremy Sanford, Isabella, B Isabel, Isabel Bjork, Jobin Bivert, Dr. Elena Vasquez, Dr. Michael Stone, Dr. John McMillan, and Dr. Mom Kilpatrick. And on behalf of the Diagnostic Testing Lab, I would like to invite Dr. Mom Kilpatrick and Dr. John McMillan to share a short presentation about the lab and provide remarks on behalf of this group. First off, uh, let me start by um, thanking Mayor Cummings for the incredible um, honor and recognition um, that you're bestowing upon the Molecular Diagnostic Lab in UC Santa Cruz today. This is truly a, um, a project that has involved not only the people that you're honoring today, but actually hundreds of other people on the UC, UCSC campus to make this entire process um, possible. Um, you know, I think the, as, as an academic research institution, we always want to find a way to help our community and to help our world. 
and we were faced with a very clear uh, problem and situation when this pandemic broke out back in March. And actually, prior to March, the RNA biology group at UC Santa Cruz got together to start discussing the impact of the, the novel coronavirus on the world and on our local community, and very rapidly turn to an idea of whether or not we could make a local impact by developing diagnostic testing. And it was really um, the, the champion, uh, the, the very strong-willed championing of Jeremy Sanford and some incredible, um, uh, I think, luck as well as um, positioning of our university over the last couple decades of basic biological research that put us in a position to be able to make this difference in really only a six-week period of time. So if Marm wants to share anything really quickly, I will then share my screen and go through a little short presentation. I'll follow you, Lee John. Right, hopefully these slides load up. So uh, really, as I just stated, really back in, in late March, early April, our mission was really to help the Santa Cruz community by increasing the testing capacity. And not only just increasing the testing capacity, even back in April, we were starting to hear about really long turnaround times and the lack and, and this really, the, the quick, the short, the, the lengthy turnaround times impact on the ability of making the correct medical decisions to understand the spread of the virus in a local and regional communities. So we really set out to not only increase testing capacity, but do it in a way where we could help make instant medical impacts for our community. Um, so overall, in addition to really the, the basic science and the ability of developing a diagnostic tests during the COVID pandemic, uh, we really wanted to focus on the, those that are most in need, and in particular, those that didn't, don't have insurance and don't have access to readily available medical care, including diagnostic testing. So that was a really large part of, from the very beginning of what we wanted to focus on. A second part is as one of the largest employers and also one of the largest residents in Santa Cruz County, the ability of understanding and making sure our campus was safe, we felt was gonna have a very dramatic and important impact on being able to keep the entire Santa Cruz community safe. And lastly, I think there was one last really important aspect that we felt could emerge uh, from the work we are doing in the molecular diagnostic lab, and that's really forging a long-term, mutually beneficial partnership between the UC Santa Cruz community and the greater Santa Cruz community. That includes Santa Cruz Public Health, the Santa Cruz Community Health Clinic, Salud Par La Gente, the Santa Cruz Community Foundation, Santa Cruz County Sheriff's Department, as well as a long list of other partners that we have established over the course of this pandemic. And we feel like this is these are associations that are gonna not only provide help during the short, the, the hopefully um, the, the pandemic that will end at, at some point in time, but also extend into the long-term uh, mutually beneficial associations that can last decades. Um, I, I do want to say a, a few things, though, about the challenges associated that we were faced with in establishing a COVID-19 clinical diagnostic lab. You know, UC Santa Cruz doesn't have a medical center. Um, we have a small um, student health clinic, but that's the extent of what we have from kind of a medical um, infrastructure perspective. And what we were really having to face with the situation of was converting from a bunch of scientists Jeremy Sanford, Michael Stone, Elena Bosque are all truly amazing scientists. But we're now needing to switch and go from doing their research laboratory to developing a clinical laboratory. And I'm not gonna go through all the steps on here, but it's a very different world and a very different process uh, that, to go from a research lab to a clinical lab. And we are quite fortunate in this particular process that Elena Bosque, um, in her, her everyday world of running a research lab, does uh, uh, um, pediatric tumor genomics. And in the process of, of working with these incredibly um, important uh, pediatric tumor cases, uh, she developed the skills of being um, a, a clinical lab scientist in order to do the sorts of studies that are required to run a clinical laboratory. So we're really able to take advantage of her expertise in uh, pediatric genomics 
and be able to turn that into a situation of doing testing for uh, um, COVID-19. So over, over the course of the last nine months, we have had an absolutely incredible team of young scientists and other leaders on the UC Santa Cruz campus that have made this entire process possible. I'm not gonna be able to read all the names on this slide or the next slide, but I think that there's some really important names that I do want to mention. Uh, Dr. Elizabeth Miller um, is the medical director of our student health center, and she has been absolutely critical, not only for the establishment of the molecular diagnostics lab, but for the safety of all the UC Santa Cruz students, as well as the safety of many members of our community. And she's really been a hero on our campus throughout this entire process. I want to read the names of all of the young scientists that really have motivated and kept the, really kept everybody moving forward when this process could have fallen apart in so many different ways in the very early days. So the lab technical team of Namrita Dillon, Jolene Draper, Taryn Chang, Hannah Mulnubi, Savannah Randy, Martina Peterson, Maeve Nave, Anouk Vandenbout, Yvonne Vasquez, Scott Law, Natalie Gallagher, Molly McCabe, Karen Sanchez, Chris Calciano, Ellen Caphart, and Tail Egelhofer, all were absolutely critical to the success of this process and we wouldn't have done what we could do without their absolute dedication, innovation, and really willingness to make every, do everything possible to make a difference in our community. Um, this is just a, another small list of names that have, an, have had a critical impact on making sure this entire lab functions properly. These are the people behind the scenes that um, don't get any credit for what we've been able to do. Um, and they've, they've really allowed this process to move forward. Uh, I do need to make sure I mention Chancellor Cindy LaReeve and our CPEVC, Lori Kletzer, Vice Chancellor Scott Brandt, Vice Chancellor Sarah Latham, and ABC Jean Reed Scott, who have been critical to making sure this whole process works. And both uh, Chancellor LaReeve and CPEVC Kletzer were behind this from day one when they knew it was gonna be incredibly expensive. They didn't know how we would do it, but they got behind us from day one and really gave us all of the strength that we could, they could to make sure this was gonna happen. I just wanna um, go through a few more slides. And uh, really this entire slide um, can be accredited to Jeremy Sanford back in March in April when he wrote down what it would take to scale up a COVID-19 testing lab in Santa Cruz and what it would take to help the community. And these are all a series of different steps that we were gonna have to undertake to make this entire process happen. And they did. Um, every step along the way, different people got involved to make sure that we could do each one of these different steps to get the process done, to get to the point that we're now doing a thousand tests a day. There's one really interesting story, and this is where Joe Ben Beavert comes in, and that's on process number five, about a hands-free processing, to make this a very automated process. And I'm gonna show this slide not to go into the details of what tests we do and how we do it, but there's one instrument. This is the process that we follow in order to automate the entire system to do a thousand tests a day. There's this robot right here called a Bravo. It's sold by a company called Agilent. It's a big company in, in the field of scientific equipment. But it turns out Joe Ben Beavert, um, who most of you uh, know is um, founder of Joby Aviation, in a previous iteration of a company, Joe Ben actually designed and was the engineer that built this Bravo instrument. And in the, in the situation of a small world, Joe Ben and Jeremy Sanford lived near each other. They became friendly. And as they started talking about what we were trying to accomplish on the Santa Cruz campus, Joe Ben on his uh, willingly just decided to come in and volunteer his time to dial in this Bravo instrument and make sure that it works. And it, he did it better than any Agilent technician could do and really helped establish the pipeline that allowed us to do this testing on the sort of scale that we are uh, really set out to accomplish in the very beginning. So Joe Ben has been a really important contributor to this entire process. And what they learned from this have they taken on to actually start a company called Summer Bio where they're now doing hundreds of thousands of tests uh, for a lot of different communities. So um, we're really grateful to Joe Ben for the help that he was able to provide to make this all work. With that, I'm gonna turn the floor to Mom Kilpatrick, who is an epidemiologist uh, that really has helped us understand 
how to make this whole process work and understand the data to be making the right smart decisions for the entire community. Thanks a bunch, John. I just want to say one or two quick comments about really the impact that the testing lab has had through their efforts. So as both Justin and John already said, there's been this giant need both since back in February and March, but unfortunately through the current day for uh, adequate testing capacity and most importantly, adequate testing capacity where we get results back in a timely manner. And the reason for that are twofold. One is what's already been said about enabling us to identify patients that actually have COVID-19 to get the best care from their doctors. But the second part that's really critical is that if we can actually test people and find out who's infected with this virus and then actually uh, basically contact these people, get them to be able to safely isolate and then find the people that they might have infected through contact tracing, then that actually enables us to have this really effective public health response to COVID-19 that cuts off chains of transmission and reduces transmission in our community and saves lives. So um, the data that are on this graph here just illustrates some of the testing, the amazing amount of testing that the lab has done over the past, um, I don't even know how many months it's been now, it seems like it's been years, but it's probably just been uh, six or eight months or something. Um, but the really key part that I wanted to focus on is the fact that over this time, the lab has been able to provide about 7,000 tests for the community, as well as uh, a huge number of tests, I think about 25,000 or so, um, as well on campus. And really importantly, the testing, especially for the greater community and particularly for um, the Pajaro Valley uh, community and some of the less affluent members of the Santa Cruz, um, Santa Cruz area, have identified actually about 1,200 infected people. And by identifying these 1,200 infected people, we've been able to get them to be able to safely isolate and most importantly, find their contacts who they might have infected um, and basically have them quarantine and get tested and basically break these chains of transmission. And by doing so, by basically identifying um, more than 1,000 cases of COVID-19 in a timely manner and getting results back in just 24 hours or less most of the time, that enables really the public health apparatus to really step in and break chains of transmission, stop people from getting infected and sick, and stop people from dying. And so I just wanted to emphasize the role that, um, that the testing lab has played. Um, and finally, just to wrap up to say that unfortunately, the need for rapid testing is ongoing and now actually more important than ever. Um, thankfully, the testing lab led by Jeremy Sanford, Michael Stone, Elena Vasky, Isabel Bjork, and John McMillan are honored to be able to contribute to this global public health challenge. Thank you. Well, I'll tell you, words can't express how grateful we all are for your efforts and for helping us through one of the most difficult and challenging times of our, our generation. And so with that, I'd like to invite our council members and our community to applaud you on all your efforts and thank you so much for all the work that you're doing uh, to, to keep our community safe. You all have overcome some serious obstacles, as John was mentioning, to take a research lab and turn it into a clinical diagnostic testing lab. And so um, we will be forever grateful for all the work that you've done to help keep our community safe during this time. And um, I don't know if there's any council members who have comments that they would want to share with our last group, um, but I've, I'll invite folks if they would like to speak. Okay. Seeing none with that, uh, what I'd like to do is if uh, all of the recipients who are still here could just turn their videos on one last time um, and we can give a round of applause to all the individuals who are here with us still today. And so, thank you all. Um, we very much appreciate um, all those people in our community who um, go to the length to, you know, really make meaningful contributions and are uh, inspirational to people in our community. And so we thank you all. And um, just so people know, your keys to the city are here at City Hall. And so you can come down and um, let someone at the front desk know, and you can pick them up. And I think currently our front desk is only open until noon. Um, so just as an FYI, but we will make sure that we get those keys to all the recipients. And so thank you all again. Thank you, Mayor Cummings. Thank you so much to the mayor and to the council. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. All right. So we will move on to uh, the next item on our agenda as we uh, round out 2020. Um, this is our, as many of you know, this is the last meeting um, of the year for for uh, the city council to meet, but for some of our council members, uh, this is gonna be their last meeting. And so I would like to invite uh, council members Byers and council
Councilmember Matthews to get give exiting remarks. Uh, I just want to start by thanking you both for all of your the contributions that you made in your time on council. Um, and we'll go ahead and start with Councilmember Byers if you would like to share your outgoing remarks. Oh, and you're muted, Catherine. Well, that's kind of comical. <laughs> anyway, thank you, Mayor Cummings. Welcome new and returning members to the City Council. Congratulations. I've served on the Council for 15 years plus eight months. I thank the many members of the public who trusted me to serve so long. It was an honor and a privilege to do so. I calculated that leaving, the leaving speeches by those who served four years gave eight to 15 minute speeches. Therefore, for my eight months, I calculated that I could speak for 12 seconds. <laughs> However, hold on, I just need a few more seconds. I believe that government, especially local government, has a necessary and vital role to play in protecting and preserving our natural environment, our air, land, waters, and open spaces. And a role in protecting our social environment too. It's not enough that streets are made safe and that businesses can feed here. We require compassion to see the need to extend public services to all of our citizens, including the most vulnerable among us who don't share in our fortune. We require sensitivity and foresight to permit development of our city, but not at the expense of the quality of the lives of the people who live here or of the sense of place that our neighborhoods provide. As I leave office, let me briefly thank some folks. I'm grateful to those members of the public who took the time to engage constructively in the process of government. And those who shared an opinion with me or gave me some good advice and served on a, or maybe served on a commission. Your involvement enlivened me and challenged me to do my very best. I'm grateful to my universe of friends old and new, for your encouragement and your assistance and your trust. Your help is invaluable to me and your friendship is a vital force in my life. I'm grateful to our city staff and employees. You render valuable service to the council and to an often unappreciated public. You remain indispensable to keeping the city running and running it well. Your job has become more challenging, more complex, and more difficult in the pandemic. Every one of you, and I mean every single one of your, my, the employees at the city, are definitely my heroes. Thank you all. And finally, I want to wish my colleagues on the council well. Thank you for having the courage and the stamina to serve the public. Thank you, Mayor Cummings, and thank you, council member, and welcome to the new council members. I'll say it again. Thank you, Catherine. It's been a pleasure working with you and getting to know you. And I just want to thank you for all the years of service that you've given to our city and for coming out of political retirement to join us okay. once again on the city council this year. Thank you very much. Thanks. Okay, next up, uh, we have outgoing remarks by city council member Cynthia Matthews. And so, Cynthia, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, well, I agree with Catherine tonight really belongs to this, the new council, so I'll try and be brief. Um, looking back, I've served six terms on the city council, first elected in 92, and Catherine, we were elected at the same, <laughs> at the same election cycle, if you remember. Our, our terms do. yeah. didn't follow an exact pattern, but um, it's a long time, and just to put it in a bit of perspective, there were no cell phones, there was no social media. A lot has changed. <laughs> the way we do business has changed. But I do want to say, throughout that time, it has been such an honor to serve as a council member for the city of Santa Cruz. Um, I did not just fall into this. I had been pretty active in the community for a couple of decades, um, worked 
Planned Parenthood for a wide variety of community organizations and, and activities. But it was really the experience of community recovery from the 89 earthquake that motivated me to run for council. And specifically, the experience of serving on Vision Santa Cruz, which was the advisory group that was charged by the council with shaping a recovery plan for downtown. That was a large group, extremely diverse in the interest groups that were brought together, but they were focused on a common goal. And that common goal was to listen to one another and think creatively and come together with a recovery plan that would work for putting Santa Cruz back on its feet. Now, the, an earthquake is not exactly parallel to a COVID epidemic, but the parallels can't be missed, really. <laughs> the urgency of coming together as a community and bringing all our resources together. What that vision Santa Cruz taught me was the absolute importance of partnerships, that in order to get important things done, we have to combine our public sector, our private sector, and our nonprofit sector and harness all those, all the passions and skills and resources to really make progress. And certainly, over the period of almost 30 years that I've served on the council, the issues we face and the um, community priorities change. It may be, at one point in time, environmental protection, and then maybe uh, there's an economic collapse, and the priority is jobs, and then a community tragedy mobilizes us in a different direction. So um, there's definitely um, change over time in what the community feels is important. But I do, throughout all that, think we, as a community, we're fortunate in that I think there are very broadly held values. Um, certainly, appreciation for our environment, our beautiful environment and environmental protection, um, our commitment to social justice, our, our belief in our practice of community engagement. People get, get involved here. Um, we are collaborative by nature. Um, we are supportive of the arts and creative community, and we believe in our local businesses. Whatever the issues are, I think those are, those are pretty common threads that help us. One of the challenges of the council is you have to spend kind of often tedious or not glamorous work on really long-term projects. What will our water supply be, for example? How will we deal with transportation, climate change, et cetera? Long, long views. You have to respond to things that come up that you never thought would happen. A earthquake, a COVID, <laughs> COVID epidemic, for example. All of a sudden, pivot, shift gears, reorder. And then it's really important, I think, and particularly as a council member, to support just the pattern of community life, being there for the community celebrations and celebrating the nonprofits that do things, the schools, just what are the things that make people feel that their local government is paying attention and cares about what they do? And that's, I think, what builds community. So, um, that's, without mentioning specific projects, because that's just too vast. <laughs> um, those are just some general observations over a pretty long trajectory. Um, I do want to thank all the city workers. I have really loved working with our city staff, who are so dedicated and uh, to public service, to their work, and we absolutely depend on them. Uh, I want to thank the community that can be engaged in pretty much infinite ways. <laughs> but we are lucky for that. Um, I certainly want to thank my fellow council members for this, this council and previous councils that have overall over time worked pretty congenially together and respected one another's contributions. Um, and I especially want to thank my family and friends, my long-suffering family and friends who've been very generous <laughs> um, tolerating many meetings and so forth. So with that, I just, I, I have real confidence that the new council will bring a new set of strengths, new energy, that they are committed to working well together and um, they will help us <laughs> into a much better new year. <laughs> so I really want to thank you all. Thanks. Cynthia, and thank you so much for your dedication and, you know, the fact that you've uh, been elected, you know, in six consecutive elections, I think it really shows that our community has cared about 
the dedication that you've had for all of us over these years, and really your commitment to making our community a better place. Um, and I'd like to say, as my colleague on the council, while I know we might not always agree on policy, I would like to thank you for all that you've done um, throughout our community. Your years of service have brought tremendous benefits to our community, and I hope that your work inspires future leaders. And as mayor of the city, um, I would also like to present you with the key to the city in recognition <laughs> of your decades of work for this community. Watch out. I might use it. <laughs> <laughs> and I would also like to uh, invite, there's a few people who um, wanted to share some remarks as well, um, and uh, Vice Mayor Myers and I were able to, to help work on this together, and so I wanted to introduce the first um, person to, to speak, who is Tony Campbell. So, Tony, if you could turn your camera on. I can. Thank you. I, um, I, I know that uh, Cynthia is a... Um, serves the city, but I think we, we all out here in the hinterland of the county owe her a great deal for her years of organizing us, um, her leadership, and as a person who really cares about the library, I thank you, Cynthia, for all you've done, both of the, uh, the, uh, the uh, sales tax measures and finally Measure S. Thank you, and congratulations. Thank you, Tony. You're welcome. Next person I'd like to invite for comments is Carol Fuller. So, Carol, if you're on the line, you can turn your camera on. Oh. For some reason, Carol, we can't hear you. And, and while, while she figures that out, I have to say, Carol sneaked into my study while I was having dinner, and she and a friend put all these flowers in <laughs> Oh. Carol, we can't hear you. Maybe try calling in. I can go to someone else, and I can come back to you. How do I Maybe. call in? Oh, you got it. We can hear you. Yep. Okay, okay. All right. Um, well, I am also president of the Democratic Women's Club, which is the oldest club in the county. It's close to 60 years old. And uh, my club is going to make more remarks about Cynthia's political um, service uh, on the council because he's more equipped to having served two more years than Cynthia served, in fact. <laughs> So I'm speaking more as a, <laughs> as a friend. Uh, 39 years ago, I walked into Planned Parenthood, decided I was tired of being an armchair feminist, and wanted to do something, and I had a modest little idea. I didn't know how modest it was, actually, but I, I went in, and I said I wanted to volunteer, and I was sent upstairs to the second floor to the back of this rambling building with rolling floors and to a little tiny office where Cynthia was, and we did not know each other. And I told her my idea, and like so many of my ideas through the years, Cynthia trimmed it up a bit, shaped it up, and implemented it. And about six months later, I found myself invited to be on the Planned Parenthood board, where I had no idea what I was going to do. It was full of professional people, and I had a second-hand store. And I thought, well, I don't know what contribution I'm going to be able to make here. But Cynthia saw some possibilities, and at that time, we had a governor of California, Governor Duke Majin, who was not only hostile to abortion, he was hostile to family planning, and he tried to eliminate the funding for all the family planning clinics. And Cynthia thought that I might be bold enough to go stand on street corners and gather petitions, and then, which I did, and I proved to be pretty effective on street corners. So I kind of got, um, I did find a role for myself. I, I went on with Cynthia's support to do 13 years of kids' concerts, over a dozen years of adult concerts, including a women's co comedy night at the Columba, the offer of that Planned Parenthood benefit. And uh, so take that, Richard Stockton and Zach Friends. We had women's comedy night years, many years ago. And uh, so eventually, I, you know, I did do other things besides concerts. We had parades. We had all kinds of public affairs. We had Fourth of July events. We 
did a lot together, and I did a lot of cabling. And together, most of the sensitive leadership, we organized the Reproductive Rights Network, which has had a Roe v. Wade annual brunch going through last year for over 30 years. And the 20th anniversary of Roe v. Wade, we had Sarah Weddington, who argued the case before the Supreme Court. That's all Cynthia is doing. She kept her ear to the ground. She. She knew Sarah Weddington was going to be on the West Coast for other affiliates, and Cynthia lined her up, so we had a very nice event. So uh, when, I, when Cynthia decided to run for council, we had a very strong working relationship. In fact, Cynthia usually characterized it as our dog and pony show, and there was no doubt in anybody's mind, certainly not hers or mine, who the dancing dog was and who the hardworking pony is. Because anybody who's had any contact with Cynthia knows that she there's nobody who works like she does. She just seems to thrive on it. I don't do much after dinner. <laughs> Netflix is good enough for me. But um, anyway, she's industrious to the limit. So I then proceeded to be her, uh, her campaign coordinator for all six of her campaigns. All of the, well, I'm sure you're going to hear more about all of the city revenue measures that Cynthia basically chaired or was the impetus for and the hardworking pony for all of those things as well. And I served on all those committees, so I have a lot of political experience with Cynthia also. I admire her more than anybody I've personally ever known, and I'm really, really pleased to uh, have had a chance to be around her and see a really sharp mind work. She's just so observant, so careful, so diligent, and she has a vision, and she, she sees the long range of things. She sees how things fit, fit together. She sees how different elements in the community fit together. It's, it's, a, it's a wonderful thing to see somebody like that. And I'm really, most of all, really happy to call Cynthia a very close friend, and I'm happy for her, and maybe we'll be able to have lunch every now and then we talk about it. That never actually happens. You know, too many meetings, you know, so. so we have to settle for a lot. Fun catch-up. So, good work, Cynthia. <laughs> Thank you, Carol, for those comments. Yeah. Uh, next, I would like to invite up uh, County Supervisor Zach Friend. Mayor Cummings, uh, Vice Mayor Myers, and the entire City Council, thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. Congratulations, by the way, Catherine, on your uh, retirement again from the City Council. Uh, tonight, uh, I have some words of praise for Cynthia Matthews, and in fact, I was actually asked to read words from Senator John Laird, who provided his very first Senate proclamation. He was just sworn in today uh, for Cynthia Matthews, and so he provided me some of the language from it to read. It, it's, uh, it's as long as you would expect a John Laird proclamation to be, so I will not read the entire thing, but I will read part of it. But I will say, uh, Carol, I will absolutely pay big money to go to any sort of comedy show that you are either doing or putting on. <laughs> <laughs> Doing. Okay. So with that said, so let me read you a couple whereases here. Uh, whereas this is, there's almost no local issue or organization in the greater Santa Cruz area that has escaped Cynthia Matthews' attention during her 50-year career as a public official and community activist, including the founding and service as a board member and later an employee of Planned Parenthood in Santa Cruz County, serving on the board of the Santa Cruz Historical Society and having founded and been an active member of the Downtown Neighbors, helping create the Friends of Wilder Ranch State Park, and also serving on the boards of the Museum of Art and History and the Santa Cruz Arbor Day Committee, among other things. Uh, let me also say that, uh, this, and this is about as true as it can be, whereas no local activist or public official has escaped a phone call from Cynthia Matthews asking for support for all local successful revenue measures in the city. <laughs> or the city school board for that matter, that have been put in front of the city voters over the last four decades. Her singular efforts allowing the city and our local schools to continue to provide and even expand services despite reductions in outside support, as Tony had mentioned also for our libraries as well. And whereas Cynthia Matthews has consistently taken the revolutionary step of actually reading every city council agenda item, including all the consent agenda items, and she's further taken the step of going out and talking to all the stakeholders on every significant issue. Uh, on top of that, she's further met individually with many applicants for every city board, committee, and commission, which we know to be true. 
this is an important part. Her husband, Bill, daughter, Amy, and son, Jeremy, also deserve similar praise. Um, they've got so much <laughs> and I'll also say that it includes the fact that Cynthia and her loving husband, Bill, provided council members, but of course, never more than the Brown Act would legally allow an opportunity to decompress over a glass of wine in her living room after lively public meetings, or apparently Carol Fuller goes there regularly to drink a glass of wine, too. Um, whereas Cindy Matthews has demonstrated a half century of the highest commitment to the community and all of its residents and is retiring from the council, which means that she's just going to continue her 60-hour work week doing something else. So now, therefore, this is on behalf of John Laird, California State Senator. Again, this is his very first proclamation as State Senator. Do hereby proclaim December 8th, 2020 as Cynthia Matthews Day in the 17th Senate District and encourage all community members in Santa Cruz in the district to join him in recognizing the extraordinary contributions of oh, Cynthia Matthews for long public service. That is well-deserved, Cynthia. And just on a personal note, I know that Supervisor Coonerty is on as well, and we did a proclamation for you that he will participate in. But for over 20 years, there it is, for over 20 years, I've known uh, Council Member Matthews, and, and basically all good things leadership within this city uh, has stemmed from her work. She does so much uh, behind the scenes to really encourage a voice for those that don't have a voice, be it for funding for uh, for programs that don't receive funding, be it for uh, the construction of the library and other facilities. Uh, she's a very consistent and strong advocate uh, for what I consider to be all things good. I I've admired your work ethic, I've admired your ethics in general, and I just admired how successful you've been uh, in the 20 years that I've worked with you. And Cynthia, um, I'm sorry to see you go from the city council, but thank you for all that you've done. Um, a lot of the things that you've laid the foundation for are gonna continue to grow within the city and, and the, the community and the county is a better place for me to raise my six-year-old kid, actually, uh, as a result of your work. So thank you so much. Thank you, Mayor. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Next, uh, as Zach mentioned, we have, council, or we have County Supervisor Ryan Coonerty with us today who would like to share some remarks as well. So Ryan, if you could go ahead and turn on your video. Great. Uh, well, it's always good to follow the uh, junior supervisor from the second district. Uh, and uh, uh, I'm, uh, look, I'm here, and uh, first I wanna congratulate Catherine on her many years of service. Congratulate uh, Justin on an excellent year as mayor in the most difficult of times. Uh, and certainly welcome the new council members and returning council members. Um, I look forward to working with you to, uh, to get us through this crisis and then emerge stronger and better going forward. Um, one of the reasons we're gonna be able to do that is because of Cynthia Matthews' leadership. Um, quite simply, and I'm sure the mayor can appreciate this as a Chicago, uh, son of Chicago, uh, she, you're the Michael Jordan of Count Santa Cruz council members. You're the, the greatest of all time. Uh, in ways big and small, uh, you've served our city. Uh, I've seen you out picking up trash or weeding uh, as, as you walk home. I've seen you move major policies that impact the schools, um, the city, built infrastructure, built community spaces, um, built the kinds of services that make Santa Cruz a wonderful place to have grown up and now to raise uh, my kids uh, and hopefully their kids and it, your kids and grandkids um, in this city. Um, we've been, I feel incredibly fortunate to have served with you, uh, to have worked with you. Um, I will say if you, if you need evidence, I think uh, anytime my sister or wife have an issue uh, with downtown, often even when I was on the city council or even when I was mayor, uh, they'd call Cynthia first to solve it. Um, uh, she's just that effective and um, I'm just so grateful uh, to have had the opportunity to work with you and I, you've earned, more than earned, uh, a little downtime, a little time off, uh, but I am still cognizant I will be uh, receiving many phone calls well into the future about uh, what the county can do uh, or what I can do to make life better in the city of Santa Cruz because your commitment runs that deep. Congratulations, Cynthia. Thank you. <laughs> We have one uh, last uh, outside council member who wanted to say a few words, and so I'd like to invite uh, former Mayor Mike Rotkin to join us this evening. So, Mike, if you could turn your video camera on. Hey. 
uh, start video. Now it says it can't start the video, so um, try now. There we go. There we go. Thank you, Justin Cummings, Mayor Justin Cummings, for uh, in, in allowing me to make some uh, remarks. Uh, I, I'm first of all, I want to uh, congratulate. Uh, Catherine on her service during this uh, recent period and recognized you know, that she was willing to step up. It's not always easy after being off the council for a while to get back into it again. I do appreciate our service to the community. I want to congratulate all of the uh, winners in the last election, the two incumbents, Sandy Brown um, and Martine Watkins, and certainly the two new council members that have been elected, um, uh, Shepard Colin Terry Johnson and uh, Sonia Bruner. Um, you, you've got some work cut out for you. And I'm going to take a, my moments here not to uh, list all the wonderful things that Cynthia Matthews accomplished. There's not enough time to do that, quite literally. I mean, you, you couldn't even do the highlights, really, um, in the time that we have. What I want to do is talk about how Cynthia, my, from my perception, how Cynthia Matthews was able to accomplish the things that she did. And so this is kind of advice to new council members. Um, and uh, I'm not implying that all other council members didn't do several or many of these different kinds of things, but I think Cynthia is the only one, uh, myself included, who did all of these kinds of things that I'm going to mention pretty quickly here. First, she understands the systems that make the city work. She meets regularly with department heads and other city employees to ask questions about council agenda items and other issues. She has a realistic acceptance of the limits imposed by personnel, time, and budget constraints. She does her council preparation, including reading staff reports and letters from the public before the meetings, not during the meeting. Cynthia understands how the city interfaces with county, state, and federal governments, the school district, nonprofits, other public agencies. She looks outside the city where priorities overlap with other entities, nonprofits, private interests. She develops partnerships, and that's been a real key, I think, to her success in moving particular projects. Like a good chess player, she looks ahead, and she's usually looking five or ten steps ahead. I think most of us are playing ch uh, checkers while she's playing chess, and I think that's why she's been as effective as she has, because she's not just sort of wandering into things, but actually planning where she'd like things to go. She follows up on things. Once, you know, a lot of times you sort of get the work done and then you kind of, well, let it go. It's going to take care of itself. And she never does that. She follows up, making sure that the things she's worked on are going to actually get accomplished. And then finally, Cynthia Matthews has a tremendous work ethic. She's detail oriented. I'm going to give you one really concrete example here. The council, when people apply to be on commissions and boards, the council hears usually three minutes from each of them, and we get a brief, maybe a page long uh, application telling them why they want to be on a commission. Cynthia not only goes out and interviews the applicants for these positions, she goes out and interviews the people they work with to find out whether they're ready for public service and how they're going to interact with other people on a board. I mean, that, that's, that's so extraordinary. And so, you know, a lot of times you want to appoint people you know or you like what they wrote about themselves in a page. But when Cynthia Matthews made suggestions to me about who might be the best person to serve on a board or a commission, I understood I really need to pay attention to what she's suggesting because she had done that homework uh, and follow up on it and stuff. So we really knew what we were getting when that kind of stuff happened. Um, she, she often encouraged people to apply to boards and commissions. I mean, sure, we had people who were the best qualified people serving our city because we have a very active and engaged citizen to make that happen. So I want to suggest that uh, new council members could do worse than to kind of follow the example of Cynthia Matthews. Uh, it, it, most members of the public, I think, believe that it's all the council meetings. It's what you say to other people in the meeting. It's the speeches you give and so forth. And of course, that's an important part of the work, the votes that you, that you uh, give. But it's really the work behind the scenes to get prepared for a meeting, to understand the sort of unintended consequences of your actions, to have met with all the stakeholders, to meet with the people that you disagree with and ask, you know, what are their concerns about an issue? And then maybe you can shape what you're doing in a way that makes it, maybe they still don't agree with you, but they maybe feel that you've made some attempt to work their concerns into your final outcome. So that's a bit of advice to new council members, and I can't do better than to suggest you follow that model that Cynthia Matthews, that I learned so much from in the years that I worked with her on the, on the council. And uh, 
I'm going to hope that she runs again in two years. If she wants the absolute record, she has to do that because um, I, I served an additional eight months on my first term because they moved the election from the spring to the fall, and I got a five-year term on my second term because they moved it from odd to even number. The citizens moved it from odd to even number in November. So she's, she, we, we share the number of terms and the number of times being mayor, but if she really wants to have it all to herself, she's got to come back in two years and run again. I'll leave it at that. Thank you so much for your service, Cynthia. And I really uh, want to, again, appreciate all the new council members. And I really look forward to being able to support the new council and hope, hope that you're going to, I, I believe you will, provide our city with the leadership we need to get out of the mess that we're in right now, which was mostly not of our own making. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mike. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Finally, I'd like to allow um, an opportunity for uh, our council members to share any remarks with our outgoing council members. Uh, Vice Mayor Myers. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Catherine, um, even though it's been a short period that we've uh, been on council together, um, I just have huge respect for you. Um, I learned a lot um, from you just uh, in the way that you uh, ask questions of the staff that you really have a commitment to really understanding people's um, concerns uh, about, uh, you know, what the, the, the impacts on our community will be about various proposals. So um, I just, uh, you know, respect um, your comments that I was able to hear over the last eight months. And I wish you well, and uh, I will see you out running on West Coast, I'm sure, um, as soon as we can all get back to our normal lives. So thank you for, um, for uh, you know, sharing, sharing this experience with you. Um, not, not something expected, but um, very much appreciated and, and enjoyed your, your company and your time uh, sharing uh, as a council member. So thanks. Thank and you, Donna. Yeah, thank, um, you. thank you, Catherine. Cynthia, I'm going to uh, use my few minutes to um, to actually read a um, uh, in your honor a uh, congressional record um, that has been uh, put into the congressional record today from Congressman uh, Jimmy Panetta. So this uh, was recorded today, December 8, 2020, into the congressional record of the United States of America the proceedings and debates of the 116th Congress and the second session. This is, a, this is entitled House of Representatives Honoring Council Member Cynthia Matthews, December 8, 2020. Madam Speaker, I rise today to honor Cynthia Matthews, the retiring city council member and former mayor of the city of Santa Cruz, California, for her commitment to serving the people of the Central Coast of California. It is my honor to recognize her as she finishes her final term serving the city of Santa Cruz as the longest serving member of the city council, which apparently Mike uh, did, did beat you on that. Her service of 24 years has benefited countless residents of the city of Santa Cruz as an, and is an achievement that few elected officials experience. Council member Matthews' mark can be seen in the city of Santa Cruz's protection of its historic buildings and architectural importance the recovery of the downtown after the Loma Prieta earthquake, and protection of the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary. She has been a leader of the uh, she has been a leader on the Santa Cruz Democratic Central Committee, and led efforts to pass revenue measures supporting Santa Cruz City Schools, the Santa Cruz Public Library System, and City of Santa Cruz Parks and Recreation programs. The community of Santa Cruz has been well served by her dedication to neighborhoods, economic development, housing, social equity and social services, and public safety. Public service is a demanding commitment and she has served with grace, intelligence, and determination. Her service will certainly inspire future leaders on the Central Coast. As she begins her retirement, I have no doubt that Cynthia will continue to serve her community. We on the Central Coast are grateful for her contributions to our community and celebrate her successful career. And this again is on behalf of Congressman, the Honorable Congressman Jimmy Panetta. So, and I will just add, um, it's been a pleasure. Uh, again, you've been, a, a, I've learned a lot from you. Um, and um, I won't spend a lot of time, um, you know, kind of running through the list, but um, all of us benefit from learning from each other. 
and um, and I think that that's uh, something for the incoming council members to remember is that we all do better by helping each other do this job. It's an incredibly difficult job. I know you've had your your, your fun times and you're not so fun times. So uh, appreciate your dedication to our community and uh, hope you enjoy time in your garden and with Bill. Thanks. Councilmember Brown. Here we are. It's uh, this is a uh, uh, you know. It's uh, I think Cynthia in your uh, email to the, the city, but it's a bittersweet day, and I I recognize that um, for somebody who with your uh, you know tremendous uh, work ethic and commitment to our city and our community, um, all of the time that you served, I can imagine um, that it's it's hard to. Say goodbye. I was listening and thinking, oh, this is the last, uh, you know, mo motion to approve the consent agenda, <laughs> and the last, you know, and I was just thinking, you know, that you really will be missed um, here um, on the council, and um, you know, hope that you uh, um, have uh, get get to do some relaxation. I know it's probably hard with the work ethic that you have, and your, um, you know, it's been mentioned um, that'll be hard to uh, slow down. But I hope you get to a little bit and um, have uh, some fun with your family and with your friends. And uh, Catherine, I um, am so uh, grateful to have gotten a chance to actually serve with you for these, this short time. You know, I've um, worked with you uh, as a member of the community uh, during your past terms and just so impressed with your commitment to, um, you know, sustainability, you know, the environment and, you know, social justice in our uh, community. And... Um, you know, I, I just, um, and really your commitment to, you know, open government and transparency and really make, you know, get including the public um, in decision making, providing information uh, to our community about what's happening uh, in the city. It can sometimes seem pretty opaque and you uh, really fight to, to make it um, legible for people. And I, that's just a, a model that, you know, I, I try to, um, to follow and, and I appreciate your your mentorship and um i'll miss you too um but hopefully we'll um we'll get to sit on your porch and talk about politics and um i'm glad you're going to get back to um well may, you know i know you've been running anyway you've maintained your uh your regular schedule <laughs> stay running yeah. um but hopefully i'll give you more time to, to be relaxed about it and and keep going thank you sandy thank you no further questions from council members before we go and before we um, say our final farewells to our outgoing council members I know that um, Cynthia's family had a photo that they wanted to present and so I'll turn that over to uh, our county clerk this <laughs> just gets more embarrassing all the time <laughs> I don't know Councilmember Golder has a, a, a something to say, but uh, again, Cynthia, thank you for all your hard work and your dedication to our community. Uh, Councilmember Byers, it's been a pleasure working with you. It's been a pleasure working with both of you, and um, we look forward to you know continuing to work with you all over the next few years and in your roles when you're off council. Yeah. Uh, Councilmember Golder, looks like you had something you wanted to say. I wasn't going to speak, but then my sister is actually here, right here with me, and we've been watching, and then we, uh, we just, I just have to say, like, both of you are such an inspiration, and you've done so much work that we've benefited from over the decades, and our kids and grandkids and everyone's going to benefit from, and so we really appreciate both of the work that both of you have put into the community over the years. And my sister, she was like, she, 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 she loves Carol Fuller, and she said, Cynthia is not a pony, she's a unicorn. And that is so true, so she's a unicorn. So thank you guys, and um, congrats, and we'll keep uh, keep looking to you towards men for mentorship moving forward. I feel like we're like kids being like left home alone in the council meeting now. Oh, yeah. You're old enough, you can do it. <laughs> okay, well with that, um, Councilmember Matthews and Councilmember Byers, thank you both for all of your years of service. And thank you, Justin. Thank you. Should we now um, close out our picture and 
What's the yeah, protocol? I think you all can stay on, but maybe um, turn off your videos. Actually, you know what? I think it's fine if you stay on for now. Cynthia, I don't know why, but your video disappeared. It's black now, so. But, oh, there you go. And now you're muted. I think that's fine. Um, okay. So at this, this moment, I will go ahead. Um, the next item is outgoing remarks by um, yeah. Eric Cummings. And so I'll go ahead and um, to the, go move on to the next portion of our ceremonial evening. Uh, but before I begin, I would like to take a moment to thank all the candidates who ran for city council this year and to congratulate Sandy Brown, Martine Watkins, Shebra Kalantari Johnson and Sonia Bruner on their well-earned victories uh, to uh, for Councilmember Watkins and Brown stay on the City Council and for uh, uh, incoming Council Members Kalantari Johnson and Bruner on their um, their victories to join the Council. I look forward to working with um, all my colleagues coming forward, and it was a pleasure to work with the colleagues that I've been able to work with over the past two years. With 2020 coming to an end. It is important that we reflect on our challenges and achievements, that we look back on where we were at this time last year and where we are today. At the end of 2019, our community was bitterly divided as we entered a year with a recall election. These tensions were felt on our council, in the city, and in our community, and it was a false reflection of who we are as a community. And it was clear that after the recall election, we were going to need to do some serious work to help our community heal. When it was apparent that COVID-19 was a serious threat to our community, it became clear that our leadership would be more important now than ever before. As mayor of Santa Cruz, my number one priority was working to protect our community. Regardless of what someone may have said in the past or their position on the recall or Measure M or any other controversial issue, none of that mattered because in order to ensure the safety of our community, it was clear that we would all need to work together and that the pandemic was going to be just the beginning. Our city staff, local, county, state, and federal elected put the protection of our citizens as the top priority when the pandemic hit. We worked to get accurate, credible information to our community to help slow the spread of COVID-19. We worked to secure resources and distribute resources to families and businesses to help them cope with the impacts of COVID-19. We encourage our community to follow the health guidelines outlined by our county health director, the CDC, and medical professionals. And we work to try to deter people from coming into our community. Our community made sacrifices to ensure the overall safety of our residents, and this response to help to keep our numbers low for the greater part of the year and save lives. When George Floyd was murdered by Officer Derek Chauvin in Minneapolis, we came together as a community and worked to ensure that our citizens would be able to safely express themselves. We supported actions and peaceful protests. We held Zoom meetings with the community to hear their concerns and engaged in difficult conversations with the black community and our police officers to understand what changes we can make to help build more trust between our communities of color and our police department. We united as a community to publicly paint the statement Black Lives Matter outside of City Hall as a reminder to our council, city, and our community that if we value the lives of all people, then we need to acknowledge and improve the way black people are treated in our country and work towards a truly inclusive and equitable community. And through collaboration, we came together to bring forward changes to police policy that we hope will have positive impacts on our community as a whole. When Stephen Carrillo was ambushed, but when, when Stephen Carrillo ambushed our county sheriffs, our law enforcement officers were there to provide support and help apprehend Stephen Carrillo. And our community came together to honor the life and sacrifice of Sergeant Damon Gutzweiler. We were reminded about the sacrifice our law enforcement officers make on a daily basis to protect our community and the importance of having public safety officers in our community. Then in August, when we thought things couldn't get any worse, the CZU fire complex burned its way down the, the coast, threatening everything in its path, and again, we rose to the occasion. 
We came together with the rest of the county to support those whose lives were devastated by the destruction of the CZU fire. 2020 truly tested the resiliency and integrity of our community, and we demonstrated our compassion, our humility, our respect for science, and our desire to create a better community for everyone. One of the most important lessons we should take away from 2020 is that when we put aside our minor differences, we often find that we have more in common and more shared values. We must take more time to listen to one another and not be quick to judge. We must be open to having difficult conversations without the fear of persecution, and we must work to find compromise. We're not gonna agree on everything all the time, and it is these times when we disagree that we need to create the space to hear one another, find ways to compromise, or be willing to respectfully disagree. After four years of extremely divisive politics at our national level, we must be the change that we want to see, and we must lead by example so that our children and the next generation know what true leadership looks like. We have set a positive tone for our community, and it is my hope that we can continue that positive tone moving forward into the future. As outgoing mayor of Santa Cruz, I would like to thank our city staff, our city manager, our city attorney's office, and department heads for their leadership, hard work, and dedication to the city during this entire difficult year. I would like to thank Supervisor Ryan Coonerty and our Board of Supervisors, Assemblymember Mark Stone, Senator Bill Monning, Congressman Jimmy Panetta, and Senator Anna Shu for their support and leadership during this entire year. And finally, I would like to thank Council Members Catherine Byers, Renee Golder, Martine Watkins, Sandy Brown, Cynthia Matthews, and Vice Mayor Donna Myers for their hard work and dedication to serving this community. But most of all, I would like to thank the Santa Cruz community. As someone who's lived all over the world, there's nowhere quite like Santa Cruz. Sure, we have great surf and beautiful mountains, but it is the people of Santa Cruz that makes this place so unique and so special. I'm so very proud of what this community has done to come together during an extreme time of crisis, and I'm proud and fortunate to have served as your mayor during these difficult times during 2020. And I hope that it doesn't take a crisis for us to find ways to work past our differences towards our common shared goals of having a safe, vibrant, inclusive community that values diversity and works towards increasing equity throughout our community moving forward. Um, and then finally, I would just like to thank my family and friends for all their support over the course of this year. Um, it has been challenging and it has been difficult, but without the support that our community has been able to show to come together, um, I don't think we would have been able to do this. And so, um, as outgoing mayor, thank you all for this wonderful opportunity, and I look forward to continuing to serve the city of Santa Cruz as a city council member in the next two years moving forward. agenda is the installation and remarks by incoming council members. And so at this moment, I would like to ask um, that uh, everyone turn off their um, videos and their microphones, and I'll turn it over to uh, the city clerk. And so we'll just have each incoming council member turn their video on with the city clerk to be sworn in, and then we'll follow that by uh, remarks by the incoming council members. Thank you, Mayor. We'll start um, with Councilmember Watkins. Hi. Hi. Okay, go ahead and raise your right hand, Martine. Aye. Martine Watkins. Aye, Martine Watkins. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will support and defend. That I will support and defend. The Constitution of the United States. The Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of California. And the Constitution of the State of California. Against all enemies. Against all enemies. Foreign and domestic. Foreign and domestic. That I will bear true faith. That I will bear true faith. And allegiance. And allegiance to the Constitution of the United States. 
to the Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of California? And the Constitution of the State of California. That I take this obligation freely? That I take this obligation freely. Without any mental reservation? Without any mental reservation. Or a, purpo or a purpose of evasion? Or a purpose of evasion. And that I will well and faithfully. And that I will well and faithfully. Discharge the duties. Discharge the duties. Upon which I am about to enter. Upon which I am about to enter. Congratulations. Thank you, Bonnie. <laughs> And then Councilmember Brown. Hi. Hi. Hi, state your name. I, Sandy Brown. Do you solemnly swear? Do you solemnly, solemnly swear? That I will support and defend. That I will support and defend. The, the Constitution of the United States. The Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of California. And the Constitution of the State of California. Against all enemies. Against all enemies. Foreign and domestic. Foreign and domestic. That I will bear true faith and allegiance. That I will bear true faith and allegiance to the Constitution of the United States. To the Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of California. And the Constitution of the State of California. That I take this obligation freely. That I take this obligation freely. Without any mental reservation. Without any mental reservation. Or a purpose of evasion. Or a purpose of evasion. And that I will well and faithfully. And that I will well and faithfully. Discharge the duties. Discharge the duties. Upon which I'm about to enter. Upon, upon which I am about to enter. Great, congratulations. Thank you. Councilmember-elect Bruner. Hi. Hi. Okay. Uh, raise your right hand, please. I feel like I should stand up. <laughs> you, you may. <laughs> it feels like a stand-up moment. So, okay, here I go. It, it, us it usually is in normal times. <laughs> I state your name. I, Sonia Brunner, do solemnly affirm, do solemnly affirm, that I will support and defend, that I will support and defend, the Constitution of the United States, the Constitution of the United States, and the Constitution of the State of California, and the Constitution of the State of California, against all enemies, against all enemies, Foreign and domestic. Foreign and domestic. That I will bear true faith and allegiance. That I will bear true faith and allegiance. To the Constitution of the, of the United States. To the Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of California. And the Constitution of the State of California. That I take this obligation freely that I take this obligation freely without any mental reservation. Without any mental reservation. Or purpose of evasion. Or purpose of evasion. And that I will well and faithfully. And that I will well and faithfully discharge the duties. Discharge the duties. Upon which I'm about to enter. Upon which I'm about to enter. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> and Councilmember.
member Kalantari Johnson. Uh, hi, I'm here, but I can't start my video. How about that? There you go. Great. Great. Go ahead and raise your right hand. I state your name. I, Shepard Kalantari Johnson. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will support and defend. That I will support and defend. The Constitution of the United States. The Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of California. And the Constitution of the State of California. Against all enemies. Against all enemies. Foreign and domestic. Foreign and domestic. That I will bear true faith and allegiance. That I will bear true faith and allegiance. To the Constitution of the United States. To the Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of California. And the Constitution of the State of California. That I take this obligation freely. That I take this obligation freely. Without any mental reservation. Without any mental reservation. And that I will well and faithfully. That I will well and faithfully. Discharge the duties. Discharge the duties. Upon which I'm about to enter. Upon which I'm about to enter. Congratulations. Thank you so much, Bonnie. Welcome. All right, if the new council members could all turn their cameras back on now. And including uh, the, the remaining council members who are moving into 2021. and by 
desires in a few leadership traits uh, that I've built that you demonstrated. Um, I've seen that you've been willing to compromise without compromising your values. You've disagreed and you've debated, but you've done so with respect and integrity. And I share this because diverse perspectives are truly vital to a healthy democracy, and how we work together really impacts our ability to address the pressing needs we face. And as leaders, we set the tone for our community, and I think similar to what uh, Mayor Cummings shared, I would be remiss if I did not acknowledge the degree of which division occurred in our community and overall the national administration's really culture of blame and tribalism and the impact that's had at the local level. I am so optimistic to enter my second term. We as a nation and as a city, with the interest in aspiring to unify our divisiveness with decency and resolve. I also wanted to take a moment before I, I shared a few more comments just to acknowledge that we had eight female candidates who campaigned also this time, and I want to appreciate them for offering their solutions to a lot of complex social and environmental issues impacting our community, and I really believe that diverse perspectives broaden our culture narrative. And over the past four years, I'm really proud to have advanced policy to support youth and to help and to embed health equity and sustainability within our city government. And some of my past accomplishments that I'm most proud of really include you know, creating a dedicated children's fund for our city to support early childhood development and vulnerable youth and prevention. And that amount of money continues to grow and it's being used right now because it's so nimble uh, to support our essential workers with childcare and subsidizing childcare. And I'm really also so proud to um, want to say that I will advocate obviously on a regular basis to integrate childcare in our economic recovery plan because ultimately my vision is that we see childcare as essential infrastructure and that no matter what a child's socioeconomic status is, they can access our parks and rec programs. I'm so proud to have worked on the Health and All Policies Initiative with my colleagues and with this community and how we're moving forward with prioritizing health, equity, and sustainability in our decision making. And really what that looks like is a couple of, of examples of that are like our city cannabis policy, which is now embedding equity into factors of how we assess licensing and really trying to uplift minority populations who've been disproportionately impacted by the criminalization of cannabis and also supporting our women business owners. Um, these are the types of policies that really make a difference. We championed as a city our uh, tobacco flavor stand and we're uh, also including limiting menthol tobacco and that led to other jurisdictions following suit, and, um, and then I just want the community to know that I will continue to use health, equity, and sustainability as we think about moving forward with recovery. As uh, Mayor Cummings mentioned, our community issues are complex and they're interconnected, and no matter what, collaboration is essential. Ultimately, the best policies, and I've seen over these past four years, evidenced by the work of the Housing Blueprint Subcommittee, uh, the community outreach process of the Health and All Policies Initiative, and most recently, the policy changes related to uh, racial equity and social justice. They require community input, and they require us to seek input from populations that may not trust us who aren't able to join our meetings. The youth that we heard earlier today are citizens who may not be fluent in English. And ultimately, I believe that the best policies yield multiple benefits. They will create good jobs while valuing quality of life. They will strengthen our city and they will improve the health outcomes. And the most important issue for me is how we're applying a climate lens for re recovery. And at this moment, our community and our future generations are depending on our ability to work together to produce lasting solutions for the most sustainable and resilient Santa Cruz as possible. And I'm committed to working with each and every one of my colleagues on behalf of our shared constituents. And regardless, whatever the big issue is that we might be tackling, know that when we focus on our shared values and we start from that place, we will position our city for future success. While I wish I was with you all in person and could feel the energy of what I know these momentous events feel like, I'm really grateful to be connected to you virtually, and I want to thank you so much for your time this evening, and congratulations to everyone again.
And next up, we have Council Member Brown. Hi, thank you. Um, it's great to be here. It's great to see new faces uh, as we um, bid adieu to uh, two of our um, long, long, long standing council members. Um, and, you know, I'm looking forward to the coming year. I um, I don't have a whole lot to say. You'll be hearing enough from me over the next four years. But, um, you know, I just want to be real quick and say thank, um, you know, thank my campaign team, thank our community. Um, you know, I just am constantly amazed at the generosity and collaborative spirit um, and, you know, energy, create, creative creativity that I see here in our community. And um, and I'm, I'm really pleased to be able to serve again. And I want to thank the voters as well for, um, for uh, re-electing me. Uh, I ran for office and I've served, um, as I hope we all do, um, with a commitment to, um, you know, working in the public interest. And as a labor and community organizer, um, an activist, as a, as a teacher, and as a city council member over these past four years, I also recognize that some publics are privileged, um, all too often privileged over others. And um, and so I've worked really hard and I will continue to work to bring those underrepresented voices to uh, city, the city, um, to City Hall and our decision-making processes to, um, you know, to really uh, engage the community on issues of concern to them, uh, to all of us. Um, and, you know, I, I, I think of the, the phrase, I, I, I can't remember who, where it originally came from, but, you know, the measure of a society and in our case, a community is, uh, is how it treats its most vulnerable uh, members. And I take that very seriously. I want uh, people to see. I want people to feel like their government is listening to them, and I want uh, people to feel heard. And I remain committed to that. I will. Um, I'm here. I welcome hearing from folks um, about your issues, and um, I look forward to uh, working with my um, colleagues, old and new. Um, congratulations to you all, and uh, here's to. Uh, productive uh, and uh, hopefully more uh, positive uh, 2021. Okay, thank you. Uh, next up is Council Member Bruner. Thank you for coming. Good evening and happy Tuesday, everybody. My name is Sonia Brenner, and I'm so very happy to be here right now. My diverse upbringing and life experiences, my decades of work in downtown and with the Downtown Association of Santa Cruz, my time served on the Housing Authority Board of Commissioners, along with numerous other boards and committees, have prepared me to define priorities collaborate with teams and with staff, prepare data to communicate with a diverse group of people, and to make sound decisions for the betterment of community. All of this has led me to this very moment here right now. Recently, I was talking to a group of fifth grade students about getting involved in their communities. And I'm so grateful for all the people that I've met through simply being engaged as a community member. I've grown with Santa Cruz, its beautiful mountains, its treasured ocean, the art, music, and the people. After 28 years here in Santa Cruz, I can truly say that it's the community and the people that really make this place my place I call home, our place that we call home. And that's why I'm inspired to serve it. Now I get the privilege of representing the same people and I have the honor of doing my part to make sure that Santa Cruz remains the amazing place that it is for years to come. I was elected because I had many of you working with me along the way and will continue to need your help going forward. This is our city and most importantly our home and so much can be accomplished when we work together. Thank you for giving me the privilege to serve as your council member. I'm really honored to have this opportunity and honored to serve with this great team sitting here before us. 
Thank you, Mayor Cummings, for your year of service. What an incredible year. I'd also like to take this opportunity to publicly acknowledge a few very important people. A big thank you to Shiri for offering yourself as my awesome team manager every step of the way, and to the committee, Simone, Meredith, and Danielle. We did this together. Thank you to all the mentors and current and past council members that were there for me with all my answers and questions. Thank you to all the volunteers who walked and even roller skated neighborhoods with me to hang door hangers and believed in my mission. And most of all, thank you to my son, Miguel, for being my rock through this process. You are my love and the reason why. Thank you to the community for electing me to represent you and Santa Cruz with love and respect. All right, and last but not least, Council Member Colin Tari Johnson. Well, good evening, everyone. It is with great honor and gratitude that I accept this role as the first Iranian American city councilwoman for the city of Santa Cruz. I would like to thank my husband, Brian Johnson, my sons, Daryush and Cheyenne Johnson, uh, my parents and my sister, all my family all over the world. We're spread out everywhere. Um, my campaign team, my friends, my colleagues, all of you for your guidance and for your support. And to the voters of Santa Cruz, thank you for your support and for entrusting me with this role. I'd also like to thank each of the current city council members, including outgoing councilwomen Byers and Matthews, for all your work and dedication to our city over the many, many, many years that you've served. Congratulations to Councilwomen Martina Watkins, Sandy Brown, and Sonia Brunner. I'm looking forward to working with each of you and with you, Mayor Cummings and Vice Mayor Myers. And to the city staff, thank you for the incredible work that you do every day and that you've put into maintaining the functions of our city, especially during these last difficult nine months. These challenging months have forced us to pause and reflect and acknowledge what's working and what's missing, both locally and at the larger state and national levels. I am personally invigorated by how much I've learned over the last year, gaining deeper insight about the nuances of our community's culture and the varying perspectives that lend it texture, gaining a more in-depth understanding of our strengths and challenges, meeting incredibly smart, committed people who care deeply about the well-being of our community, and witnessing that we can and will transcend polarization and unite as a community as we have these last months in response to COVID, the fires, and the uprising against racial injustice. These experiences, along with my commitment to equity, dignity, and compassion for all, will guide me as I embark on this new path to serve our community. As we go into this new year and the next several years, we will use our experiences and our ability to pivot, the word of 2020, to move forward with the projects that are in the pipeline, seize new opportunities, and confront the issues that lie ahead of us. In particular, I wanna focus on several pressing issues. Like many of you have said, the first urgent issue is public health and safety. It is and will be essential as we navigate this evolving pandemic. We'll need to continue to work together and work with our county partners to address health disparities and reach community well-being. The second is building economic vitality and addressing our city budget deficit. Our small businesses are the heart of our city, and without them, our workers are displaced. I commit to listening to the needs of local businesses, displaced workers, and our nonprofits. Together, we can look for innovative solutions and seek outside resources to lessen the impacts on our community. And housing will be a crucial focus for our community as well. Our teachers, our social workers, seniors and young adults, my friends, your friends, colleagues and neighbors, they're leaving the city and many are left unhoused. I'm confident that we can focus on housing solutions that are thoughtful and integrate conscious growth and environmental stewardship. These are just some of the issues that I work on during my time on council. 
and to navigate the difficult decisions that lie ahead, I will really use the lens of equity, health, and sustainability, the three pillars of the health and all policies that our city adopted last year. As your councilwoman, I commit to leading with the same values that led my parents to leave post-revolution Iran in the 1980s and embark on a new, challenging, invigorating life in the States, that of resilience and a belief in an equitable society. I commit to leading with a pragmatic mind and a compassionate heart. And I know that no one person, entity, or city can do it alone. Now, Iranians really love poetry, so I'd like to close by quoting a 14th century Persian poet whose name is Hafez. He says, what we speak becomes the house we live in. Now, if that's true, then I will speak this. It will take all of us. And I invite each of you, those who voted for me and those who didn't, to join me in listening to one another and working together to find solutions that bring about the positive change that we all see for our community. Thank you so much for this opportunity to serve our wonderful city. Well, again, thank you all and welcome to the Santa Cruz City Council for our new members and welcome back to Council Member Brown and Council Member Watkins. Uh, the next item on our agenda is the election and swearing in of new mayor and vice mayor for the year 2021. And so with that, I'll turn it over to Bonnie Bush. Um, I think if I remember correctly, Bonnie, do we do these uh, each separately where we need a nomination and second by council members? We'll then start with the mayor, vote on the mayor and then the vice mayor. Is that the correct order? Okay. Okay. So at this moment in time, um, we'll need a nomination of someone to become the next mayor of the city of Santa Cruz. Councilmember Watkins. I will happily nominate Donna Myers to be the next mayor of the city of Santa Cruz. Okay. So we have a motion by Councilmember uh, Watkins. Councilmember Golder. Councilmember Golder. Sorry, um, uh, sorry, I couldn't hear. Okay, so we have a motion by Council Member Watkins, seconded by Council Member Golder to uh, appoint <coughs> Vice Mayor Myers as Mayor of the City of Santa Cruz for 2021. Um, so I think what we'll do is we'll go ahead and take the roll call vote on the mayor, and then we'll circle back and we'll nominate the Vice Mayor. So with that, I'll turn it over to the clerk to call the roll call vote. Um. Thank you, Madam. It's going to take getting me to have Chinua Palma. Chinua Palma, Council Member Golda. Council Member Golda. I. Oh, I'm first. Council Member. Council Member Brown. I. Council Member Watkins. I. Council Member Bruner. I. Council Member Kalantari Johnson. Aye. Vice Mayor Myers? Aye. And Mayor Cummings? Aye. And so that passes unanimously. Congratulations, uh, incoming Mayor Donna Myers. <laughs> and with that, um, I'll look to the council uh, for a motion for a nomination for Vice Mayor of the City of Santa Cruz for the year 2021. Council Member Brown. I will nominate uh, Councilmember Sonia Brunner to be Vice Mayor. Okay, we have a motion by Councilmember Brown, Councilmember Golder. I second that. <laughs> so we have a motion uh, by Councilmember Brown, seconded by Councilmember Golder for Sonia Brunner to be sworn in as a Vice Mayor of the City of Santa Cruz for the year 2021. With that, I'll turn it over to the County Clerk, or the City Clerk, to call the roll call vote. Councilmember Boulder? Aye. Councilmember Brown? Aye. Councilmember Watkins? Aye. Councilmember Calantari Johnson? Aye. Councilmember Cummings? Aye. And Councilmember Brunner? 
Aye. You can vote for yourself. And Mayor Myers. Aye. Congratulations, uh, Sonia, on becoming the new Vice Mayor of City Santa Cruz. Congratulations, uh, Donna Myers, on becoming the new Mayor of Santa Cruz. And um, before the um, Vice Mayor and Mayor get sworn in um, and we go on to the remarks by the incoming Mayor and Vice Mayor, I just wanted to thank um, the incoming Mayor, uh, Donna Myers, for her support during this year as being the Vice Mayor of Santa Cruz. Um, we, very early into the year when um, it became apparent that COVID was going to be an issue in our community, we worked extremely closely on trying to connect with members of our community and really trying to get resources to our community and hear what needs were out there. I think for uh, at least a month, if not maybe close to two, we were on the phone almost daily uh, along with uh, Supervisor Coonerty, really trying to understand what were going to be the next steps, how can we get information out to the community, and how we could really support uh, each other during uh, the pandemic. We met countless times with uh, Congressman Panetta. Uh, we met with Congressman with Assemblymember Stone. We uh, went on many um, field trips um, trying to address our needs around homelessness in the community. Uh, and we were able to serve on a number of different subcommittees and uh, the Homeless 2x2 Committee, for example. And um, although we have different perspectives, we were able to you know, work together constructively to try to bring about um, changes in our community and to really try to support our community during this extremely difficult time. And so I just want to thank you for your support this year uh, as Vice Mayor, and I really look forward to working with you moving forward, and I know that you will be doing um, great things for us um, coming into your role as Mayor of the City of Santa Cruz. And with that, I will be passing on the gavel, and um, we'll ask the clerk to please, um, well, I'd like to ask all the council members to please turn their videos off and while our incoming vice mayor and mayor get sworn in, and then as they give their incoming remarks. And I think it would be, the remarks are by the mayor and then the vice mayor, but I'm not sure how that. Yeah, and I actually don't have to swear in Sonia because I, I just did. Okay. So, so we could do Donna's swearing in and then move into Donna's remarks and then Sonia. Okay, sounds great. Good luck. Thank you. <laughs> you left the instruction book, right? <laughs> Go ahead and raise your right hand, Bob. I state your name. I, Donna Myers. Do you solemnly swear? Do you solemnly swear? That I will support and defend. That I will support and defend. The Constitution of the, of the United States. The Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of California. And the Constitution of the State of California. Against all enemies. Against all enemies. Foreign and domestic. Foreign and domestic. That I will bear true faith and allegiance. That I will bear true faith and allegiance. To the Constitution of the United States. To the Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of California. And the Constitution of the State of California. That I take this obligation freely. That I take this obligation freely. Without any mental reservation. Without any mental reservation. Or purpose of evasion. Or purpose of evasion. And that I will well and faithfully. And that I will well and faithfully. Discharge the duties. Discharge the duties. Upon which I'm about to enter. Upon which I'm about to enter. Great. Congratulations. Thanks, Bonnie. You're welcome. Well, I've lost, uh, I've lost my... Uh, I'm so used to having Justin cue everything up. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'll dive right in. Um, I just, uh, yeah, I have a few remarks and, um, and then I'm thrilled to um, 
uh, get our new vice mayor uh, sworn in and, and uh, also up to, uh, to talk to our community. Um, I want to say thanks to my colleagues on the city council for your vote tonight for me to serve as mayor through 2021. I appreciate your trust in me to continue to guide and support our recovery and more importantly to begin the steps to reimagine a more equitable future for Santa Cruz. I feel honored to be working with such a great team of fellow council members, all of whom have stepped up and chosen to serve during one of the most turbulent times in our country and during a time when COVID continues to threaten more lives, disrupt and destabilize families, threaten economic security for thousands and have lasting effects that are as yet unknown. Additionally, this summer's wildfires have devastated the lives of thousands, threatened vital city infrastructure, and is the natural, it is the largest natural disaster in our county's history, with threats likely to continue through many winters. I want to specifically thank all of our city staff, city manager Martin Bernal and city department leaders for getting us through this year, as well as Mayor Cumming, Justin Cummings for his work in keeping our community informed, calm and stable during this difficult time. I have great respect for his work on police reform and social equity this past year, as well as for his focus on local business support and renter protections. I wanna thank Dr. Gail Newell and Santa Cruz County leaders for their guidance and support during this talk, difficult time and the business and nonprofit leaders serving on the Countywide Economic Recovery Council for their help in assisting local businesses, identifying those most in need and delivering food and essential services and needs to families in our community. I wanna thank Santa Cruz City School Superintendent Chris Monroe the district's teachers and staff and the city schools board of trustees for their leadership during the pandemic and wildfires to establish resources for our kids, maintaining critical school meal availability for families and for trying to do the impossible with online learning in one of the toughest situations to face modern education efforts. I also wanna thank lastly, Chancellor Cynthia Larive and UCSC leaders for their remarkable contributions to COVID testing and research, as well as for initiating a virtual campus this year to keep our community and UCSC students safe. Your partnership is one I value for helping our community recover from all that has happened this year. Finally, I wanna thank my family, my wife, Bertie, and my friends and colleagues for all your support over the two, past two years. No one can do this work without that support. I am truly blessed. The work ahead is enormous and daunting for our community as well as for the state of California and um, as we move forward. But I know that I have a remarkable team in this city council to help lead this community. Their knowledge and perspectives on how local government can and should be effective during this time will be instrumental over the next year. This council is made up of educators, public health and social service experts, advocates for children and youth, housing advocates, climate change experts, and small business and economic development leaders. Who wouldn't want that team right now going into the year ahead? Uh, it's just an outstanding group of people and I'm, I'm really lucky to be, be, be working with all of you over the next year. I would also be remiss to not also mention that your city council continues to be a diverse group of community members. The historic all women field of council candidates this past election was truly inspiring. You have also just elected your first openly lesbian mayor in Santa Cruz history. In fact, we have a place on our, in fact, we have in place on our city council what many communities around the country seek to achieve. We have racial and ethnic representation, LGBTQ representation, gender and age diversification. Not to mention dog lovers, moms, surfers, sailors, artists, scientists, teachers, farmers, and gardeners. <laughs> we're, all, we're all here because we love Santa Cruz and um, I know that we will be all working together to, the, to do the best that we can for this community. We're all here to work together to serve for the greater good of all Santa Cruzans as we face the unprecedented economic, environmental, and public health challenges that lay ahead. 
Actions and decisions we make this year will decide the foreseeable future for existing businesses, how we will stabilize families, how we will keep residents in their homes, and how we will move forward to a better future for all. I see a future that is based in the green economy that has been built over the past decades by so many inspirational leaders and hardworking community members here in Santa Cruz, even before the term green economy became popular. They were protecting land and forests that help preserve our water supply and prepare for climate change. They were protecting farmland and local food sheds. They were demanding affordability in housing and they were building bike trails and purchasing a 30 mile long rail, rail line for future rail trail transportation. They restored our coastal habitats, streams and rivers, which will help heal our mountains now. They created one of the largest marine reserves in the world, our Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary, now one of the top three visited marine areas in the world. And they declared our coastline from Pleasure Point to Natural Bridges a world surfing reserve, recognizing the heritage and uniqueness of this place. This work and future work, like Resilient Coast Santa Cruz, will marshal, marshal hundreds of millions of dollars worth of green infrastructure investment to help us recover and reimagine Santa Cruz for the next decade and beyond. Our success relies on this green economy now and it will into the future. In the months and years ahead, we will have to rehabilitate the thousands of forest acres that have burned, protect and rehabilitate our water supply systems and water supply watersheds, safeguard our coastal areas from sea level rise and lessen our carbon footprint by creating housing in areas where people can walk, ride public transit and their bikes to work and school. It is vital that we also build housing for those who need support in gaining back their lives and those who work here. We are well on our way to this goal. Just this past month, the city has approved over 200 units of housing for low and very low income residents and supportive housing for those in need. These investments are a win for our community, especially when combined with supporting essential services like medical and dental clinics, child care facilities, business incubator spaces, healthy food and grocery stores, and access to parks and open spaces. Many of our neighbors in Watsonville, Capitol, and Scotts Valley and broader Santa Cruz County share this common vision. Together we can move all of our communities forward to a reimagined future defined by shared prosperity. These actions have and will continue to create good paying jobs, opportunities for new workforce training and additional investment in Santa Cruz and our local businesses. That investment will in turn support the services we all expect from our local government. Public safety, parks, vibrant neighborhoods and thriving business districts. There's still much problem solving ahead and I look forward to tackling the issues that are most pressing need. No solutions will happen without trust and teamwork. I'm fortunate to have the opportunity to work with colleagues who are ready to go to work for a bright future for all of our residents. So in summary, my vision is a green economy that is equitable and makes room for everyone. A community that values diversity of opinion, age, ethnicity, and income. A community that helps one another and treats one another with respect, kindness, and patience that protects our environment and prepares for the future while acting on the needs of today. We are a very strong community and I know we will continue to pull together now to help each other. I am hopeful we will respect one another even when we have different views. I know we can move forward together in a way that is inclusive of all residents and enhances everyone's sense of belonging and value. I'm hopeful we will hear from more and more people within our community about what their visions are for the present and future of Santa Cruz. There are 65,000 unique people living in our city. Let's pull together and see what we can accomplish together. I think the future is bright and the possibilities are enormous. In closing, I wanna thank you for your trust in me to do this work as your mayor. I wish all residents of Santa Cruz a wonderful holiday and please help those in need this holiday season. Of course, be, please be safe and most importantly, wear a mask. And I wish you all a good night. And thank you for, uh, to Mayor Cummings for a, a great night and a great last meeting. So thanks very much. I really appreciate everything you've done this past year, Justin. Cheers to everybody. And next, 
Bonnie will go ahead and uh, you will, um, so we, we don't need to, um, you don't need to swear uh, Councilmember Bruner in? I do not, no. Okay. Vice Mayor Bruner, I'd like to invite you up next um, to share your comments with the community. Thank you, Mayor Myers. <laughs> I'm truly humbled. <laughs> Thank you all. Uh, this year of crisis can be seen as an opportunity to really reevaluate priorities and make some important choices. As we start to work on this next phase of our economy and what our community will look like, I'm really excited to start the role of Vice Mayor and work on ways that prioritize and support investment in our city infrastructure and ways that support housing, economic rebuild, public safety, and all social determinants of health. Starting today, action is needed on a community scale that includes public, private, and nonprofit partnerships working together to provide resources and ways for COVID-19 recovery. We have proven we can all work together to make an impact and support our community. I know it will take courage, conviction, and commitment. Today, I'm making that commitment a commitment to making decisions that support our community and help our city navigate towards policies and initiatives that produce effective and equitable outcomes. Policies that reflect a shared vision of Santa Cruz as a healthy, safe, welcoming, and inclusive place for all of us. This is not going to be easy. It takes discipline, it takes teamwork, it takes sacrifices, and I'm ready for the challenge and this leadership and support role. Santa Cruz, thank you for giving me the responsibility to serve you. To the city staff, to my fellow council members, and Mayor Myers, I look forward to working with you. Let's do this. <laughs> Great, thank you, thank you, Council. Okay. Thank you, Vice Mayor Bruner. Um, we're, we're both getting used to these titles, aren't we? Um, I believe um, we have reached the end of our evening. Again, I want to thank um, Mayor Cummings. It's been a, a, just a crazy year. Nobody could have ever invented a year like this to um, have you come in and, and, and do what you've done. Uh, I really want to thank all of the council members. We, I feel like, have you know really just leaned in and done the work that we needed to do. So, um, as we've all stated, we may not agree on everything every time, but that's what democracy is about, and that's what makes for um, an engaged community and and hopefully good policy. So, uh, I wish you all uh, the best of holidays. Um, I wish you much time out in our beautiful environment and outdoors and uh, hope all of your families um, have a wonderful holiday and uh, we will uh, basically all see each other at the uh, at the part of the, at the start of the new year so congratulations everybody everybody give each other a hand we're going to be a great team and uh, yeah be safe be well take care of each other see you soon Bye, everybody. Good night, everybody. Bye. Congratulations, everybody. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Good night. Congratulations, everybody. <laughs> Thanks to all the community members. Everyone have a great holiday. Congrats. Goodbye.